Okay, and welcome everyone. We're just getting set up here. We're gonna get our uh, folks in the Zoom room here and get started very momentarily. Thanks for bearing with us here. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Greens Week, uh, day three. Um, we have a really exciting day for you today. Uh, we'll first be welcoming some um, speakers from Italy. But before we begin, I want to hand it over to Alice Formiga from uh, eOrganic to give us a little bit of background on um, Greens Week. OK, uh, I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, welcome to Grains Week, day three. I'm Alice Formiga of eOrganic, and I'm going to briefly introduce today's program. Um, Grains Week is a collaborative effort between multiple organizations and universities. The Culinary Breeding Network, Cascadia Grains, the Artisan Grains Collaborative, eOrganic, Grow NYC, and Glenwood, Cornell University, Oregon State University, Washington State University Food Systems, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Funding for our event is being provided by two multi-state USDA NIFA OREI grants, Value Added Grains for Local and Regional Food Systems, and Multi-Use Naked Barley for Organic Systems. So this slide just shows the organizers of Grains Week, Bridget Mainz of Oregon State University, Mark Sorrells of Cornell, Julie Dawson of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, our amazing producer and project manager, Abba Kaiser of Washington State, um, Cassie Woolheiser, who made our program, June Russell of Grow NYC formerly and now Glenwood Center for Regional Food and Farming, Julia Raggio, uh, Raggio of Grow NYC, and I uh, hope I didn't neglect anyone here, and I just can't um, neglect Blaine Selman of the Culinary Breeding Network. Um, so yesterday um, and the day before, Abba Kaiser um, had given a land acknowledgement from where she lived in Washington. But since I'm speaking to you from Corvallis, Oregon, um, I just wanted to acknowledge that we are located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River or Ampanefu Band of Kalapuya. And today, living descendants of these people are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians. So if you would like, you can text this number on your screen here. And you can learn who lived in your area in pre-colonial times. I don't know if it's showing here on YouTube. Um, hopefully it is. And um, you can text this number and um, you can learn who stewarded the land that you're on. And um, this event is being recorded and we encourage you all to type questions for the speakers into the chat box on YouTube, and also ask questions and talk to each other. And we hope you can make connections as part of this event. So now I'm going to hand things over to Lane Selman, who's going to introduce our international speakers. Great, thank you so much, Alice. Um, I'm excited to introduce to you Laura and Salvadore, who are with us today from Italy. You guys can turn your videos on right now if you'd like so we can see your faces. Um, 
Hello, buonasera, Salvadore, and um, Laura. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, this is a session that's kind of about grains in Italy, um, but a lot, a lot, a lot of other things. And both Salvadore and Laura are enormous grain and baking um, advocates uh, from Italy. Laura Lazzaroni is a she's coming from Milan. Uh, and she's a bread consultant and author. Uh, she's the author of a book that she's going to talk about that is only available in Italian called um, Altri Grani, Altri Pani. She will talk about it in her video, but she just had a um, her first in English uh, cookbook, uh, not, I shouldn't say cookbook, but a uh, book about wonderful food uh, in Italy called The New Cucina Italiana. And it's a beautiful, wonderful book about what's happening right now in food in Italy. Uh, so uh, it's um, Rizzoli is the publisher. I suggest you pick it up if you like. She's gonna talk about um, grains and bread with us today. Um, she's gonna talk about old varieties and evolutionary populations of Italian wheat, how she discovered them and how to, she came to incorporate them uh, into her bread baking. I had the pleasure of meeting Laura in Sicily at the Anatasca Lanza cooking school and got to experience her bread um, real life, which was quite amazing. Um, so very appreciative of that. And she, we have with us today, one of her mentors, uh, Salvadore Chicarelli. He is a geneticist, plant breeder, innovator, um, an inspiration to people all around the world. Um, he's had over 50 years of work dedicated to agricultural research for development. Um, he has provided a video uh, that's six minutes long that kind of goes through his work. It's very hard to introduce a man like uh, Salvadore because you've had incredible impact all over the world. And for those of us that um, work in participatory, participatory plant breeding, um, very uh, grateful to you for your work. You've been an inspiration to us. Um, so you've worked in participatory plant breeding and evolutionary uh, populations uh, of, of wheat breeding. Um, so this will explain a little bit about your work, but you worked in Syria for over 30 years with uh, ICARTA, which is the International Center of Agricultural Research in Dry Areas. Um, before returning back to Italy, where you are originally from. You've had a lot of work that you've done in Italy and Africa and the Middle East. Um, and we're gonna watch your videos and then we'll come back to answer questions. People are gonna chat them uh, in, in YouTube. And Bridget Mainz also, who is a barley breeder here at Oregon State University is going to uh, join us so we can talk a little bit about barley as well and the work that Salvadore has done with barley. Thank you. We'll turn on and we'll meet you back here. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Laura Lazzaroni. I'm an Italian journalist, book author, and bread consultant. Um, I was born and raised in Milan, Italy, which is where I'm speaking to you from. I lived in New York for a few years and then I came back here. I have a degree in biology, though I never really practiced. Um, my work is words and bread. Uh, I recently published my first book in English with Rizzoli. It speaks about um, the uh, contemporary Italian cuisine. It's entitled The New Cucina Italiana. I'm also currently working on my second bread book, which will be uh, like a manual, so have a more technical uh, approach. And um, I have written another bread book, my first bread book in Italian in 2017. And that's where truly um, the story that I'm going to talk to you about started. Uh, this book, 2017 Italian, um, which roughly means uh, different breads and different kinds of wheat um, and it sort of chronicles the birth of my love story with the so-called old varieties of wheat and evolutionary populations of wheat um, and uh, these populations have gradually become 
uh, the source uh, of my passion. I have been making bread for many years now, so much so that it has become uh, um, a line of work for me. I'm a bread consultant, I consult for, with the uh, bakeries and restaurants. So, and I can uh, truthfully say that I have never ever made a loaf of bread that didn't include at least one old variety or an evolutionary population uh, of wheat. Um, the reason being that, well, there's many reasons and we'll see them together, but um, well, the first reason is this. You know, bread speaks for itself. This is a loaf of bread, a sourdough that I made and baked yesterday. Um, it's still nice and moist. Um, I'm sure many of you are bakers and you know that sourdough keeps very well. Um, I make all my bread in sourdough style, naturally leaving the long fermentation. Um, even when I make uh, more traditional um, Italian kinds of bread like ciabatta, I still use sourdough for those. So this particular loaf, I wish you could smell it because the aroma is quite intoxicating, was made with three different evolutionary populations of wheat, uh, two from Le Marc and one from Sicily, um, a little bit of emmer, an old variety of bread wheat called Mentana, and some um, modern semi-whole wheat. Um, I know this recipe well because this is my go-to recipe. So I have learned in time to recognize the main notes and what I pick is uh, I pick up chamomile, uh, licorice, um, uh, something uh, slightly more floral, uh, milder, rounder, sweeter, quite pleasant and uh, uh, something like a, a dried nuts um, sort of. Um, aroma, which is also very, very pleasant. Um, this is one of the reasons why I and many other bakers uh, choose to bake with these special kinds of wheat, because uh, um, just like it happens with grapes and wine, they truly reflect the terroir the, that they were grown in. And so, you know, in time you learn to I sort of identify them and recognize them uh, through these um, sensory markers that they have, very, very distinctive notes that they develop and make for more delicious uh, bread. Um, it's also more nutritious, but we'll see about it uh, in a little bit. The first time I came across these uh, special varieties of wheat was when I was doing research for my first bread book and I was invited on a press tour uh, to Le Marche. We visited an experimental wheat field where um, different parcels uh, of different kinds of wheat were planted side by side um, forming a grid and actually I have a photo of that very same wheat field uh, in the book that belongs to uh, my mentor in wheat and good friend Oriana Porfiri who's an agronomist from Le Marche. This is her beautiful experimental wheat field and truly I was quite astonished by the biodiversity. To be able to see them planted side by side really allows you to appreciate how different they are, the different morphologies and uh, different heights, different colors, different shapes. Some spikes were on, some were onless, and some looked like beautiful origami. Um, some were, you know, actually three spikes fused at the base. Um, the uh, old varieties of durum wheat typically were fat and juicy and some had beautiful black streaks so, so it was fantastic and uh, that's when I learned about these old varieties of wheat which are um, uh, comprised of two different groups of wheat one is a group of uh, varieties that were um, sort of um, not selected, but uh, developed uh, in time uh, homogenous uh, traits uh, because of how they were grown by farmers, you know, consistently in the same environment. And so they developed the, the, all the characteristics of uh, an actual population. And other old varieties of wheat were selected by agronomists uh, 
um, in the begin at the beginning of the last century, so at the beginning of the so-called Green Revolution, uh, there were very tall plants, you know, with the very long roots that would truly suck all the nutrients from the deepest pockets in the soil, therefore, you know, um, absorbing uh, these nutrients, uh, but also uh, absorbing uh, all the markers uh, of the soil that they were um, grown in. Um, they also had, uh, and still have, uh, a weaker gluten. Um, not because they necessarily have less protein content, but because they have less of the two uh, kinds of protein that um, bind together uh, to form the, the gluten matrix, gliadin, glutamins. Um, but they also had some problems, these weeds. Um, namely, they were uh, not much resistant to drought and to rust uh, because they were so tall they would you know fall so making it harder for the farmers to harvest uh, there's always a reason why farmers ab abandon something um, and they were gradually abandoned also because of the industry of pasta and bread making um, over time demanded the selection, the aggressive selection of varieties of modern wheat that had much stronger gluten, that were more extensible, um, elastic, uh, they were shorter, so they were crossed, you know, with the um, uh, Japanese kinds of wheat, they were also very short, so they wouldn't fall and you know they were uh, selected for higher yields um you know and this marked the shift from these old varieties of wheat uh to modern wheat um the gluten also as i mentioned became much stronger um so What's been happening in Italy, and not just in Italy, but all over the world in the past years, is that there has been a rediscovery, a sort of renaissance of these old varieties of wheat, wheat which are still, uh, in a way, difficult for farmers uh, um, to grow. Um, the yields are not, you know, very high still. So it's it's uh, an economy, a microeconomy of sacrifice, which is why it's important to support it. But I have to say that by and by these farmers, many of whom are young, and this is a, a very positive uh, trait, have become uh, better at growing them. Also, obviously, their techniques have evolved. Uh, um, and so these old varieties of wheat, uh, which uh, grow very well in biodynamic agriculture, have been gradually uh, you know, yielding more. And they also seem to be, this is from the point of view of the baker, of me as a baker, uh, they have become also easier to work with, to bake with, because one of the problems that these wheats um, had, uh, because of their very weak gluten, is that um, it was very hard to make bread with them if you didn't cut them with modern kinds of wheat. Um, you know, if you consider that a flower like uh, Manitoba flour has a W of more than 300, consider that many flowers from these old varieties have maybe Ws that are around 90, 100, um, so it's very low. But by and by, I find that they're becoming... Um, uh, they become better performing in baking, meaning that you know their their gluten is becoming slightly stronger, not too strong. They will never be like modern wheats. Um, and also uh, milling, the milling of these uh, uh, varieties of wheat is becoming better as millers uh, learn more about them and learn how to. Um, better treat them and obviously milling is a, a fundamental part um, uh, too often overlooked of the performance of uh, a flower um, so it has become increasingly easier to bake with them but it still takes uh, some uh, adjustments uh, such as uh, for instance you know the working on not too high hydrations uh, um, being very careful with the mechanic action, you know, maybe it's better to hand mix them, 
um, so as to be able to truly follow, uh, you know, the, uh, the good information and, and, and feel under your, uh, your, the tip of your fingers, um, if, how it's coming along, how well it's forming or not. Um, I like to layer flowers in all my bread, so I like to mix some old varieties with some evolutionary populations and uh, I always always use a small percentage of my whole wheat modern because it helps me um, uh, achieve a good structure. I like to have both things in my bread, you know, the nutritional value of uh, a good wheat that's been, you know, grown in good soil with good uh, agricultural um, methods uh, with enough to strong gluten, um, with, you know, developing all these beautiful aromas, but I also like to uh, use uh, water, 80% is what I use normally, and to push fermentation a little bit and to still have a nice structure. I do believe that with practice and with layering of flowers, this is possible. It has become even more possible for me um, with evolutionary populations of wheat, which are truly, um, I, I will say it boldly, but they're my favorite. Uh, why? Because they're the best of both worlds. So evolutionary populations of wheat are, um, uh, you know, big mixes of um, uh, hundreds of different kinds of uh, very old varieties of wheat and modern wheats that are mixed together in the field and grow together. And um, the cool thing is that they um, are developed uh, uh, through a partnership, a partnership between an agronomist and farmer. And uh, it's truly the farmer who decides uh, what kind of mix better suits uh, his land, his needs, uh, what he wants to grow. And once um, they settle on a particular mix, uh, then the mix uh, becomes a property of the farmer and he's the one who's responsible for maintaining it. And he becomes uh, the custodian um, of, uh, of this mix. Uh, um, and as uh, uh, he keeps growing it, um, you know, year after year, har harvest after harvest, uh, becomes a, a dynamic uh, uh, population that tr is truly capable of adapting to the most dire conditions, uh, environmental conditions and soil conditions, um, and changing uh, over time. Uh, one of the things uh, that it does when it changes is that it self-regulates for intestines um, and it has been noticed that over time it um, um, selects over older varieties over modern varieties uh, so for instance uh, um, uh, farmers have to keep reintrodu reintroducing a little bit of modern varieties uh, year after year because uh, if left to its own devices, the population would phase them out over time. Um, but, you know, truly an evolutionary population has the best of both worlds, the modern and the so-called ancient uh, wheat. Um, the aroma is fantastic. Uh, the gluten is not too strong. It's very, as I said, adaptable. So it's also easier for the farmer. Um, and it's, a, it's the result of a cooperative effort. Um, the cool thing is that in Italy, we have uh, uh, great availability of uh, all varieties of wheat, for sure, uh, because uh, they are connected to our uh, farming tradition and our tradition of pasta and bread making. Uh, you know, bread in the center in the south of Italy historically has always been made with durum wheat, all varieties of durum wheat. So, you know, farmers have maintained them, families used to um, uh, preserve the seeds year after year. So that has stayed and even when farmers abandoned them, um, they were still stored in seed banks and, and family bought.
vaults. Um, and we have them from north to south, from Piedmont to Sicily. One very cool thing about this is that um, over the past few years, the, um, uh, a few uh, closed systems uh, 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 were born. Um, basically, um, groups of uh, farmers, millers and bakers uh, who uh, partnered up and, and formed uh, sort of, you know, weak coalitions uh, uh, to uh, be able to guarantee a fully traceable final product uh, from the field to the bakery, also maybe selecting a mix of flowers of uh, specific varieties of wheat so that uh, people who buy that specific loaf, loaf of bread in the bakeries uh, um, that participate um, in these groups, in these coalitions, and know exactly what they're eating and you know, what flowers are in them. And those are the weeds that are grown and milled in the area. And there are a few of examples of these examples throughout Italy. Um, even more has been done with evolutionary populations of wheat. The father of the Italian evolutionary populations of wheat is Salvatore Ceccarelli, a phenomenal agronomist um, that I've known for a few years. He uh, worked for many years outside of Italy, um, specifically in Syria. He worked at Icarda which is uh, an international center of agriculture um, uh, specialized in dry areas agriculture. And he started out uh, uh, working on evolutionary populations of barley and then moved on to evolutionary populations of wheat, which he brought to Italy when he came back uh, to live here. He gave, famously gave one to a Sicilian farmer, one to a Tuscan farmer. Uh, Fast forward to, you know, uh, 2021 and uh, um, uh, you can find evolutionary populations of wheat truly from north to south and they all come from those two original evolutionary populations of wheat developed by Salvatore Ceccarelli and brought to Italy uh, by him and his wife um, many years ago. Uh, they're fantastic. They evolve over time, as I said. So even if they, you know, they're born from the same two parents, um, they're all different, um, and you can find them everywhere. The map is uh, uh, is spreading. Um, there's uh, you can find them in the Marche, Abruzzo, uh, Sicily, of course, Tuscany, um, and uh, as more and more especially young farmers, um, approach them uh, and start working with them, uh, I'm sure the map will become even larger. Um, I have uh, talked many times with Salvatore Ceccarelli. He has taught me everything I know about evolutionary populations of wheat and he's the reason why I use them in my bread and I truly recommend them to everybody. And whenever I ask him, you know, what he sees and hopes for the future uh, is obviously even more young people, you know, going back to the field and working with these evolutionary populations of wheat. Um, but also he, he's hoping that one day we will be able to um, uh, take them one step further where in the field we will grow truly everything together. What What is grown in rotation will grow together. So, you know, uh, wheat with with barley but also with lentils and chickpeas and that for him uh, would truly be the ideal evolutionary population um, there are so many other things that I could tell you about varieties of wheat and evolutionary populations of wheat and why I bake with them and how I bake with them you know there's I wish I could take you all with me to the Stazione Sperimentale di Cerealicoltura in, in Sicily, in Caltagirone, where all these beautiful varieties of Durham Sicilian wheat are uh, preserved and stored and, and regularly um, grown. Um, but I will um, end on this note 
and uh, open the table to your questions and hopefully there will be many and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. Uh, thank you again for tuning in. Bye. Thank you. That was Laura. And we're going to watch one more video before we have, um, we take questions and we have our speakers come back on. As she mentioned at the end, um, her one of her mentors, uh, Salvador Chicarelli, um, is here with us today. We're excited about it. Yesterday, she said, oh, maybe I could ask him to, to join us. So we have a very exciting last minute ad to have him with us today. And this video is going to um, give us some background on his work. So please continue to type in your questions and we'll meet you here in just a few minutes. Italy loves bread and pasta, arguably more than any other country in the world. But before it hits the plate, it all starts here in the Italian fields from Tuscany to Ascoli, land that has produced wheat for centuries. But this wheat, about two months away from harvest, is special. It's the product of an unconventional wave of farming brought to Italy from Syria by this man, Salvatore Ceccarelli. He's an Italian plant geneticist and a retired professor who lives in Ascoli Piceno, east of Rome. He may not look like a rebel, but his work is poised to transform farming as we know it. I don't know if you're aware that the current Pope Francis is now also accused of being a revolutionary. I think I, I have to send him a tweet. <laughs> in some sense, it's, it's revolutionary. I mean, and it's certainly, you know, bucking the trend of what most folks are doing. Ceccarelli's revolution is a form of organic farming called evolutionary plant breeding. Farmers plant a mixture of seeds and replant the high-performing ones at next harvest. Over time, the crops evolve to the soil. This is the complete opposite of today's norm. A typical farmer usually plants uniform or hybrid seeds developed by multinational agribusinesses. It's always somebody um, asking the question, are you aware your ideas are basically going against uh, the big monopolies of seed, the pesticide, and so on? Ceccarelli refined his ideas about evolutionary plant breeding in Syria, where he lived and worked for 30 years. The farmers like to be involved in seed selection they'd handpick the high-performing varieties and share grains with neighbors. But he ran into trouble. So the government of Syria told me that uh, um, the work that I was doing with farmers uh, uh, was not what, what I was supposed to do. The Syrian government didn't approve of the approach because it couldn't regulate it. This was, for me, the proof that the official system simply did not work uh, and was not going to provide farmers with what they want. Uh, the only way around was the, to bypass the system. Ceccarelli was undeterred. Uh, my pr primary uh, target are still uh, those uh, millions of farmers uh, who are struggling. You know, I was coming from uh, a country where uh, surviving, uh, economically speaking, uh, a bad year is never an issue, to a place in which your life depends on rainfall. Ceccarelli believes the evolutionary method could help farmers around the world face challenges posed by climate change. Italy, for instance, faced the worst drought on record last year. But to plant the seeds in Italy, they first had to get permission. It took four years of lobbying but the European Commission eventually granted a special waiver for the seeds to be taken to market in Europe. Rosario Floridia was one of the first farmers to plant the Syrian wheat mixture. Mi ha stupito, mi ha mi ha mi ha affascinato, ecco. Posso dire che questa popolazione segue passo passo quello che succede eh, al tempo. Quindi questo è una bella una bella cosa. It took a few years, but Floridia stuck with the evolutionary method and his efforts paid off. The wheat adapted to the Tuscan soil. 
and his flour, pasta, and bread business is booming. <laughs> While the practice of evolutionary seed breeding is not very common, this isn't the first time it's been tested. In the 1920s, the evolutionary breeding method was tested on wheat and barley at UC Davis. The wheat is still there, but it doesn't look as good as the uniform wheat variety growing next to it. That's because the fields were left to adapt on their own. One of the problems here for varieties is that this was just allowed to naturally select. Yeah. And there wasn't any, any human-directed yeah. selection involved, but you could just as easily, and I think this is what uh, Ceccarelli's doing yeah. is taking these and, and having farmers select out of these populations as they go through so you can get something that's a little more desirable than, than yeah. say, what, what this would turn out to be, just under natural selection. Raising evolutionary crops requires more labor and engagement from farmers. It might be that, that having the ability to withstand any kind of risk that might come down the pike is more important than maximum productivity. And if that's the case, then evolutionary breeding and having diverse populations in the field is probably, is probably sensible. But you're going, to, you're going to be sacrificing maximum productivity. Back in Italy, Guido Fiorentini has practiced conventional wheat farming for nearly his entire life. He's 88 now. Despite the subsidies offered by the European Union to organic farmers, he is reluctant to make the switch. Non lo so. Ho i dubbi. Non lo fai con un anno, ma ci vuole gli anni per tenerli in quelle condizioni. La sa chi non lo sa, non lo sa. But Ceccarelli thinks the stakes are too high to not try something different. As chemical seed companies consolidate, taking more control of the seed breeding process, he believes this method could help small farmers stay in the driver's seat. I know that what I'm doing is like a, a very steep slope, but what is the alternative? Throughout this process, the Syrian farmers who helped cultivate the seeds have not been forgotten. Mario Carini uses the Syrian wheat flour blend to make pasta and bread and labeled them with Misculio di Aleppo, the mixture of Aleppo. Ceccarelli hopes to bring the evolved wheat back to Syrian farmers as a gift. Ah, this is beautiful. Since the wheat could help them to weather tumultuous times ahead. Fantastic. Thank you. Hey, Laura and Salvador, you can turn on your, and, and Bridget, um, turn on your video. Um, fantastic information. Um, there are some questions that came in on YouTube that I want to um, ask you. Um, Laura, one for you. Well, one was, where, can you tell people where to get the book that you showed that was uh, the collection in Sicily? <clears throat> altri grani, altri pani? They can find, well, it depends on where they're based. It's in Italian, it's not in English. If they're in Italy, they can find it at any bookstore. And if they don't have it, they will order it from them. Um, if not on, you know, the big A, which I don't like to promote, but um, it's it's more easily accessible. If, if they do want to sort of have a primer, I do highly recommend uh, because it's necessary reading, and Lena already told you about this, this book by Professor uh, Ceccarelli, and uh, another fantastic one, which the, the cover for which you have already posted at your account earlier this morning, which is a Seminate Contadini Seminate, which is a fantastic uh, must read. Uh, Professor Ceccarelli will uh, have more titles later when he when he speaks, but truly those are two essential readings, I would say. Great, wonderful, thank you. Um, You're welcome. And um, when somebody asked about the video that we just watched, um, is that available anywhere? Um, I think you sent it to me uh, in a Google um, folder, Salvadore, is that posted anywhere? Uh, I don't think so, but this was, uh, um, uh, this was done by two students uh, of uh, uh, Mark Shapiro, 
who eventually uh, used uh, uh, the material to publish a book. Uh, um, I gave the title to Laura uh, just yesterday yeah. um, because he was, when I visited him in uh, San Francisco a few years back, uh, he was mostly fascinated by the um, change uh, in seed laws uh, in Europe, uh, which allows this population to be uh, legally marketed. At that time, when I saw Mark, uh, the law was only covering uh, wheat, corn, oats, and barley. Now, in, 2020, in uh, 2022, uh, on the 1st of January, we will have a new regulation on organic agriculture, which extend that laws to every crop. So that the idea of um, uh, what is uh, uh, defined as a heterogeneous material is now expanding to every possible crop under organic conditions. Um, but this is particularly interesting because as Laura said, uh, evolutionary populations have this extraordinary ability to adapt to different soils and different conditions. And by definition, organic agriculture is much more, uh, is a much more heterogeneous agricultural system than conventional agriculture. Um, chemicals have this extraordinary ability to make everything uh, uh, the same, so that uh, one or few varieties can grow almost everywhere. Uh, uh, organic agriculture is completely different. Uh, uh, in theory, you may need a single variety for every farmer. And evolutionary population can do that uh, for free. Uh, they do just uh, because of the um, natural crosses, uh, so that the seed that you harvest every year is not exactly the same that you planted from the genetic point of view. Uh, and that evolution is driven by the local conditions. Um, uh, Lane, if I may um, add, um, Professor Ceccarelli mentioned the, the book in English. Uh, I can say the title so people can take down um, note of the title. It's uh, Seeds of Resistance, the Fight to Save Our Food Supply by Mark Shapiro. Um, and the publisher is Hot Books Skyhorse Publishing, New York. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have Bridget Mainz, who is a barley breeder here at Oregon State University, who leads a uh, large national um, opportunity to ask some questions to Salvadore. Uh, I believe they've met once before and she's been inspired by his work. Yeah, um, so we have a population that I think I've mentioned to you in the past called the Oregon Naked Barley Blend. That's, oh, yeah. yeah, it's a mixture of 750 pure lines. Um, only? Huh? Only. <laughs> 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 that we've distributed um, around the U.S., um, but we'd love to get into Italy if, if, um, there's a way that I can send you seed. And for folks watching, if you're interested in getting this population, um, we do send out a hundred gram seed samples and you can visit barleyworld.org slash ONDB um, for more information and to request some for, from me. But um, Salvatore, I did want to ask, um, you know, in the US, there hasn't been a lot of work done on participatory plant breeding in grains. Um, I see it a lot more in vegetables. Um, and there are small pockets here and there, but I wonder, um, you know, I, I struggle a bit engaging some of the farmers. And I think maybe part of that is that a lot of the farmers I, I'm working with are are sort of older and set in their ways. And you do talk about how the younger farmers are the ones who are really excited about this process. But I wonder if you have some advice on, on sort of creating this model and engaging folks. Well, actually, uh, um, evolutionary plant breeding has been a way uh, to get around a number of difficulties that we had with uh, participatory plant breeding. Mm -hmm. Um, we published recently a couple of papers with my wife 
because for us it's been a long process of thinking of why institutions were so reluctant to take on board uh, uh, a system of breeding which guarantees adoption, which is one of the major problems <laughs> in plant breeding. There are how many varieties have been released uh, that nobody ever grew. And, and, and the literature is full of, of um, lack of adoption. Um, so that the, the, the idea is to combine participation with evolution uh, we, have, we now have a project in Northern Italy on rice, and this year we are planting uh, uh, mixtures. So we, we still do not have uh, um, uh, evolutionary population because it's so expensive uh, to um, commit crosses uh, on, on rice, but these are dynamic mixtures. And we will uh, uh, discuss with farmers how to make selection out of these mixtures, because you have crops like, for example, uh, beans, uh, chickpea, um, rice, uh, where, for example, attributes like cooking time are very important. Mm -hmm. And therefore, mm -hmm. is, uh, um, having said that, uh, we discover we made a, a mixture of 220 old Iranian rice varieties in mm -hmm. Iran. Uh, in Iran, the... the southern coast of uh, the Caspian Sea is the major rice growing area. And in Iran, rice uh, is a staple food. I mean, it's always on the table. And um, uh, we gave these 220 accessions to a farmer from, for multiplication. And then he gave back some seed to the institution. And then he did not, did not know what to do with the rest. And he cooked it. And he made all the way from the Caspian Sea to Tehran, uh, I was there for a conference, uh, to tell me how good was that dish. <laughs> so <laughs> in theory, <laughs> even, even with rice, um, um, it's possible. But the, the idea is uh, uh, to give farmers a system, uh, a biological system, uh, such as the evolutionary population, which generates that variability that usually is the first step in a breeding program. But the, the advantage is, uh, is, 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 a, is, a, is a type of diversity which is perfectly adapted to its soil, its climate, and its way of practicing agriculture. That, that's why it's so, uh, it's so good for organic agriculture. And then, if he has a different types of market, uh, for example, a market which still requires some degree of uniformity, he can always walk in the field, select the best spikes or the best zucchini uh, or whatever, uh, and bring those to the market, uh, recommending, uh, for example, we are saying never take the entire spike of a good um, barley plant, uh, but only uh, take only the, the upper half. Um, or take only a few fruits from a tomato or, or a zucchini or a chickpea so that uh, the good genes of that plant, of, of that particular sure. plant, will continue to recombine with all the others. Um, and farmers are enthusiastic because they understand that in this way, their future is only in their hands. Mm, that's... Great. That's can, great. Can I show Lots you uh, something that, uh, that uh, um, Laura was talking about? Uh, just to give you an idea, this is the map. Uh, can you see it? Yes. Yeah. I it's love the it. Of, of the distribution of the evolutionary population in, uh, um, in Italy. Wow. And wow. Uh, there's another thing that I would like to show. Uh, perhaps somebody can... Uh, um, um, can get an inspiration for this. Look at this. You, you see these two fields? You think that these are two different varieties, isn't it? I just see the map. Oh, you see only the map? Sorry. Um, let, me, let me take it out. Do you see now? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. You see these, these two, how different they are? Well, would you believe that 10 years earlier, this was the same bag of seed which came from Syria? 
And the one on your, on your left is one which evolved for 10 years in Sicily, as, as Laura was saying, and the one on the right evolved for 10 years in Tuscany. And they were grown last year side by side, uh, close to where I live. And you see that the, the one from Sicily is a little bit shorter, is a little bit earlier, uh, it doesn't lodge. Uh, the other one is uh, um, uh, tend to lodge, uh, is a little bit later, uh, is much greener. So that now what we are uh, uh, experimenting, and this was the idea of the farmer, is to mix the two because the shorter one can actually help the, the, the other one uh, to, to stand up and to resist lodging a little bit better. But these two fields were not treated, uh, no chemicals, no, no fertilizer. Um, they gave about uh, 3.5 tons each. There is not a single weed in that field. So that actually, uh, as, as, as Laura said, the yield is less, but the cost of production is much less. So the, 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 the actual income of the farmer is, 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 uh, is increasing. Wow, that's, that's fantastic. So inspiring to sort of- and Bridget, yeah, so Bridget uh, can I ask you a question? Why do you think uh, Americans are so resistant to um, experimenting more with evolutionary populations of wheat? I mean, to me, it, we, we're, we're closer to the areas where they were obviously um, born and, and, uh, and developed first. Uh, and our tradition obviously is, is very historically connected to that sort of world, but your agricultural programs are exceptional as well. And you have a vast uh, uh, area. Uh, so why do you if, think if, that if, is? If, if, if I may add, the, the one, one thing I did not agree with what Laura said when she said, uh, Salvatore Ceccarelli is the father of the evolutionary population because eventually, given my age, I will be the grandfather. But not even that, because the, 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 the real godfather, father, were, the godfather, were Harry Arlan and Mary Martini back in 1929. Mm -hmm. And most of the research done on the agronomic advantages of mixtures and populations come from your country. Yeah, uh, one man. Harley is a great book written by Harry Harlan and Mary Martini wrote the introduction to it. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I think we've seen some change over even just the last decade in, in more small mills and craft mall houses um, popping up, but our large scale industrial milling and malting system has really um, required purity. And so these monoculture, single variety, um, you know. Okay, you, you know, Bridget, one argument that, uh, that we're using very often, uh, because uh, as you can imagine, uh, even here in Europe, uh, when I'm invited to conferences, um, you can bet that there is always a question about mm -hmm. standardization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, what, what about this, this uh, bread and this pasta? They will be different uh, from year to year, from place to place. I say, look, but if I, if I was talking about wine and olive oil, would you ask the same question? Of course not. So what, what, what is the problem? <laughs> it's, a, it's a cultural problem. <laughs> Yeah, it's also a problem. Uh, I mean, Lane, I know that we have to end now because we're running out of time, but maybe we can pick this up uh, in some other form. Obviously, with pasta and, and bread, it's also a question of performance uh, where um, not, not just variation of flavor, uh, where the production obviously requires a certain extensibility and, and strength, as I was mentioning, but I have to say, as I said in my video, that thanks to the work that uh, farmers have been doing exceptionally with the, especially evolutionary populations of wheat, I have to say that even though the aromatic spectrum changes from year to year, once the, the agricultural practice uh, is locked down um, in a certain area and the milling practice becomes better and the miller is more knowledgeable, the performance of the product uh, is quite standardized. Uh, so the, the, the flavor, not. 
the aroma will develop, you know, uh, harvest after harvest, and that's the beauty of it. But performance-wise, it is uh, quite unlikely now that you will get a bag of a certain evolutionary population of wheat one year from one producer and make bread, and the year after you won't be able to make bread. Thank you for that. Um, I, we, we do have to wrap up, but I love this conversation. I know we could talk for another hour at least. Yep. Um, I, would, I would invite you, we'll, we'll figure out a way to come back together and continue this conversation. Yes. And I so much- I would love to. Prof, grazie mille, è stato un grande piacere. Thank you very much. But Brigitte, don't, don't bother to send the seed. I have to come to US because we have a daughter living in, in Texas and one living in Mexico. Okay, well, we'll, we'll work it out. Uh, I will pass by and 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 visit. <laughs> awesome. Grazie. Perfect. Grazie thank mille. you Grazie so much. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. everyone welcome back um thanks for being here um we're gonna start our um session our next session the holistic farming and climate adaptation potential of buckwheat in just a moment um first i'm gonna have abba tell you a little bit about a special un summit dialogue that's occurring in conjunction with this session Great, thanks, Lane. I'm gonna just share my screen real quick so you can see here that um, in addition to being broadcast live on YouTube as part of Grains Week, this session is also part of the UN Summit Dialogues. Thanks to Christina Ocana Gallegos from the WSU Sustainable Seed Systems Lab who had the idea of uh, broadcasting this live as part of the international event. So I just wanted to let folks know that we are participating in this. Um, and it would be super helpful for us if you could fill out this attendance form that um, gives us some data that we can report back to the summit just to show them who came to the session and what their interest is. So um, with that, I will post the attendance form in the chat if you'd be willing to answer a few brief questions to help us give some data to the, uh, the folks at the, the summit, that would be fabulous. And a big thank you to Christina for um, double dipping for us and helping uh, spread this session farther and wider and um, for class and Rachel for being so flexible as we uh, uh, figure out how to make this all work together. So with that, I will turn it back over to Lane who's gonna introduce um, class and Rachel officially. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right. We are gonna have a couple of discussions about uh, buckwheat today. And our first uh, video that we'll watch is from Rachel Bessler, who is a graduate student at the Washington State University Sustainable Seed Systems Lab. She's gonna talk a little bit about uh, buckwheat in general and also um, a project that they have uh, recently funded at WSU, which there's gonna be another full session about that later on today. Um, and also farmer Klaus Martin that I had the pleasure of recording his video um, with him. Um, he is of the Martins Farm and Lakeview Organic Grain in Pin um, Yan, North, uh, sorry, New York. Um, he's been farming organically since the early 90s. And he and his wife were the first in their uh, county to do so. Um, he's pretty revolutionary in what he talks about. And I really appreciated his talk. They farm now 1,400 acres of organic soy, corn, spelt, barley, wheat, triticale, oats, rye, beans, and other things. Um, if I've missed anything or if that was incorrect, Klaus, just please, uh, when we get to the Q&A session, please add to that. Um, so I'm gonna, we're gonna turn off our video and mute ourselves. We're gonna watch the pre-recorded videos from uh, Rachel and Klaus, and then we'll come back on and answer your questions that you guys chat into the chat box on YouTube. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Rachel Breslauer and I am joining you from Seattle, Washington. 
Today we are going to talk about buckwheat and I'm excited to kick off this session. Um, buckwheat's a really interesting crop to me that is both a cash crop and a cover crop and something in between and I'm really excited to explore that with you today. So we'll touch on a couple different topics today, uh, starting with buckwheat's value in rotation, some constraints to production, as well as uh, some new work that we're starting at Washington State University to address those constraints. And then finally, we'll dive into some opportunities for you to get involved in this work and join us in, um, in some experimentation with buckwheat. So buckwheat, is uh, sort of refers to a broad spectrum of Phagopyrum species. Most commonly, we think of common buckwheat, which is Phagopyrum mesculentum. And so if you've grown buckwheat as a cover crop or bought a commercial buckwheat product, either at your co-op or mixed into something, it's, it's probably common buckwheat. And so we can see uh, it growing over here on our left. And so it produces this really dense vegetative cover. Um, so it's a really vigorous cover and it's a vigorous crop. Um, and it can produce a, a pretty extensive and long lasting uh, mat of flowers. Um, here we see a white flowered variety, but you can also get pink flowers. And I have yet to see this, but I'd love for anyone who, who has a crimson buckwheat variety that they've worked with to reach out to me. I'd love to see more about that. Um, but buckwheat uh, is, is primarily eaten, um, well, buckwheat products are uh, made from these groats here, which is the dehulled seed. And uh, these groats can be toasted into a product called kasha. And that could be, the kasha can be boiled and eaten as a porridge. It can be ground into grits, um, but you can also make buckwheat flowers, either whole seeded or, um, or uh, white buckwheat flowers. And you can make a diversity of products from buckwheat seeds, ranging from buckwheat pancakes to soba noodles. Um, and then I grew up eating buckwheat uh, in this dish shown here on the right called kasha varnish kiss. And so my grandma made this growing up. And so it's a, it's a warm buckwheat pasta dish uh, that um, where buckwheat is sort of boiled in chicken stock and cooked with vegetables and bow tie pasta. And it's really delicious and savory and great on a cold winter evening. Um, so this is a common feature for me growing up. Um, and um, so it's pretty, it's pretty cool to be working with buckwheat as um, an agronomist now. So buckwheat production in the US Seed production is, uh, um, is, is primarily uh, in North Dakota. So North Dakota produces by far the largest acreage, about 2,000 acres every year, um, which, and then is followed by Washington State, which produces about half that acreage. And then Minnesota trails behind with um, just under 3,000 acres. New York um, is pretty similar to Minnesota, usually producing in the low 2000s um, for acreage. Um, but as you can see, these are all northern states, so buckwheat doesn't do very well in warm climates and is not very drought tolerant either. So it tends to do well in cooler northern climates. Interestingly, in Washington state, most buckwheat production, actually all buckwheat production, is concentrated in, um, in the rain shadow of the Cascades. So here's a precipitation map. Uh, this is the Cascades right here in the western portion of the state. And as you can see, this is our big old rain shadow. And most of buckwheat production for seed is um, under irrigated conditions in the central portion of the state. So it's rotated with potatoes and uh, a wide diversity of vegetables. Um, but while buckwheat might be grown as a cover crop elsewhere in the state, um, there's virtually no seed production outside this region in Washington. So people who grow buckwheat 
uh, as a cover cropper looking for additional value in their system. And um, so we'll cover just a, a broad spectrum of, um, of some of the, the most common, um, commonly cited uh, reasons that people might grow buckwheat as a cover crop here. And so buckwheat has very rapid and vigorous emergence. And so very early on in the season, it's able to produce a dense can canopy uh, that can shade out weeds. And then um, as it's growing vigorously, can also compete for other uh, necessary resources for growth, such as water um, in that system. And so buckwheat's a really great um, weed suppressive cover crop. Um, it also produces flowers about four to six weeks after planting um, and continues to produce those flowers throughout the season, um, which helps support pollinators such as bees and flies and, and a whole host of other, other insects um, in, those, in these agricultural systems. Um, buckwheat can also very easily solubilize phosphorus from the soil. And so it accumulates large quantities of phosphorus in um, in its biomass. So as that breaks down um, after, um, after its production is done, that can provide um, some pretty bioavailable phosphorus for subsequent crops, um, reducing the need for phosphorus fertilization in these systems. And then if uh, a producer chooses to grow buckwheat for seed, um, several weeks after flowering, you begin to see, um, see sort of these mature brown seeds forming, um, but you'll also see more, more flowers growing because this is an indeterminate crop. Um, but most producers who are growing buckwheat uh, for a cover crop will, will terminate around flowering um, and so never really take the crop to this point. And so some major production constraints for buckwheat um, really revolve around the current system in which producers receive seed to grow um, uh, buckwheat seed crops and then uh, the avenues that exist uh, for producers to sell and market seed. Um, and currently, uh, most commercial buckwheat seed production revolves around con um, uh, buckwheat seed production contracts. So producers who are growing buckwheat seed or normally growing on contract. And so receiving seed from mills, um, so they don't have to go source, source um, a commercial variety. And then they have a predetermined uh, buyer for that seed. However, if for whatever reason a producer wants to um, grow buckwheat outside of contract, that really limits their options for both seed um, seed that's commercially available. Um, most buckwheat seed that's available outside of contract is unnamed cover crop seeds that just not really suitable for commercial production and reliable commercial production. Um, and then in terms of selling, that leaves pretty limited avenues for um, a, a supply chain to actually sell buckwheat and, and make a profit. Um, so there's no real um, avenue for a producer who is not, you know, completely vertically vertically integrating to be able to um, to be able to grow um, buckwheat to seed and make a profit. So we identified these two sort of themes, uh, constraint themes, so seed sources and then seed supply chains, um, as sort of the targets for two new projects that we're starting in our lab this year. Um, so the first is focused on identifying. Um, sort of a baseline for performance of different varieties um, in publicly available germplasm, um, and then understanding the importance of the um, of cover crop and cash crop performance for producers that were um, that were really focused on in Western Washington, and then the second is really focused on developing and catalyzing a supply chain for buckwheat in the Pacific Northwest. Um, this first project is we're calling um, the more bang for your buckwheat project and this is funded through the washington state university csanr and then the second project is called uh, diversifying northwestern fields and pallets and this is funded through western fair so the more bang for your buckwheat project has two main questions and objectives um, the first is um, assessing if there are trade-offs between cover crop performance and cash crop performance in um, publicly available buckwheat, uh, buckwheat lines. 
And so to understand um, and answer this question, we're conducting two years of performance baseline trials um, at two different locations in Western Washington. So we'll be working in the Skagit Valley and on the Olympic Peninsula um, for this work. And um, we are assessing um, uh, pollinator support traits, canopy competitiveness traits, and agronomics um, in each of five lines, two of which are commercial standards and three of which are, um, are populations that have been developed in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and then the second question is focused on um, what's the relevance of these traits and these trade-offs for different producer groups? So we're really looking at um, uh, asking this question of um, a wide diversity of producers in Western Washington who might have the capacity to grow seed, um, a, a, new, a novel seed crop in their system, and really seeing between conventional producers, organic producers, small scale, large scale, um, if there's a real difference in the value of a cover crop versus cash crop trade um, in their system. And so, um, again, we're working with Western Washington producers here um, and really targeting producers that have 20 or more acres that they're farming on and producers who already have seed crops or grain crops in rotation to really have the capacity to grow buckwheat on a commercial scale for seed production. Um, and then the main questions here will revolve around questions that can help us estimate the value of cover crop versus agronomic traits um, for these different types of producers. Um, and then again, really seeing if uh, that value is different across different producer types. And so the value of that information is we could select um, and you know, really target developing a particular variety for that might be relevant for an, or, an organic seed crop producer, but maybe that producer's, um, the importance of these different traits will be very different from a conventional producer who might have other options for say, weed management in their system than an organic producer. Our second, uh, our second project is called Diversifying Northwestern Fields and Pallets. And um, there's actually going to be an entire session uh, part of, as part of Grains Week later today called, um, sorry, uh, later today at 1 p.m. So definitely tune into that if you're interested in learning more about this project. Um, but the two second elevator pitch for it is that it's really aimed at connecting um, various stakeholders across the supply chain and conducting research that's targeted at developing those connections um, from farmers to processors um, to any sort of end users um, and consumers and being able to actually deploy a novel crop into a local food system. I do want to highlight that this, um, this project involves a lot of producer stakeholders who are conducting small um, strip trials of different varieties on their farm. Um, and so this is an essential part of identifying good varieties in different regions of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and so it's a really great place to get involved if you're curious with working with buckwheat in your production system. So with that, um, I'd really like to, to highlight some ways that you can get involved in these projects. Um, the first is we're really trying to capture a wide diversity of producers in our producer um, valuation survey in the more bang for your buckwheat project. So if you work with producers or you have an existing producer contact list, um, again, any, any medium to any scale larger than 20 acres is relevant to this project. So we really want to capture that diversity here. Um, so please, if you have producer contacts and you're, you think they would at all be interested in these types of research questions, um, please reach out and get in contact with me. Second, um, if you are a producer and you would like to uh, trial um, and try out a couple different buckwheat varieties on your, in your system, um, we're really looking for farms who are interested in hosting strip, test, strip testing trials. Um, not only will you be able to actually like experience a new crop and sort of um, have some of, some of the wiggle room to try something new um, with the support of this project, but you'll also be able to, to get connected with potential buyers um, and really start to develop your own, your own marketing um, for this crop if you end up really liking it. And then finally, if you have any interest in buckwheat at all, experimenting with it, doing something weird, baking, processing, um, or 
um, whatever your mind can think of, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you um, and we'd love to hear what ideas you have. Um, and with that, my email's below and um, I look forward to our discussion later in this session. My name is Klaus Martins. Uh, I live in upstate New York in the wine country. It's in the Finger Lakes. Uh, most people, when they think New York, they picture the concrete jungle down in New York City, but we're about six hour drive from there. And this area is really very rural and very pretty. We have a tremendous diversity of agriculture around us, which makes us very fortunate. And a lot of people come here to visit because it's pretty. Uh, buckwheat is the topic that I was uh, going to highlight. And I think I'd, I'd like to start by saying when people come to me and say, I want to know how to grow soybeans, or I want to know how to grow corn, or I want to know how to grow wheat. It's the wrong question. So when we're looking at a crop, any given crop, we need to look at how does it fit into the farming system. And buckwheat is a very unique plant. It does so many things. I see every crop as a tool. Every crop does some things that are unique and does some things that are very valuable to a system. But too much of a good thing is not good. If we have a one-sided uh, agriculture, the imbalance will start uh, nature will actually rebalance by bringing in pests. You know, those are species that rebalance the system. So with buckwheat, um, I I'll share something about the plant. It's not related to almost, it's unrelated to almost everything else we grow. And one principle that I've learned in 30 years of organic farming is that whenever we have a pest problem, a disease, an insect, a weed, something that we just don't know what to do with, it makes us tempted to go back to chemicals. If we can find how the system is imbalanced, what is it about our system that is causing that species to suddenly pop up and become a problem and rebalance it, the pest goes away. And not that it totally goes away, but it stops being a pest. And I found this to be a universal thing that whenever we've had one of these intractable problems, quite often by introducing the right new species, we solved the problem. So buckwheat is a especially unique tool. Uh, the old farmers here, uh, especially before Roundup came along, if they had quack grass, what anyone would tell you is, oh, you got too much quack in that field, just grow a crop of buckwheat and you'll be rid of it. And it's true, after growing one crop of buckwheat, a whole host of weeds just seemed to go away for a while. And quack grass is one that it's especially hard on. I don't know the biology. I just know that after growing buckwheat, the quack grass is not a problem. Um, I'm gonna digress here and show how buckwheat fits into our system and how we use buckwheat. It's not, we don't grow it because we're gonna make a lot of money on this one crop. We grow it because it will make our system stronger, more resilient, and overall more profitable. So that's only one piece uh, one component of a much more complex entity. When we first started farming organically, one of these uh, really profitable crops that I used to say it was almost like printing our own money was to grow dry edible beans, uh, particularly dark red kidney beans. And the first years we grew and we just made money hand over fist. And then we got a new variety. And I said, darn, this, this variety is garbage. It just doesn't grow like the old one. And then we tried another variety and it turned out it wasn't the variety because we'd been growing too many dry beans on our farm for too long. And we started seeing a disease complex. We found out later it was a group of root pathogens and nematodes. And the nematodes were abrading the roots and the pathogens were moving in. And when we had, especially in a wet year, uh, we had terrible losses, our, our yields were barely profitable after, after about five years into the system, even though they'd been so great before. I found a professor at Cornell who turned my world around in growing dry beans. His name was Georgia Bowie. And he had an, asked an interesting question. The whole dry bean industry in New York, which New York used to be the biggest dry bean state in the nation, was leaving. And it was because of declining yields. And it was because of 
this complex of root rots. And George asked a question, he said, what would happen if we planted a different crop ahead of the dry beans than we normally would? And he did an experiment in a random block. He took a field that was heavily followed with this disease complex. He planted 22 different species. He marked where they were. And then he planted a very susceptible variety of dry beans the next year. And he did root rot ratings. And he found that there were a lot of species that he could follow with dry beans where it didn't change anything. He still had the same problem. There were some made it worse. In fact, a couple of them made it a lot worse. There were a few that improved the roots health a little bit. And there were two that almost eliminated the pest. Those two were yellow mustard and buckwheat. And interestingly enough, they used two very different modes of action. The yellow mustard, actually that mode of action was discovered here, it was discovered in California uh, way back uh, when I was on the board of OFRF, we were getting research reports that OFRF was funding and that started us down a path that really made some big improvements in organic agriculture. But the mode of action there is that the glucosinolates in brassicas, when, they go, when they're clipped by an enzyme, will give off a gas that fumigates the soil. And it fumigates the soil in kind of a selective way. It doesn't take out all the good guys along with the bad guys like methyl bromide would, but it seems to really rebalance and get rid of the bad guys, at least for a while. Buckwheat is a whole nother story. Buckwheat has an organism that lives in the rhizosphere of the root system that hunts down, it gives off chitinase, and that dissolves the cell walls of these pathogens and it eats them. So buckwheat has a very different method that it works with. And of course, having more modes of action prevents resistance, makes the system stronger all the way around. So George got us using yellow mustard in our rotation. We found a spot where we were actually not growing anything that we should have been. That was in the spring after growing corn. We just frost seeded the yellow mustard. It would grow and we would work it in ahead of the dry beans. And the uh, first year we did it, George said, now don't do the whole field. I want you to leave me a strip so that we can go out and see if it really helped. And he came out with his graduate students and wasn't any problem finding where I hadn't put the yellow mustard because there was a tremendous difference in the growth of the beans, tremendous difference in the roots. Make a long story short, we more than doubled our bean yields. We actually went higher than we had been before we started having all the disease problems just by diversifying the system, adding some more crops. And um, buckwheat has another skill. This doesn't have anything to do with the beans, but it gives off bicarbonates from the roots. And I remember being in college, and this just dates how old I am. I won't even say how, what year it was, but um, professor had us do a soil testing lab and we were testing for phosphorus. And this was a really brilliant professor. He, uh, he had some fun at our expense though, because we were all tempted to cheat because nobody's phosphorus test was working. We weren't getting any readings. And he kind of laughed and he said, yeah, I took a sample where I knew there was no phosphorus that you could extract with that, <laughs> with that extractant. And then he asked us a question. He said, how would you go about growing a crop on this field to test zero for phosphorus? Of course, everyone said, let's put on fertilizer. And he said, well, that probably would work, but there's a better way. He said, grow buckwheat in it. Because the phosphorus in that particular field was tied, it was a very low pH. It was tied up with iron and aluminum. There were iron phosphates, aluminum phosphates. And with the bicarbonates that the buckwheat roots were giving off, it was actually extracting phosphorus and ended up increasing the amount of phosphorus in the system. So that gave me a lot of respect for buckwheat. Um, anyone that's grown buckwheat though will tell you there's some real frustrations. Buckwheat is indeterminate. It will have ripe seeds while it's still blooming. Worse yet, those ripe seeds start falling off while it's still blooming. And we, before the climate change uh, made some major changes here in New York, we used to count on a frost to terminate it and then go in and harvest it real quick. Well, it doesn't freeze when it used to freeze anymore. It freezes about six weeks later. 
And we found that we have to swath the buckwheat. And the swathing really works. You can, you can swath buckwheat, keep your ripe seeds, and even some blossoms that have just barely set will ripen while this buckwheat lays on the ground. And then we pick it up with a windrow picker. And that makes it uh, makes a huge difference. Also, it uh, doesn't gum up the inside of the combine. It gives it a chance for the leaves to dry off, much easier to thresh. And that's just a hint that anyone who's thinking about buckwheat, I would highly recommend you get equipped for swathing. And, and in addition to that, it raised the yield by about 50%. Um, market for buckwheat is strong. It's localized, of course, uh, I live in Penyan. Burkitt Mills is the largest buckwheat mill in the world. And unfortunately, they're buying their, most of their buckwheat in Manitoba. And it's because farmers here want to grow corn and soybeans. It would be a, they'd be a lot better off all the way around if they diversified their system and, used, and took advantage of the services of that extra diversity. So I would encourage anyone out there, not just buckwheat, but to think about any other crop. How can we diversify our farms? I, th I would contend that any new crop that we add to the farm has the potential to make it more resilient, make it more profitable, and also to make our farm more successful and I think more fun. Uh, to me, it's a lot of fun to have all these different plants. And as we're dealing with climate change, there are some other things going on. Uh, we now have a lot longer dry spells than we used to have. They're a lot more intense. We have more heat than we used to get. We also have longer wet spells and more intense rains. With all these extremes, the diversity of the farm gives us resilience because we'll never have a set of, set of conditions that make every crop do poorly. We'll also uh, have these chances that if we have a disaster in one part of the year, when you've got more diversity, you've got other things still being planted, other things still being harvested. So in addition to this resilience that the added diversity gives the farm, it's our crop insurance. And it keeps us busy year round. Instead of this marathon race in the spring to plant one or two crops and get it all done quickly and need huge machinery, uh, we can be planting something virtually eight months out of the year and harvesting something about eight months out of the year makes much better use of our labor, keeps our soil covered. Uh, another thought on this is as we're dealing with climate change, we need to be part of the solution. We need to be sequestering carbon. Why are we only growing a crop four months of the year, at least in New York and much of the Corn Belt, that's the case. There are plants that will fit into almost every ecological niche except dead winter when it's frozen hard. And even then, there are some plants that will grow on some days. So we have this whole range of plants. The C3 crops will grow in short, when the days are shorter, when there's less intense sunlight, when the temperatures are cooler. Things like triticale, Austrian winter peas, uh, annual ryegrass will grow about the time the temperature goes to 34 degrees, 35 degrees. There's a little going on. Uh, yellow mustard, you know, a lot of the brassicas will grow at these lower temperatures. In the summer, when we now have a lot less water, a lot hotter temperature, the C4 crops do better. So we can design a system that takes advantage of the changing of the seasons and actually harvest sunlight and harvest carbon all year round. That is a part of the, the world's, the big picture solution to the problem, but it also is a small picture solution to the problem that every farm benefits from as an individual. So I'll encourage you to go out and try new things and then share what we learn and see how much progress we could make. Great, thank you so much, Rachel and Klaus. That was great. I think it was a nice um, compliment. What, you know, you guys are coming from very different um, places in the country and very different points of view. So I thought it was really fantastic to, uh, you know, as a you know, as a graduate student and as a, you know, farmer, a very seasoned farmer, it was like really great to hear these two stories of buckwheat. Um, 
I want to ask a couple of questions that have come out up. There's a there's a Miller, and I believe he's David, who I believe he's in California, and he had some questions about um, buckwheat as a Miller, um, the dehulling costs being very uh, cost prohibited. And maybe I don't know if either one of you will have anything to add to this, but I wanted to address the question. He said, as a Miller um, buckwheat costs seem related to dehulling losses as much as anything. I want to learn about innovations and in equipment for buckwheat processing as a artisan slash mid scale and at mid scale volumes. Um, and he thanks Klaus for your guidance. Um, saying that buckwheat is very popular with their customers um, in California, but the cost of domestic hull groats is prohibitive. Much of the organic hulled buckwheat that they see is um, from China. Um, and then he also says that uh, Austrian winter peas are um, a specialty legume in Italy and they're great eating. Uh, but anyway, do you have, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> do you, um, yeah, do you have anything to say about um, about that? Like the how costly it is to do this de-hulling? Do you know much about that? I know this is more on the milling side. I've made a bit of a study of de-hulling different crops because we have a spelt de-huller and we grow einkorn and emmer and these are all hulled crops and I've looked at millet. Uh, buckwheat is really an interesting crop. The old mills here didn't have special equipment. They would mill the buckwheat with the hull on and then sift the hull out. Mm -hmm. And actually some of the uh, recipes for pancakes, a lot of people liked a buckwheat that had a more assertive flavor and a little more bitterness to it. Mm -hmm. And that would be easily achieved by not sifting out as much of the hull. So that for buckwheat flour, it's possible to just mill it with stones and then sift out as much hull as you wanna sift out and you can make different, you can actually make a range of products, which for an artisan uh, mill, could be an advantage and you may find customers who want to have some, more of the hull left in than some of the commercial product. Now for Kasha, uh, I know a little bit about the process and of course the biggest buckwheat mill and ma manufacturer of Kasha in the world is in Peng Yen, just a few miles from us and the owners are good friends of mine. So I don't want to give away too much of their proprietary secrets, but uh, if I were to de had to de-hull, buckwheat from scratch, I would use a stone dehuller. I would take a pair of stones, and this is how spelt was traditionally dehulled in European mills, and set them far enough apart so that they abrade and pull the hulls apart. And if they can be set precisely enough, and, the, and I think an important piece would be to grade the buckwheat so that you don't have very small and very large seeds in the same batch being dehulled, then you can pull the hulls off the buckwheat seeds and leave the groats pretty much intact. And then you have to use an air uh, process to basically blow the hulls out. But I think this is an area where a clever miller can really uh, set themselves apart and make a great artisan product. And I remember in the old days here, there were some farmers that would make traditional buckwheat pancakes and they always had a, a very assertive, much more interesting flavor. And it's because they would get some of the dark buckwheat flour that had a little more of the hull left in it. Great, well, we, we lost one viewer because he says he's headed down to the shop to experiment right now and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, wonderful. Um, Okay, we have comments on what uh, Klaus just said. I think another thing to consider in maybe the dehulling process and potential losses might also be the ease of dehulling. I haven't gotten to experiment with this a lot myself. I'd be curious if Klaus had any thoughts on, you know, like if you have worked with different varieties and experimented with like how easy it is to remove the hull. I think I've heard that sort of in commentary before that that could be something from a variety standpoint and an agronomic standpoint that could translate over to its ability to process and make its way through through this supply chain easily. I think that's a really important point. Uh, the, I know our local buckwheat mill wants the largest growths they can get. And the breeding is gonna put a lot of effort into breeding larger buckwheat. And uh, that makes some really beautiful kasha. You know, cause the, the bigger hulls are, I think they, they're easier to de-hull completely clean. 
And Burkett Mills claim to fame is that they can, they were able to do a perfect job of making Snow White dehauled buckwheat before other companies had figured out how, and they were doing it when the technology was not as advanced so that there was more art and skill involved in their product. I have heard a complaint though from farmers saying that since the breeders have been making these bigger hulls, they feel the yields have dropped a little and that the buckwheat is maybe not as suitable for cover crop because when you've got bigger seeds, obviously you have to plant more pounds per acre to get the same number of plants. And some of the older farmers were saying, I wish we could still get our old common buckwheat, which had small seeds and that uh, you only had to use 30 pounds instead of 50 pounds to get the same stand in your field as a cover crop. And I think also these, the smaller common buckwheat was maybe more often used for grinding the dark flour where they would grind the whole thing. And of course, if you're grading out the biggest buckwheat seeds to make kasha, there's nothing to keep you from taking the small seeds and using them to make a, a flower that is a little darker. I assume consumers are not, uh, they want whiter, lighter flower, right? This is, is this, an, is, it sounds like this is an issue. It can be, although uh, we're learning to enjoy our food more and we're learning to be more adventurous. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Rachel, you might have more direct experience, but have you had experience with both darker and lighter buckwheat? I have not. I've only read about the lighter in terms of flowers. I've I've never yeah. tried a white buckwheat flower. So I'm if you have if you have a source, I'd love to get it. But I've never seen it, at least in my stores. Normally what I see like in the co-ops or you know, in most like pancake products, most of the products that I interact with. I believe are the dark flowers that from my understanding, because my understanding is like the light flowers are very light and don't have that speckliness in them. Is that correct, Klaus? That's exactly correct. And they, they have, they're less interesting. You know, people eat buckwheat because they like that, that flavor. But I imagine it'd be easier to sneak it into products, you know, kind of under, under the <laughs> radar. And so I, I could see that if, you know, just thinking about like, food products and being able to integrate it into mixes. I, I feel like that is sort of the opportunity for growth in buckwheat, even though I, I fully believe that both from a milling side and um, from a consuming side, incorporating the whole seed product can be beneficial on a number, a number of uh, levels. One of the less intuitive products that uh, you can get in Penyan is buckwheat ice cream. What? Oh, wow. <laughs> they actually take the kasha, the snow white kasha and the roasting and Penyan has this wonderful smell when they're roasting the buckwheat for to make kasha. But it, it, believe it or not, is a delicious ice cream and it's a local specialty. <laughs> well, I'm from New York and I still, I haven't made it out to Penyan, but now next time I go home, you know, post COVID, I'm going to go up there and try that ice cream. <laughs> Well, if, uh, you should contact me ahead and I would arrange a meeting for you with the owners of, of Burkett Mills. I'm sure they'd give you a tour. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I love the flavor and I get a little frustrated when I do the sneak it in method with my son. And then he's like, what's up with these? Because they're dark. Because they're dark. <laughs> so I find myself using oat flour and other things when I'm trying to, you know, diversify a bit with cookies or whatnot. Um Someone else is asking about um, using this as a forage for goats and wondering if you know anything about that. Um, if you try, uh, they said, yeah, they said, does anybody have any experience with buckwheat as a forage for ruminants, specifically goats? There is an extension bulletin at Cornell. Uh, Dr. Thomas Bjorkman wrote it mm -hmm. and it goes into great detail. Uh, buckwheat is equal to alfalfa as a forage. It is very hard to get it dry though. So it's best used as baleage or as haylage. And uh, it has one downside and it's very seldom a problem, but it's best to mention it. And that's, it can cause animals to sunburn. They become photosensitive if they eat a diet that's almost entirely uh, buckwheat forage. So that, that's just something to, to watch out for, or if the animals start having sunburn, you know what, it, what was causing it. And I don't know what causes it. It's just, and I'm repeating something. I've never seen it, but that was in the extension bulletin yeah. that uh, Thomas put out. 
Actually, on that note, Klaus, a lot of what I know from about Buckwheat has come from Thomas Bjorkman's um, extension bulletins, and he has a really nice website. Um, so maybe I can just link to it in the chat here. I'm just going to look it up, but it has a lot of really good introductory information and does go a little bit into forages, alternative uses, and just a lot of sort. It's a really good 101 type yes. um, website for, for anyone interested in growing Buckwheat. Yeah, Thomas is a great researcher and Burkett Mills has funded a lot of work that he's done. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I just know him about brassicas. I had no idea. <laughs> he had a previous yeah. life in buckwheat. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> he was the go-to person for buckwheat. Wow. Um, there is a question about the seed rate. What seed rate do you use for grain versus cover crop? I use the same. Uh, and it's at 50 pounds of the large seeded because here we can't get the uh, any other varieties really except for the ones that have been developed for kasha. Obviously, when we've got the big kasha mill right here, this is what we need, what we need to grow. Mm -hmm. So there's a challenge for Rachel, and maybe you could find some of the old common. <laughs> Well, yeah, we have um, we have one variety trial that well we have we have you know seed sizes that range from very very small. So, for example, the tartary buckwheat um, variety that we work with is incredibly small, um, all the way up to you know I'm trying to give give some good good size ranges, but like from a grain of rice to um, maybe almost like a pea size. So, just to give people an idea of like how important um, how important you know. That, that is to your seeding rate. And so because of that, the proper, the proper seeding rate can range from you know, 40 to 60 pounds, maybe even higher. I don't know for like the smallest that you can get, but um, important to know what you're working with. The small seeder, you could actually get down to 30 and be fine from what the old timers were saying. Uh, you just made me think of something else that buckwheat does not need a very exceptionally fine seed bed. And for the pioneers who came here, when they broke the land for the first time, buckwheat was a great pioneer crop where the, it would take it from essentially a forest soil and make it much more suitable for annual cropping in just a few months of growing. And this is the magic of the buckwheat roots and the effects that they have on the soil. And one reason that we really need to bring buckwheat into our systems on a lot more farms. Um, we have a comment from June Russell, which I thought was interesting. They said, she said, um, they've seen interest in tartary uh, buckwheat, which I believe is just a different species of buckwheat, right? Um, from, and they carry it um, at, uh, I think, Grow New York City Grains um, from Angelica Mill. Um, we did have Nate Kleinman from Experimental Farm Network did a presentation about that during the variety showcase. That's on, if people are interested in that, that's on um, this same YouTube channel during the variety showcase weeks. So you can find it in the playlist. But um, he talked about, he cooked with it and he talked a little bit about it. It sounded like it was a lot, um, it was more bitter. So uh, maybe if people already have some issues with that, they're not gonna like it as much. So either of you guys have experience growing that? I've never grown it, I've read about it. It has a different amino acid profile if, I, if I'm remembering the references, that's yeah. kind of unique. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I've only worked with one variety. And so that was why Nate's talk was so interesting to me was to see all this like seed diversity in tartary buckwheat, it's so different. So I don't know how representative the variety I've worked with um, is of all tartary buckwheat, but I do know from an agronomic standpoint that generally tartary buckwheat is a little bit less fast at emerging and then developing a canopy. So probably not the best option if people are really interested in those cover crop services. Um, uh, anecdotally, when I've grown it, it's done fairly well and actually yield, had very high yields. Again, not a, 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 you know, a, a blanket statement for all tartary buckwheats, but that was my experience. Um, in terms of seed quality, there's also a lot of um, uh, polyphenolic compounds. So in particular, I think someone mentioned quercetin, um, but rutin content in, um, in tartary buckwheat can be 
tends to, it can be uh, almost like an order of magnitude higher. It's also a present in common buckwheat, but a, an order of magnitude higher in tartary buckwheat. So people who are interested in those, um, those, those polyphenolic compounds and other, you know, sort of um, metabolic, uh, positive metabolic effects of buckwheat, um, oftentimes talk about tartary as something that might be really interesting. Um, so I don't know if that answers that person's question, but I, I, think it's, I think it's a really important species to consider, but just has very different niches, both in our diet and maybe in agricultural systems. You just made me think of something else about the agronomics of buckwheat and being in, working in uh, Washington state, you've got longer days. You're about two degrees north of where we are in New York and buckwheat is photosensitive. So if we plant the buckwheat early, like right after the danger of frost is over, we get very long internodes. We get a lot of biomass, but a relatively small amount of seed or relatively low harvest index, a lot less seed relative to the rest of the plant biomass. And if we plant late, then we start getting the shorter internodes, more blossoms. Of course, if we go too late, we don't get as many internodes because the season is limited, but buckwheat will make a crop in 60 days and it was one of the crops that was grown, uh, especially before climate change lengthened the season, places like New Brunswick and parts of Quebec and Northern Ontario, where the season was not long enough for anything else to get ripe. They could grow buckwheat and get it ripe. And I talked to a farmer who bought a barn once and he said there was still bundles of buckwheat upstairs in the barn where they used to bind it. And th this would be in, areas that were so cold and so such poor soil that nothing else grew and yet they could grow buckwheat in those areas and uh, produce a substantial amount of food. And I've heard anecdotally, I think that's a big reason why it's such a big rotational crop in North Dakota is it's just, you know, you are able to actually integrate it into this cropping system. It can do quite well with a short growing season where there yeah. might be many fewer options in terms of seed crops that can, can do right. well. In that type of climate. Also, I've noticed that it takes drought really well. Now, I, I've noticed in your talk, I, and this could be for good grain production that you can't take drought, but it doesn't seem to have to have much moisture in the soil. So that you can throw buckwheat a half inch into what looks like dry dirt and it'll, it'll germinate. And that's a really great trait for a cover crop. And you can throw it on top. And it'll grow. Uh, another thing we've used buckwheat for is in our Cornell uh, variety trials for corn. Dr. Margaret Smith is has uh, is part of a network that does organic variety trials. And of course, you're doing small plots, and you have access lanes where people walk, and they always grow up in weeds. And it's a real mess if you don't have herbicides. What we found is at last cultivation, we just hand sow buckwheat, throw it on top after we're done. And the, you never have any weeds. The buckwheat will grow. The foot traffic of the researchers taking notes controls it. And the weeds don't grow. Another place we've used buckwheat in for a utilitarian purpose is around the edges of black plastic in vegetable beds, where the buckwheat will pretty much eliminate the growth of weeds. And when it gets high enough to be a problem to the beds, you just top it take a scythe or a weed whacker, you know, and cut it about eight inches off the ground. And of course, it's great to have the bees brought in to the beds. You know, there's a lot of beneficial reasons, but it gets rid of the weeds in both cases and it's a whole lot less work than weeding. Great, well, we've come to the end of our time here today about with uh, our discussion on buckwheat, but I really appreciate both of you so knowledgeable about this crop. Um, and it was really interesting. I know I learned a lot and it seems like uh, the comments that I'm getting on YouTube are people are really fascinated by this and inspired and going to eat more buckwheat. And we got a miller that's already back at work trying out new things. So I would say it's a success. Thank you. Yeah, there's one more crop, one more product or food that you didn't mention. And that's, Buckwheat honey is a specialty. Yes, yes. And it has a very unique flavor. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Um, 
We're going to be back here in about um, at, at the top of the hour. It's going to be noon here on the Pacific uh, coast. Uh, but so we have about a six minute break for everyone to take a little bio break, get a glass of water. Um, thank you again, Rachel and Klaus for joining. Thank you. Us.
All right, and we are live. Take it away, June. Okay. Hello, Leo, come back. Um, I'm June Russell. I'm now with the Glenwood Center for Regional Food and Farming. Just going to do a brief intro for today's panel on uh, Tales from the Front Lines of Marketing Grains. Uh, it's been one heck of a year, that's for sure. Um, about a year ago, things were pretty topsy turvy. So we'll hear from uh, Harold Wilkins, who's the owner of a fifth generation family farm in Ashukum, Illinois. Uh, Harold owns Janie's Farm and Janie's Mill. Using certified organic and regenerative practices, they grow many different crops in a biodiverse rotation. They've been organic for 20 years and manage a range of about 700 to 2,500 acres every year. They now do custom stone milling uh, and have been for the past three years. Haley Webking of Meadowlark Organics, along with her husband, John, and co-owner, Paul Bickford, farm 950 acres in Ridgeway, Wisconsin, which is part of the Driftless region in Wisconsin. With access to good land and Paul's mentorship, they have been committed to farming organically and are producing quality feed for their animals and are committed to growing delicious and nutritious staple foods like food grade and milling grains and dried beans. Leo Ballerini is the operations and sales manager for GrowMyC Grains. We got Leo to step away from his family's restaurant in Brooklyn, New York, uh, to run GrowMyC Grain Stand, which he's been doing for about two and a half years now. GrowMyC Grains actively assists regional farms and processing businesses with market entry by providing market access through GrowMyC's network of green markets and by, <clears throat> excuse me, identifying and connecting value chain participants. Uh, so with that, um, I'm also pitch hitting for Julia Raggio, who's going to introduce the video and she moderates some discussion with all the panelists. Um, there may not be that much time for Q&A, um, but we could do that in the chat. So use the chat. All of our participants are here and can answer your questions that way. Um, and with that, um, Abba could start the video. Hi, good morning. Uh, welcome to Greens Week Market Updates. We have a few different people here to talk about what's been going on in the marketplace in different pieces of the value chain. So um, I'm Julia, I'm with Grown YC Grains and I'm gonna be facilitating the discussion. So Leo, if you wanna kick it off. Hi everybody, my name is Leo from Grow NYC Grains. I am the operation and sales manager. Um, and I will tell you about Grow NYC Grains today. I'm trying to share my screen and I am disabled. Julia, can you help me share my screen? Do you see the screen share at the bottom? Yeah, it says it's I'm disabled. Okay, let me see. What about now? Great. All right. All right. So Crow and YC grains, kick it off with a photo of our teaching garden, growing grains and see downtown Manhattan in the back, back there. This is a photo from Governor's Island. So a little bit about Grow and YC. We are an environmental program uh, based in New York City and we have uh, four core components. We have a green market that hosts the farmer's markets around the city. Um, composting, educational, and greening spaces programs. Uh, we have 52 green markets throughout the city, where during peak season, we have over 500,000 uh, folks passing through each day, um, each week. Uh, we have over 300 uh, 
We have our bakers that represent over 300 acres of grains consumed throughout the year, which you know, for our purposes is exceedingly special. Uh, 75 grain farmers and millers represented throughout our network um, and real reach throughout the city uh, with all of our various programs. 1.8 million viewers pass through our website every month. Now, as mentioned, 300 acres of wheat consumed by our bakers per year uh, is a staggering number and something that you know has certainly grown over the last few years, which is what I'll touch on. Um, we have 32 uh, bakeries in our network and half of them are commercial bakeries. The other half are uh, farm-based bakeries and have begun increasing how much flour they're using every month from our region. Um, we have 52 markets that operate in our network uh, and farmers that come from a radius of 250 miles around New York City. And that's our map of our region there where all of our farmers are coming from. And then on the right, a map of where you can find our green markets throughout the city. Uh, green markets mission is to provide food access to folks who are living in the city and to provide market access to farmers farming around the city. Uh, in 2009, Green Market kicked off its baker's rule, which uh, came out of the need to have uh, to provide access to uh, locally grown flour and to provide uh, that, that access to bakers that are in our, our uh, Green Market network and to, again, you know, support that mission of keeping those regional farmers farming and providing that access to the city. Um, it started uh, in 2009 as a requirement of 15% locally grown grains across uh, the um, selection of baked goods that you have and has recently been bumped up to a requirement of 25% in 2019. Just some photos of some of our convenings over the last few years. Uh, Green Market uh, Grown Icy Grains has uh, paired with a bunch of um, entities around the, the region like Cornell uh, and Bakers regionally to provide uh, technical assistance and videos, case studies to support uh, folks who are interested in building uh, bake businesses sur surrounding baking, whether they be mills, bakeries, or farms. Uh, and some of our Cornell field trials support that and baking evaluations that we did for a couple of years during the beginning of uh, the Green Market Regional Grains Project. And this is a map of our 2013 grain shed and what our region looked like to us back then. May 2014, we kicked off the Green Market Grain Stand uh, Union Square with a modest selection of from eight different farms and mills and 45 different uh, products that we were offering. Uh, we, in 2015 and 2016, paired with distillers and uh, local, uh, local brewers uh, that were using uh, locally grown grains in their products and has since been a mainstay uh, for the grains project and uh, the grain stand. One example of you know that connection that the grain uh, grains stand and grains project has with the distillers is you know marking the the regional products with appellations such as like the Empire Rye Association, which requires. Um, distillers to use a minimum of 75% of rye and calling it empire rye, that marketing surrounding the, the rye has been immensely successful for the, the distillers and for rye growers around the region, creating a wonderful symbiotic relationship. Uh, today, the grains uh, project has evolved into Grow NYC Grains. We have our sister program, Grow NYC Wholesale, where we're distributing grains uh, in, in bulk packages to restaurants and helping to supply the grain stand um, in New York. So, you know, identifying restaurants that will come to the grain stand and pairing them with 
you know, the proper products that they need and get distribution uh, through Grow NYC Wholesale has been amazingly successful and humble roots, like as you see on the right, grain stand showing up at Rockefeller Center and representing the local grains at the center of the financial heart of New York. Um, for years, we had our bagging operation for the grain stand out of Industry City uh, using just a 20C license and a uh, co-packing bag. We had space for up to five pallets and have now moved into a larger warehouse where we can fit up to 28 pallets at a time for, uh, for wholesale distribution. And this is an example of some of the products that we were carrying in October 2019. You see quite a variety there. Um, and then reflected here, uh, November of 2019 at our grain stand at the Grand Army Farmers Market, where you know that variety is in full bloom. Over the last few years, Grain Stand has really been effective at getting local grains, flour, and beans to uh, home bakers and folks who are just tinkering around and interested in getting into baking and home cooking. Um, you see that progression over the last few years and along with Grow NYC Wholesale has moved uh, over $2.5 million in locally grown grains. Um, so something to highlight, especially in the last, uh, last slide there, the peak in sales in 2019, uh, certainly came out of, a, a flexibility that the grain stand had to pivot, uh, you know, at a moment's notice from one product to another, uh, when COVID hit, our sales doubled over what they were March the previous year. We had to double the staff at all of our markets in order to accommodate folks uh, requests and also to stay in COVID safety compliance. Um, but, you know, it was pretty clear early on that there was going to be that spike when folks were asked to, you know, stay home and not go out as much pretty as early as February. We saw bean sales spike entirely um, and that certainly continued into March. And as you'll see, after that, you know, black beans, uh, cranberry beans were among our, our top 10 sellers during that time as their shelf stable, white bread flour, high extraction flour all purpose were not only, you know, good for uh, folks diet at the time, but also recreational as folks were staying home and looking for things to do. Baking became immensely successful and engaging for folks and we were able to accommodate that. Our top 10 products made up almost 20% of our sales. Certainly could have made up more if we didn't have certain spatial limitations, um, but still great to have maintained that variety in the rest of our products as, again, that flexibility of being able to pivot from one product to another at a moment's notice was so much of where that success came from that year. And that skill set in, you know, being able to bag so much flour in such a short period of time allowed us to support World Central Kitchen in bagging thousands of pounds of beans for a lot of their relief work and was very crucial during that time. So to wrap up, you know, this is on the left, we have a more recent map of our grain shed, the network that we've been working with and uh, how it's evolved since that previous map that you saw earlier from 2013, the more updated map of the uh, green market, uh, farmers market locations and food box locations throughout the city. And this is where we're operating out of. And a photo of the green, uh, the grain stand at Union Square, our flagship location. Thank you. Thanks, Leo. Um, Hallie, do you wanna share your screen next? Yep. Can get to it. Okie dokie. So I am Hallie Wepking. I'm representing Meadowlark Organics and Meadowlark Community Mill. Uh, Meadowlark Organics is the name of our farm. Obviously, the mill is Meadowlark Community Mill. Um, we focus on farmer-owned whole grains and stone ground flour in Ridgeway, Wisconsin. 
Um, we're located in the driftless region of the upper Midwest, which is an unglaciated area, basically meaning that in, during like the last ice age, the glaciers avoided us. So we have a lot of hills and rocky outcroppings. This is the Mississippi River. Um, and we are located here about 40 miles west of Madison. So um, a fairly different landscape than say, you know, central Illinois. Um, so lots of hills and um, our entire farm is basically highly erodible. So we have to be really mindful of that in the choices that we make. Um, so this is a picture of me with very short hair and my husband, John, before we were husband and wife. Um, we met cooking in a restaurant in New York City called Prune. Um, this is the basement of Prune. And uh, after several years, we, John told me that his real dream was to move back to Southwest Wisconsin and try to manage his family's farm. And so that sounded pretty good to me. We were both a little um, burned out in the restaurant cooking world and really had realized that the things that the thing that mattered most to us was food instead of restaurants. And John had this connection to this land. So we were able to move back in 2014 or move here in 2014. And we tried originally to farm his family land, but there wasn't really a viable transition um, that was gonna be available to us. And so we found work with a longtime farmer in Ridgeway, Wisconsin, whose name is Paul Bickford. And he had recently converted his grass-based dairy to an organic crop farm. Um, and we came along and basically transitioned it to be focused on food grade small grains. Um, small grains serve really important eco service system benefits, it, but they can be very uh, low, low profitability, low margin. So it, unless you can get them to be um, in the food grade value stream. So we coming from a culinary background and actually being kind of aware of what was going on with like farmer ground flour and Cayuga Pure Organics and those places in New York. Um, we were inspired by that work and brought, brought our ideas to the farm in Ridgeway. Um, so this is our farm's mission statement, which is we're farmers committed to cultivating a regenerative ecosystem by growing real food, improving the health and resilience of our soils, protecting the safety of our water and investing in the vitality of our rural community. And one of the central ways that we've been able to do that is by um, incorporating the value added side of things. So um, over the last year, we built a, a mill on our farm. Um, but basically the foundation is, you know, our, the land itself, the almost a thousand acres that we farm. Um, and obviously our, our relationship with Paul is really critical and we saw the need to really uh, expand the, the value of what we were producing on this farm in order to have a viable farm transition with a non-family member. Um, but we've worked out uh, an arrangement where John and I now own 50% of the farm and will continue to um, purchase more shares basically in the farm business. But we knew that we needed to uh, increase the income that the farm was generating. And one of the important ways, one of the things that has really helped us do that was receiving a value added producers grant from the USDA, which allowed us to work with a local stone mill called Lonesome Stone Milling. Um, and it, we were able to launch our own brand and start to really develop relationships with 
wholesale and other retail customers. So this is just a picture of our mill under construction in 2020. It is like in the middle of our farm buildings, um, which is actually great. It's on an, it partially is, is on an old uh, foundation of a dairy, a milking parlor. So it's, it's fun to see it kind of reinvented. Um, and now this is kind of where we are. So this picture features our Miller Rink, who's our partner and Miller Extraordinaire and our one Meadows Mill that's been doing a lot of heavy lifting lately um, inside our new mill. These are some packages of products that we sell. Um, and I think uh, central both to our farm and the mill business itself are these values of stewardship and empowerment. We're really focused on the farmers. It's not just us. Um, we overbuilt our mill basically. So uh, the idea is to be able to expand the demand for locally grown stone ground flowers and other green products, other staple foods so that we can increase the demand so other farmers have access to better markets. Um, and then obviously resilience, both in agriculture. So having better farming practices, more diversity, um, broader range of crops grown in the upper Midwest, um, getting away from row crop agriculture and also economic resilience, both in these rural communities um, and also providing, you know, a, a more secure food system in, in our region and nourishment because it's important to take care of our soil and that in turn takes care of our people. Um, so that's kind of who we are and how we got started and where we are right now. Great, thank you. Harold, do you wanna take over and give us a little introduction? You're, you're muted still. There we go. Hi. My name is Harold Milken. Uh, together with my son and my nephew, we operate Cheney's Farm and Mill. Uh, I don't have any slides for you this morning, but we're in the middle of our field work for spring and um, running kind of haphazardly here right now. Um, now I'll talk a little bit about who we are and what we're doing. Uh, Janie's Farm um, started in 2003. Um, well, I've been a, a conventional farmer for 23 years. Uh, we had the chance to try organics uh, through Herman Brockman, a neighboring landowner. Uh, the Janie's Farm and Mill are named after our oldest daughter, who passed in a car accident in 2001. And it was after her passing that we saw uh, changes that were available to us um, to go organic. Um, so we farm about 3,000 acres, a little bit more uh, organically. Uh, most of our landowners, because we rent um, approximately 75% of our land, um, they're all people who want their farms to be farmed organically. Um, we um, run a rotation of uh, wheat or rye, small grains, uh, cover crop of uh, red clover. Uh, then we uh, go into uh, corn. Uh, we raise different types of corn. Um, uh, mainly for distilleries, for the milling. Uh, we do sell some for feed. Uh, then we put in a rye cover crop, um, and then we put in soybeans the following year, uh, which go to soy milk and to tofu. Um, so our, our farm um, is, is diversified in that uh, we do use some no-till practices um, but we also use tillage uh, depending on what the land needs. Um, so um, we um, 
I'd say 50% uh, of our grain goes for feed, about 25% of our grain goes to distilleries, and then the other 25% uh, goes for milling, whether our own mill or to other mills. Um, in 2017, uh, actually in 2015, we saw the opportunity uh, to start a stone ground mill. Uh, we're an hour and a half south of Chicago. Um, so uh, we installed two uh, stone mills, INSCO um, mills out of Denmark, um, and sifters. And so we have been actually milling since the middle of uh, 2017. Um, from 2017 to 2018 and a half, uh, everything was wholesale. I uh, went through distributors in Chicago, um, then uh, self-distributed uh, quite a bit. And then in 2000 and middle of 2018, we started doing retail packaging. Um, by 2019, we had changed our packaging um and also went to retail online sales uh so when the pandemic hit in 2019 or 2020 uh we were prepared to um, handle the demand um we went um uh, we saw a five thousand percent jump in our retail sales during that time period uh our sales have come away from that, but, um, you know, we still are um, um, doing a lot of retail sell sales. What's interesting to me is, is that while Chicago and the state of Illinois are our largest sales area, retail, uh, California is second and New York is third. Um, so in our uh, mill, uh, we work with six other farmers. Uh, they raise specialty crops for us. Uh, probably 90% 90, 90 of what we mill comes from our own farms, but um, we're working with other farmers and hoping to increase that. Um, I have a philosophy about, um, about flour. Uh, Number one is quality. You have to have the best quality or the baker's not going to use it. Second is the farmer. Um, I actually work with a farmer from Western Nebraska, one from Montana, uh, one from Michigan, uh, two from Michigan actually, um, and then a, a couple of other farmers around us. And uh, I look at uh, who they are and why they're organic and uh, so it's important to me that we have the right people working with us and then i i worry about location um so um we built uh when we build our mill we build it in a local town uh in an industrial building we were fortunate enough to um purchase it and uh, we're uh, half mile from the interstate, like I said, an hour and a half from Chicago. Um, we uh, had recently realized we were going to have to expand. Uh, so now we have two more mills that will be installed this summer. Uh, we're also working on an oat product. Um, we have it down, but we aren't exactly pleased with the product yet. So we haven't aspirator coming in May. So we will have flake grains uh, probably starting in June. Um, just a lot of things going on. It's kind of a moving target. Um, our distillery business is growing. Uh, there is a, a big push for local um, and um, organic or non-GMO grains going into the distillery market. Um, thank you for the opportunity to introduce myself and our mill and look forward to discussing with uh, 
everybody else about what's happening in the brain chain. Thank you, Harold. Thank you all so much for that introduction. I think it's important that we're all getting together, especially now in what is the aftermath, or some of us might still be in the thick of it, of the flower boom that happened um, as a result of the pandemic. So I just want us to talk a little bit about what we saw emerge as kind of gaps in the value chain and how everybody adapted to what was going on. Um, but first, I want to get a sense of the marketplace that everyone's working with. So I, I assume that all of you are doing retail and wholesale. And Hallie, I know you're doing grain shares as well. So mm -hmm. um, if you could talk about marketplaces that were there right away and those that were maybe a little harder to break into, and if you could identify those. Um, Hallie, let's start with you. Sure. Um, so I think like Harold, we saw, I don't know if it was 5,000 times, but it was a huge increase in our online sales. Um, <laughs> it was like a little bit of a nightmare and really interesting because obviously like our value chain was really insulated for, from so many of the problems that larger industrial production was experiencing. And that was part of the reason why I created Grain Shares, which is a monthly or every other monthly delivery of freshly milled flour and grain. So we have four different options and um, people can select to get it monthly or every other month. And we have some local pickups and some that are shipped out. And part of it was just to say like, you don't have to order 50 pounds at a time. We're here, we will continue to be here. Our grain supply is here. Our, you know, what we were really struggling with was our ability to keep up with the demand. And it was like, there's no, especially with this kind of product that is better when it's fresh, it's like, there's no reason to like, you know, buy 50 pounds at a time if you're not really gonna go through it that quickly. And some people probably were because they were baking every day. But, um, but that has been, I think also just really helpful because there was a, there was a, a fear and I think like a valid one that people would get really excited about it and then the, the demand would drop off. And so I wanted to have a way to engage with people, give them, you know, a real connection to our farm and our milling business and also like maintain that customer relationship um and you know we're not like forcing people to 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 keep their grain shares but i think that it helps to just have kind of that regularity and people seem to really appreciate it for the most part um but i think it was it was just really interesting to see and in, not just in the flower world but you know the friends i have in restaurants and catering being able to be a smaller business and being able to pivot as leo said um really afforded us the opportunity to like, to fill a vacuum when there was no flour on the grocery store shelves um, from, you know, the larger producers. Um, so it also has been a real opportunity to just educate our local customers who maybe didn't realize that um, there was this option for locally grown grain and produced flour. Um, you know, the hard thing has been uh, being able to balance the retail sales with wholesale because some wholesale bakers businesses really slowed down um, if they were providing to restaurants and things like that um, that were not you know were shuttered or taking a pause or just really slow um, and some people have maintained to or managed to like really keep up with their production. So that was kind of a tough thing. And I think just in, in our business in general, it's like finding that balance between um, those retail direct to consumer markets that are like high, high value for us, but also really time consuming high labor um, versus the wholesale that might be lower value, but you're moving a lot more volume. Um, so that's kind of the thing that is yet to yet to be determined how that all shakes out. Because for 
you know, peak COVID, it was like the majority of our business was all retail through our website. Um, and now we'll see kind of where, where, it, where it ends up going in the next year or so, but. Leo and Harold, what did you find in that balance between wholesale and retail during the pandemic? Did you have similar experiences? Harold, I'll let you go ahead. Harold, you're, you're muted. So, I don't want the background noise. To, are you there now? Yep. Hello. Got you now. Hi. Um, so, okay. Um, so yeah, our, our um, retail sales uh, kind of, or our wholesale uh, sales kind of uh, fell off during the pandemic uh, in the beginning. Um, about June, we started to see the wholesale market come back uh, about the same time that our retail trailed off. Um, one of the things I think we were fortunate of was that we had the grain, we had the cleaning facility, and we had the mills, and we could, uh, like Hallie, we could fill those orders, you know, when others couldn't find, um, couldn't find the grain and flour. But, um, you know, it wasn't long, really, for, uh, before our wholesale market really started to come back, and by fall, we started to see more business in our wholesale market. And um, right now we're actually being contacted by more wholesale markets and distributors. And I, I think part of that might be that people are starting to catch on to the grain chain, like, you know, making sure that, you know, that they can source from somebody that has the flour. Um, and also, I think the the connection with the with the actual farmer and the and the um, and, and the local scene has really helped that a lot. Um, yeah, it's really been amazing to see how folks have jumped on the grain train, as you say. Um, we had a good bit of press, uh, both directly and indirectly, uh, over the last year surrounding uh, quarantine baking, pandemic baking, sourdough craze, and everybody coming up with a new chocolate chip cookie recipe that they were fascinated by. Um, and the fascinating thing about that is like, the, I don't think that the publicity was driving the demand. It was the demand that was driving the publicity that, you know, kept on chasing these new, uh, these new trends in how folks were, were consuming and baking. Um, we at uh, the grain stand definitely saw a very immediate drop in our wholesale accounts as restaurants were, were shuttered um, so so widely in the first few weeks and months of, uh, of 2020. Um, there's been, been a very incremental return to restaurants asking for, I mean, even if a restaurant is asking for half of the quantity that they were getting before, we're lucky. But as you know, as mentioned in one of the slides previously, we still had much higher sales than any other year that we've ever seen. I mean, that was a 60% increase in sales and that's all in two and five pound bags at the stand. We don't deliver, we don't ship, um, you know, we don't have an online store. That's all happening through the farmer's markets at the marketplace. And the reason for that is because we were in that unique position where we could break down those 50 pound bags, you know, like the supermarkets were bought out, were cleared out immediately. Um, and there was plenty of flour sitting in warehouses somewhere, but no one was breaking it down. And 
we were in a warehouse and we're breaking it down and it wasn't King Arthur. It was the, you know, the local uh, value chain that we were supporting. And, you know, it, that's, that's where the power is, is being able to pivot so immediately and being able to support your partners who are also saying no to, you know, selling entire, you know, like five totes to folks out West and they're, you know, prioritizing the people that have, they've been partnering with over the last, decade or so um and customers notice that they realize that and they value that and that's why they come to us and that's why they come to all of us um and yeah um you know also to you know the idea that our our sales were were all um were driven by um by these staple products it you know there's also everybody has a different staple product for some folks maybe their their loaf that they make every week is 50 percent einkorn and while that's not in our top 10 uh products it's still very valuable to to have there and be able to offer that to folks when it is nowhere else because it's that diversity that is going to drive the um you know the product development and the you know maintain that interest in the the grains that are local to any region because that you know that it's that diversity that makes shopping locally so appealing to folks otherwise they can go to a supermarket and buy something that's a little more you know cookie cutter so before we kind of wrap up um i think we should talk a little bit about if there are gaps in the value chain that anyone's noticing. Um, Hallie and Harold, it seems like you're both doing so many pieces of it from farming to cleaning, processing, milling, <laughs> distributing. But um, along those lines, do you see, you know, any gap, whether it be education, promotion, marketing, distribution, anything that you're looking to move into or that you see as a need that, that needs to be filled? You want to go Hallie. first, Harold? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't catch that. What'd you say? I said, did you want me to take that first, or do you want to? <laughs> sure, you can. Uh, I. It's that last mile. Uh, the shipping, the distribution, uh, getting it to where you want it to go. Um, uh, I see the changes there. We were in a, a few CSA boxes. Um, you know, I, um, retail sitting on the shelf, we're a little nervous about that because we have a fresh product and it has, you know, used by date. Um, but still, um, we are being asked to, to be involved in the, in the retail um on the shelf um uh what do you want to say um products but um i think there's going to be more mills more regional mills i've been contacted uh by a number of different people who are thinking about doing what hallie and i are doing on a smaller scale um so i think that's kind of um maybe what's missing in the midwest uh, is maybe more like um, Helen and I are pretty close being about four hours apart. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, uh, used to be there was a mill almost every town. Um, so I think there's going to be more milling available, uh, more grains that will be available in different ways. Um, we've got a lot of small on-farm shops uh, that are um, distributing our product to. So um, uh, as far as education with the internet, you know, there's a lot of education that people can get um, without having to be in a region. So um, I think we're starting to fill some of those voids, but uh, I've always said it's going to take another generation to get this full food chain back to where it's local and needs to be. 
Yeah, for sure. I think that that last mile is certainly the hardest one. Um, and I think it's interesting. Um, <laughs> sometimes we talk about how like our business model is to make things uh, as inefficient as possible, which is not really true, but it's like, um, you know, our, our goal isn't to be like, it's just so regional. Like our, our focus is really to, to focus on, you know, the farmers around us, the eaters around us, um, the other producers around us. And, and in some ways that's so it's old fashioned and it's also revolutionary. Um, because our ambition isn't to, to grow, to be, you know, selling. We like, we're not going to compete with King Arthur flour. We're not going to compete with Pillsbury or General Mills. Like that's not the goal. Um, so I think, I think fortunately there are more consumers who are uh, interested in supporting that kind of model. Um, but I think like Harold said, it does require more people taking on either the role of milling or the intermediate um, processing, cleaning, whatever, or the distribution side. So it does need, it does require more engagement from the people who are willing to like put in the work um, so that we can re-regionalize all of these grain systems. What about you, Leo? What do you see as as the gap coming from kind of a different lens of distributing in the city? Yeah, I, I do definitely see the, uh, the potential for milling and expanding the, the grains that are available regionally. You know, there, I, I mean, especially, you know, being at, conferences and such over the last few years, there are so many folks that are interested in growing grains and see the value uh, in growing them, whether, you know, because they have lots of land that's available or because the value added there um, is really where you're increasing those margins. That is definitely, um, you know, there's, there's amazing potential there. But I think also it's in the the preparation of that of that product you know there are a lot more mills than there are people who can bag that and then get it out of the door sort of you know uh to harold's point earlier you know like you said like just the growing and that's great but then the logistics and everything that comes later is you know that's where growing my sea has you know, played a role locally in the city, but we're only one entity. And, you know, there are times where we reach capacity, but there's still that demand that's there. And so to have, you know, folks that can just get a product into a bag and, you know, move it around in the same way that we do uh, would be very valuable. Um, Again, there was a lot of flour in the city last year. It was just not in packages that people were willing to commit to. Um, and that's, you know, that's a pity. That's a real pity. So I, yeah, between milling and, and the, the packaging, that's, that's where I see great potential. Definitely. Um. So unfortunately we have to wrap up. I feel like we could really talk about this for much longer. There's so much to catch up on that's happened in the last year. Um, but thank you so much all for being here and um, I hope we can all enjoy the rest of Brains Week um, and have a good rest of your days. Thanks, Julia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, welcome back everyone. If you wanna turn on your videos and your audios, we'll get started with the Q&A. We just have a few more minutes left in this session, but wanna make sure that we've got the opportunity here. 
Yeah, but I think you have to turn, give us permission. So there we go. Okay. Hi, Haley. Hi, June. Hello. Um, looks like we lost Harold somewhere. We couldn't track <laughs> him. Um, but we just have a couple more minutes. Um, let's see, we've got a couple questions in the chat. So uh, how do you think we get a sense of market size for regional scale of mills and flowers? Somebody doing some market research there. Um, how have you, yeah. <laughs> It seems like it's very much uh, a time of, of discovery still of, we've put lots of products out and introduced, launched new varieties. And it can take a while to find the customer for those things. Um, it's not like, uh, you know, maybe there's folks now who are coming in the marketplace who have a ready, ready made market to sell flour into, but that hasn't always been the case. Um, so as a, a middleman in that, in that procedure, I guess in talking to folks who are in that position of, or, you know, millers and folks who operate at mills, I mean, there's plenty of market size, but I think every mill that I talk to is always at capacity, whatever it might be. So you, you kind of just, you know, if that's what you're interested in doing, just start at what you, what's manageable for you as a business. And then, you know, you're going to learn what your, your market looks like. And, you know, you expand into that over time. You don't want to just go ahead and buy, you know, three mills that, that you don't know how to handle the demand for that. Um, everyone's always at capacity right now. The, the, the movement is, is going, start slow. Yeah. And I think if, if somebody's looking for an answer, like what nationally, you know, what percentage of flour are people consuming from independent mills? I mean, it's still gotta be a really tiny percentage. I don't know if anyone is doing that research or trying to, trying to get a number on that, but um, it is very small compared to Bay State milling and all of those, the, whatever the three or four really big ones. Haley, have you had times, have you had difficulty selling crops at times? Um, <laughs> I, I feel like only because we don't have the time to market them. <laughs> um, I think one of, the, one of the crops that we are finding just a little challenging to move is some, some food grade corn. Um, but, you know, that it's our first real attempt to try to market large volumes of that. But um everything else uh people are eager to eat up so that's great we did get harold hi harold hi june how are you I'm hi, good. Allie. hi um we had had a question there about gauging gauging market size which is has been a moving target for for folks but wondered if you have anything to contribute there as far as on um, market, marketing grains, um, yeah, the, um, we had um, like semi lots of, of corn uh, was pretty hard to move until just recently. Now people are trying to fill. Hold on a no. second. Um, are you there? We're here. I think I hit safe driving mode. Bad fingers. <laughs> Hold on a second. Um, 
I'm going to go to another question here on what kind of potential funding there is for growers or millers. And Haley, you mentioned the value added producer grant. You guys were able to get that helped you build your mill. Yeah, that helped us establish our brand, um, and we were able to work with a with a toll miller. I think that they prefer those kind of like multi tiered relationships where you have a processor. And obviously the farmer is the one who's the recipient of that grant, but they they want to see that you're working with a processor, I believe. But I, I don't know if you're if you're a farmer who has your own mill, you can probably be both of those things. Um, but yeah, those grants are awesome. Um, they say that they've tried to streamline the reporting for it because all of the back end work can be quite um, intense, but uh there's i don't know if the deadline has passed for the current one but people should certainly be on the lookout for future opportunities uh with the value added producers grant which i also think is called something else now but that's a really good one um other funding opportunities there are like in wisconsin we received a grant through the department of ag and T trade consumer protection DACAP. Um, and those, those are called by local by Wisconsin grants, but there probably are other states that have similar, um, programs and that can be like up to $50,000. So that, um, is helping and just like, uh, giving us more cash flow. It's a reimbursement based grant, but it's still really helpful. So I'd say just, just look locally. Um, and then also obviously at the federal level. Okay. Um, Harold, we got you back. Do you want to you finish that thought? You're still on mute, though. There we go. Oh, there we go. Um, uh, yeah, um, it's, it's getting easier to sell uh, organic grain now. I think People are wanting to fill their coffers just in case there's not a crop. Um, but um, to Hallie's point that she just made, uh, the value add producer grant had to be in yesterday, I believe. Um, the um, um, for the 2021 um, grant cycle. Um, also, you know, there's there um, there are some other grants available too, like foundations uh, that are supporting local uh, and regional mills. Frontera, um, um, Bayless, Rick Bayless's restaurants have a grant for like like up to I think fifteen twenty thousand dollars, something like that, for a particular purpose if you have like a particular project you want to do they'll help fund that okay all right um we're almost at the top of the hour i'm getting notice that we have to stop now but thanks everyone for participating um we'll be talking about value chains there are a couple more questions in the chat about funding and fundings for grow my grains in particular so friday is dedicated to uh, groups working on value chain development uh, across the country. So tune in then. Cool. And thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Yeah. Bye.
All right, welcome everyone. I'm going to hand it over directly to Julianne Kellogg of the WSU Sustainable Seed Systems Lab to help facilitate this session. Awesome. Thank you, Ava. We've got a great lineup of speakers. So we're going to smush together a bunch of videos from a bunch of people who are involved in a uh, proposal that we wrote for a pretty complicated project um, that will conduct research along the supply chain for two key rotational crops that I think we don't see enough of, and that is proso millet and buckwheat. Um, I don't know if we need to give individual um, uh, introductions to people. Maybe we can just kind of go around the, the table or I think we did in our in our presentations. Okay, awesome. Evan, do you wanna say anything before we get the video started? No, thanks everyone for being here. We've got yeah, a great group representing what we tried to accomplish with this grant, bringing together researchers, uh, producers, um, processors and users, and we'll get to get their perspectives and hopefully have some good questions for the group at the end. Awesome. Great. And so we'll all just turn off our videos and our audios for now. And then once we're done with the viewing, we'll all come back on for the Q&A. Here we go. Thank you for joining us for this session as we introduce our recently funded Western Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Project. We can all appreciate the value of diverse rotations and the benefits for adapting to climate change, to realize the potential of cropping system diversification and to provide resiliency for farmers and communities, viable marketing opportunities are absolutely essential. Over three years, this project will generate research and engage stakeholders throughout the supply chain to investigate the suitability of millet and buckwheat on farm and in food products. Over the course of two years, we've had many conversations with producers, processors, and end users to identify the challenges that we would face with such a project and the looming questions over how to diversify fields and pallets using millet and buckwheat. Some of these questions are things like which varieties will perform the best, Wh which are the most nutritious, which products are they most appropriate to be used in, and how can we optimize these products to have the best flavor and nutrition through processing. We've identified five objective areas to guide us in pursuit of these goals. First, we'll establish a baseline for millet and buckwheat supply chains so we can understand if we've been able to improve this baseline through this project. We'll use farmer and researcher led field trials to identify the best varieties for producers. And then we'll characterize these varieties to understand how much variation there is in flavor, food functionality and nutrition, and which are the most appropriate to use in end uses such as focaccia, pancake mix, and a children's breakfast bar. We'll conduct a thorough market assessment with consumer surveys, school district questionnaires and stakeholder interviews, and will support supply chain development through education and outreach events and networking tools for producers, processors, and end users. Thank you, Evan, for introducing the project and going over our research objectives. I'm Julianne Kellogg, one of the research team members that helped develop this project, and I can't tell you how excited I am that this project got funded. I'll go over the timeline so that you understand when and where certain research activities and events will be occurring, and then hopefully you can figure out where and when you can get involved in this project. We will kick it off this fall with sampling activities. We will be reaching out to growers of buckwheat and proso millet so that we can collect samples and move these grains through our research pipeline. We'll conduct nutritional phenotyping, malt quality phenotyping, and understand the food functionality characteristics of varieties currently being grown. So this allows us to select check varieties for field trials, but also we can use these currently available varieties for initial development of food product formulations. So the food products that we're going to be formulating include a children's breakfast bar, pancake mix, and a focaccia mix. So once we have an understanding of what the current varieties are capable of, 
we're going to conduct field trials to look at additional varieties. So over the course of 2022 and 2023, we will have multi-location variety trials using a mother baby trial design. That way we can get regional understanding of agronomic performance, nutritional characteristics, malt quality and food functionality of nine to 10 varieties per crop species. We will then be able to find out which of these newer varieties to the region will perform best in these food products that have been formulated by a research team and stakeholder collaborators. And throughout this whole process, there'll be a lot of interacting with stakeholders. And through that, uh, we'll be able to conduct market assessments. We'll have expert sensory panelists and we'll have taste testing at community events. So let's dig into these field trials because they are very important for this or else we'll have no seed to look at. So we are following the mother baby trial design where we have one on station mother variety trial per crop species. There will be a randomized complete block design, four blocks, four replicates with nine to 10 varieties, which includes a control variety. Our mother trial for buckwheat will be in the Western region. So in Vancouver, Washington, and for proso millet, the mother variety trial will be in Pullman, Washington. And so that mother variety trial is depicted as that beautiful quilt of nine to 10 different varieties that are replicated. Now our baby trials look different as you can see in this image. The on-farm baby variety trials, we aim to have a minimum of 10 per region. So for buckwheat, the Western Washington, Western Oregon, proso millet, Eastern Washington, Northern Idaho, Eastern Oregon. These are strip plots, so they are large scale research plots that will be just a subset of the varieties that are uh, being tested. So each farm will have only one to three varieties. And these large scale plots allow us to have ease of planting, management, and harvesting because these are producer collaborator led trials. They will include the, the control variety or the check variety that's also included in the mother, baby, um, the mother variety trial. So our aim here is that we can compare the results from one on-farm trial to the mother trial, but also between farms. Now, we don't have all 10 that we need for each crop yet. So if you are a producer and you're interested in trialing proso millet or buckwheat and you fall within these regions, let us know. So over the course of the years, we will definitely have a lot of materials and events because there's a lot of data and we want to get that information out to you. We will have a web page, a poster, a brochure, videos, fact sheets, journal articles, and our events will be ranging from research station field days to field to flavor field to flavor showcase events. We'll have experts, expert sensory panelists involved. Taste testing will occur at the Cascadia Grains Conference, Crave Northwest in Spokane, and at the Washington School Nutrition Association State Conference. We'll also have industry workshops. And then what's really cool at the final, uh, at the end of this project, we will be able to bring crops to market at scale. So proof of concept. I'm really excited about this project, as you can tell, and I'll hand it off to our other panelists. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here in the Grants Week together with the team to present you on the Proso Millet and Barwit variety projects. So now I'm going to briefly explain you on one of our project objective about the characterizing the variety and food product development. Here is the overview of this part of the projects. So once we have the millet and buckwheat variety from the breeding trials, we're going to analyze for their nutritional composition and techno-functional characteristics. And then we use this data to categorize the millet and buckwheat variety into groups for different end use in the food product in the food applications. And also we're going to select some variety to develop three food product formulations, focaccia mix, pancake mix, and children breakfast bar. Then after we finalize the benchtop food product formulations, we're going to have a preliminary study for consumer acceptability by our expert sensory panel that consists of our stakeholder and collaborator and the research teams. Then at the end, all the results from this part of the project will showcase in two workshops. One is the food ingredient technology, 
And the second one is the value added and food product development. The approach to group and characterizing the variety. So first we are going to analyze all the nutrition, nutritional composition listed here and also the techno-functional characteristics such as the hydration pro property, pesting property and thermal properties. So in general, all of these property help us to know how the flower behave in different food matrix and how it affect the food texture in terms of different amount of water, different heating process or different temperatures. Then we're going to have those data and make a plot like you see as an example here uh, to, to group them and to map them to see if they have, the variety has the similarity and which characteristic explain those variety better. So then we can give a good recommendation for the food application based on their group. So after we get the, uh, the characterization of the variety, we will select them for our food product development. So for focaccia mix, uh, we're going to have it as the gluten-free focaccia mix and our base formulation will be rice flour and millet flour blends at different percentage. We're going to compare it with the commercial wheat based focaccia and the gluten-free one. For the pancake mix, uh, our base formulation will be wheat plus either bulk wheat or millet at different percentage and our control will be the wheat pancakes mix. For children breakfast bar, because we, we need to have other ingredients uh, to make a good breakfast bar and bind them together. So we, we, our goal here is to optimize the formulation to have the millet and buckwheat as the leading ingredients. Once we have finalized our benchtop formulations, our stakeholder and collaborator may use the promising formulation to develop further into the commercial yeah, products. You're, you're and also the result from here will showcase in the two workshop I mentioned about that are usually attended by the food industry professionals. So hopefully it's a good platform to promote the millet and buckwheat as the food ingredients for the food applications. So that should be it for this part. And I will be here for any question at the end of the whole presentations. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be presenting as part of Grains Week. My name is Stephen Bramwell. I work with Washington State University out of the Thurston County Extension Office. I'm working on the education plan for this project. And I'm working with the whole research team and specifically Justin O'Day. And he'll introduce himself shortly. I just wanted to say a quick word about this education plan. It's a really important part of this project. I work for Extension in a rapidly developing part of the state in Western Washington. And what I hear a lot of from growers is the importance of market access and in, in supporting high value agricultural production and expanding market development. So the purpose of the education plan we're working on here is to show how through research and in, in market development, we can take typically low value crops like millet and buckwheat and add value through partnerships with specialty food manufacturers. So the intention of this, of course, is that the prices for raw ingredients are boosted through this kind of value chain food manufacturing. And my name is Justin O'Day. I'm one of Stephen's extension colleagues at WSU, and I'm based out of Vancouver in the southwest region of the state, just north of Portland, Oregon. And in this project, I'll be hosting the main trials of the buckwheat varieties at our experiment site in Vancouver. The farming context that I work in is really similar to what Stephen mentioned. So a major part of what my role is gonna be is to help extend the project to the greater Portland metro area and to more directly help connect growers with markets here and southward. All right, so one of the outreach tools that we'll use is a project website. Uh, we'll update it quarterly and use it to post millet and buckwheat data in several areas. Uh, over the course of more than 15 meetings with stakeholders, when we designed this proposal, what we heard overwhelmingly is that they wanted information on millet and buckwheat variety recommendations, nutritional data, uh, food functionality traits, like how well a grain works in a baked good, 
malt quality data, and also opportunities to network, to sell, or purchase these local grains. Uh, one way we'll use the website is that in year one, the research team will collect baseline data in these areas of agronomics, flavor, and functionality with a focus on the performance of commonly available varieties. A focus on commonly available. Then as the project proceeds through variety trials and lab testing, data on the performance of new and less known varieties will be posted in those same areas as, as improvements on this baseline data occur. So in-person hands-on outreach events are going to be a major component of this project. These include four field to flavor events where grower field days will be coupled with product tastings that help facilitate opportunities to deliver technical information to both farmers and end users. Also provide opportunities for grower buyer networking and also to give farmers and end users a chance to develop perspective and insight on what it takes to both grow these grains and what it's going to take to successfully get these grains to market. We're going to be hosting these events at three different location, locations in western Washington and one in eastern Washington in collaboration with the Culinary Breeding Network, WSDA and their Farm to School Initiative, and the Organic Seed Alliance. Project team is also going to host two events connecting the food industry to our project results, including a value added food product development workshop and a food ingredient technology workshop. And lastly, we plan to participate in food service tastemaker industry tabling events where the public is going to be given an opportunity to better understand what the culinary uses and unique flavors are of buckwheat and millet. We're really excited about the informational materials we've committed to for this project. I'll just highlight a few of those here. We'll work with our partners at the Culinary Breeding Network on a professionally designed poster. We're really looking forward to that. Also, we'll put together what we hope will be a really engaging extension publication fact sheet series focused on millet and buckwheat. And then a third example, we're going to put together a, a video series. I've got an example up here on the screen. It's titled Cooking with the Seasons. This was actually developed by our partners at the SNAP Ed program in Thurston County. And here we see a local chef demonstrating how to cook simple, healthy, delicious uh, meals with raw ingredients that are in season. So this information on our outreach materials will focus on nutritional and agronomic data and also on market and supply chain development because the overall goal of the project is to get information on improved millet and buckwheat varieties into the hands of chefs, school food services, specialty food manufacturers, and of course, just general food citizens. So if folks are all familiar with these grains and they're motivated to purchase and cook with them. Lastly, this is the big goal. We wanna develop two scaled proof of concept supply chains. Uh, so we're gonna forge two of these in this part of the education plan. Uh, one novel supply chain of getting product from producers to stakeholders, often consisting of processors or food manufacturers, then on to school districts. And then another one running from producers to our stakeholders to the end consumers. Um, just as an example up on the screen here of a scaled product supply chain would be to develop a quick bread like a buckwheat or millet um, based muffin mix. And that can be picked up by school food services around the state if it met um, nutritional requirements. We think that should that could be a really great uh, opportunity for a value-added food manufacturer. Um, so with this education plan, we'll, we'll, we'll network together producers, food manufacturers, uh, school districts, and other partners. We'll do these at outreach events, but we want to show how we can uh, grow these grains in our region, have them manufactured into products that are in demand and meet nutrition requirements, and actually build a market, and in this way, diversify northwestern fields and pallets. So we're really excited working with you in the future, and stay tuned. Hi, my name is Jason Bishop, and I'm excited to share with you today. If everything's going well, I am on a tractor right now, and that's why I can't be with you live in person. So I apologize. But uh, I wanted to share with you a little bit today about why I'm interested in millet and some of my experiences growing it in the past, and um, a little bit about my farm. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and move through the presentation here. 
So uh, we are located in Edwell, Washington. We, our farm has been in the family for five generations and we grow wheat mostly, uh, a few other small grains, uh, barley, uh, we've grown oats in the past and canola. This is my grandfather with his combine way back in the day. It's always fun to look at the past. This is from me 20 years ago. <laughs> um, this is a chart that really grabbed my attention. This is showing grain produced relative to water consumption. If you notice, wheat is at a one-to-one -one ratio. But look at prosal millet. It's at a two-to-one ratio. And that is a comparison to wheat. And that really stood out to me enough so that I kept this chart. And really kind of got me interested in millet. And so about three years ago, my neighbor and I, we collaborated together on a project of doing some warm season cover crops and grazing some of my cattle on them. And this is uh, sorghum, sunflower, and millet. And it did really well. So much so we thought we'd keep doing trials. This is a garden trial that I did last year in my backyard. And um, again, it grew well, except unfortunately I planted it late and it froze out in late September. This is a trial my neighbor and I did next to the side of his road is a fire strip. Again, it looks like it's doing really good in most locations. Um, it went to seed. We planted this early enough, so it actually uh, went to seed and it didn't freeze out. Plants look very healthy, but it didn't look that way in all cases. This was a, uh, another spot by the road where it appeared to drought out. And you can, we pulled a few of the plants. You can definitely see there's something going on with the plant and its root structure. Another plant we did with millet last year was using a no-till drill in some cooler soils, cooler soils earlier in the year and didn't get very good emergence and really uh, struggled against competing against the weeds. So there's a lot to be learned, I think, in how to grow millet well in our region. I'm interested in millet because uh, it's really, I see it as a great tool for diversification. We can shake up our herbicides, both timing and different, different formulas. And then also we have opportunity to have different planting and harvesting dates to, to uh, manage uh, the farm and spread out some of our workload. The plant itself has different root structure, which I think could be um, a nice variety for our soil. And it'd be really neat just to see a C4 plant growing in our region. We would have minimal equipment adjustment we'd have to do. We already have the drills, the harvesters uh, to, to, to make this happen. And uh, again, I think there's opportunity to see how this plant could manage water, the little water that we get a little better. And I'm excited about the opportunity to have a local market because there's a facility in North Spokane that uh, acquires millet, usually from out of state, and they're looking for local sources. So um, my desired outcome for this, this grant and this project is to answer some questions. Is our growing season really long enough to handle uh, a plant like millet? Are our temperature swings in the summer, are they too extreme? Are we gonna have enough moisture to get the plant from our, our wet season in the spring to through our typically really dry summer and into a harvest? Will it, will it be, will, when it comes harvest time, is it actually gonna be dry enough? Because sometimes we get those early fall rains um, to do direct cut the millet. And are there opportunities to see some food grade varieties that might work in our area? And at the end of the day, does millet really pencil out when it compares to some of the other crops we have an opportunity to grow? And kind of a quirky thing I'm looking at is, uh, is there an opportunity to use millet as a uh, companion or relay cropping with winter canola? I think there could be some some fun experiments to do there to keep a living root in the soil longer. 
throughout the year. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this project and I think there's a lot of potential and I'm happy to be a part of it. Excited to see what this team could do. And um, just wanna thank you for your time and uh, thanks again. Hi, I'm Joni Kamal Moore. I'm the founder and CEO of Sacrivist Foods based in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And we are proud partners uh, with WSU for the We Serve grant of diversifying Northwest foods and palates. This is an exciting project. I am so stoked to be a part of it. My company, Snacktivist, makes a line of grain-based foods for home and food service application that are made from a variety of ancient grains. Um, some of us, are, some of you may already be familiar with our products as you can buy them at uh, regional grocery stores. And we are also launching a line of finished products for mostly food service right now. But we believe that by creating consumer goods that feature diversified, nutritionally focused grains and pulses, that we can positively impact our bodies through he and human health, our planet, and our agricultural landscapes. So we're on a mission to introduce these foods made from ancient grains to people so that they can learn about how delicious they are, how nutritious they are, and how they can impact our farmers and our planet. It's Earth Day after all. <laughs> and millets and snacktivists are, are somewhat, you know, interrelated because our entire product line involves millet. Um, in fact, we do have a couple of legume-based products that don't contain millet, but they are, they're the minority. Pretty much all of our products are somewhat millet-based. And for us, it's a key ingredient because we use it as a blending agent with other ancient grains. It has a very mellow texture, um, actually a very mellow flavor, excuse me, and a, and a texture that lends itself well to crumb development and stability in a finished gluten-free product. We also blend it with a variety of wheat flours and have uh, you know, pretty amazing results with the um, development that we're having there as well. We have gone to Asia and actually are in dialogue with buyers that would like to import Pacific Northwest grown millet into markets like Korea and Japan because um, they have been relying on millet out of China and there's a lot of questionable supply chain practices going on there. So that is also something that makes us really excited about um, developing this project here in the Northwest. Um, our barriers have historically been for us value added processing. Uh, it's really tough for us to take regionally grown millet right now and have it cleaned and milled. And especially since our product line that goes into retail and food service is all certified gluten-free, also kosher parve, that prevents a barrier as well because we can't run it through a small mill that's been used for wheat or barley or, or any other gluten-containing crop. So that has been a problem for us. There has also been variability in millet quality. We notice a color and flavor variation, and we have no way to monitor or vet uh, this at all because it, our, with our sourcing, even though we have had some great established sourcing out of growers from, say, eastern Colorado, we've not been able to make any correlations on what makes for the best millet and what makes for the best flavor and texture. So out of the study, I think we'll be able to learn more about that. Um, we've also found that there's just not a connected supply chain platform out there that can help us connect the dots in the inland Northwest to make this happen. Although um, Cascadia Grains Council does have a listserv and that is amazing. So um, it's definitely a step in the right direction. As far as like our excitement and potential about millet, I mean, we do sell our product coast to coast in all 50 states, Puerto Rico and beyond. Um, we are exporting and setting up an export program to Asian markets. And um, we're excited about what this means for our farmers. We would love to learn more about the varieties of millets that do grow here and can tolerate our cooler nights. We're excited to learn how that affects the quality of the millet the quality of the flavor and the quality of the carbohydrates. And a very interesting thing I'm, I'm uniquely curious in is the phenolic compounds and phytonutrient, phytochemicals that are present in millet and how they may be different in millets that have had a little bit more cold stress in the evenings and being grown in our soils. Um, we would we love making millet approachable. So we we use it to make things like pancakes, cookies, pizza crust, things that every kid in America finds to be normal. So if we could 
um, you know, develop a millet that has a really great flavor profile for those products, we would be super stoked. Um, I'd rather buy it regionally. So, um, you know, potentially for us as well, we think millet being drought resistant and having re diminished need for a lot of chemical inputs like some other crops really represents a great crop for our Northwest farmers to rotate with their other key dryland crops. So I'm, um, I come from a background, I was a, a botanist and did soil research uh, at University of Montana. And before I went into nursing, I was a, I was a bench scientist in botany and chemistry and science. and. Uh, then became an RN and now I'm a food founder. So this project is like wonderful um, kind of outcome of all of the interests that I have in life. And I am really excited to be a part of it. So thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists. A huge round of applause virtually for them. I encourage you as the audience to reach out to us and, and join us in this research project. So think about how you would like to be involved and, and let us know. You can find us uh, online easily. You can also give us calls if you have our numbers, but here are our email addresses. I really do encourage you to reach out to learn more about this project. And now it's time for questions. Abba, do you want me to go through any questions that might be on uh, YouTube? Yeah, that would be great. Right now, um, we we don't see any quite yet, but I can uh, post the link as well to the YouTube so you can follow along. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited for all these events. Uh, do you guys know when they're when when we're all going to be able to get together? Well, the project um, officially starts this July. And so that will just be that baseline data collection. And so a slow rollout of data and then the, the events will really kick off the following season. So Justin and Steven had mentioned those really fun flavor, field to flavor showcase events. And that's where we're really hoping to get the word out and get people involved. And that will be in the field. So during the growing season. Justin, do you wanna talk a little bit more about those? I know you talk quite a bit during your presentation, but we don't have any questions yet from the audience. You'll have to unmute. There we go. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I have anything specific to to add from from the what I mentioned earlier. Um, other than that, we're just really hoping that the hands-on component of it will help. Um, each side understand what what their role is and what it's really going to take to to connect both markets and agronomics and, and growing and connect growers to markets. Awesome. Yeah, I'm really excited about those events. I hope I can join. <laughs> um, it looks like we did get some questions in. So one is, are you only using proso or other millets? We are indeed only focusing in on proso millet for this project. Um, another question is, maybe I'll have Justin answer this first part. Uh, what are the specific benefits to the soil of buckwheat and millet? And that's from Jennifer. Um, I, a couple things I guess I could comment on. Um, Couple people mentioned the water conservation aspect um, of millet in particular, and that's that's a major benefit. I mean, uh, in a way, you know, the amount of water that's in the soil, especially on the east side, um, really, really will have an effect on the or have a cascading effect on the cropping systems out there, um, and. As far as buckwheat goes, buckwheat is generally well known for its ability to um, sort of condition the soil. And it's also a uh, good phosphorus scavenger, or it's known, it's known for that aspect. Um, it's also a good weed suppressant. So there's that aspect of soil health that, that it will, uh, will potentially will get a benefit from too. Yeah, that's great. And both 
both crops produce a fair amount of biomass too. So when we're talking about the carbon returns, that, that could also be substantial. Yes, certainly. I did see, see some research that came out somewhat recently about um, proso millet being highly mycorrhizal and that having a benefit to a system, especially because more modern wheat varieties and some of the more modern varieties of crops grown in our region have actually uh, diminished their mycorrhizal colonization rates a bit. And so introducing another crop to the rotation that can bring up our mycorrhizal um, population of the soil, I guess you could say. Uh, would be would be beneficial. Yeah, great point. Uh, let's see, no other questions yet. Evan, do you want to talk about uh, the malting part of the project? We didn't have a chance to really dig into that, and I think there's some there's probably some people watching right now that would be really excited about that. Sure, thanks. Yeah, so WSU is in the process of developing both pilot and small scale malting capacity and the complementary lab equipment needed to evaluate malt quality, which is an array of different traits. So things like measuring protein content, which has a relationship with the amount of starch, which is then measured at, in a practical way from the brewer's perspective as uh, the amount of extract that's available. And so we'll be partnering with uh, the barley breeding program to take advantage of having access to those resources uh, within uh, some of the same buildings that we work in. And we, we have a couple stakeholders involved to help guide that work. Uh, one is Aaron McLeod at the Hartwick Center for Craft Food and Beverage, who's going to help us determine what malt quality might look like for millet or buckwheat. And these are a lot different crops than barley, which is kind of the framework that all the malt quality um, evaluations have been established in. So there might be a paradigm shift in how we think about malt quality for millet and buckwheat. Another stakeholder who has been really supportive of the project uh, is Ghost Fish Brewing in Seattle. And they have smaller scale brewing capacity as well. So there's likely going to be a situation where we identify varieties that maybe have lower protein that would make them better suited for malting as an end use versus the food side. And some specific things that Ghostfish has said that they would look for in a variety for malting would be a larger seed size. So we can evaluate that. And uh, the germination capacity, which could also be linked to some field components like emergence in the field. And so what we'll likely do is identify through these functionality tests that Moni talked about, some varieties that are good candidates for malting and then malt them uh, at WSU and then brew some beers with them and do some of the sensory work. So that's likely what the malting process will look like and how we'll apply some of uh, what we've learned uh, in malting barley through Kevin's program. Uh, Kevin Murphy formerly was the barley breeder. So applying that experience and knowledge to these new crops, uh, which are really in need of characterization and, and research into how they can perform um, with some of those beers. So that, that, that's another exciting potential end use for the varieties that come out of this project. That add a lot of fun to our taste testing events. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've got another question in um, from Rachel. She said, so fun. There were some questions about processing, dehulling, et cetera, in the buckwheat sessions. Could you elaborate on how processors might fit into or benefit from this project? Does anyone want to talk here? Um, I know that Joni from Snacktivist actually has a lot to say about some gaps in our supply chain out here in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, hi, this is Kelly with Snackfish, and I am actually traveling from Tri Cities up to Fort Wayne right now. In case it cuts out, yeah, hopefully it doesn't. But yeah, uh, the, the, the barriers to value added processing in our area 
have long been discussed, but there hasn't been a ton of action, uh, at least I'm aware of, of, of people out there, you know, defoliating feed and small scale milling. So if anybody out there listening is involved with that, um, please reach out to me because I would love to talk to you more about this um, for a variety of, of reasons. And it's, it's been a huge barrier because for instance, Jason, uh, who spoke right before me on Living Heritage Farms, he and I have been wanting to kick off the small beach um, trial on Amazon and all that and several Slack like, channels. But our biggest barrier is that we need to have it cleaned and we need to have it milled and we don't want it to be truckloads. We'd like to do small pilots. And um, that, of course, is a simpler play because it's not a gluten-free product. It would be a, a cold out product um, with our wheat growers. But, um, you know, what it really gets tricky is when we're looking at these that are gluten-free and we need to have that sort of right gluten-free uh, processing in place in order to get it to the next step at our processor and our co-packers, which everything has to test out and for certification of being truly gluten-free. So, um, I wish we had more players, and if anyone out there is thinking about it, I would love to connect. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, Jenny, for your perspective. You know, that that when we talk to stakeholders, both in Buckwheat and in ProSo Mill in our region, you know, we realize there the dehulling doesn't doesn't exist yet. And so for our project, we factored into our our budget purchasing a dehuller that will work for ProSo Millet. So that smaller scale experimental trial size, um, we can hopefully accommodate. And then there is a buckwheat dehuller in northern Idaho that's also a stakeholder involved in this project that we intend to move our experimental lines through as well in order to get um, larger bulk samples processed. Um, but it's something, you know, this, this whole project is really about pushing these two crops through the supply chain over the course of these three years and, and collecting data and figuring out what are our gaps in evidence, you know, where do we need to focus in in the future, and then be able to really get things out there and figure out what needs to be perfected, give it, give data for the growers, give data for the food manufacturers, have the data there for people who might want to start a mill, you know, in our region. Um, so that's what we're hoping that this really, really ignites um, some interest in these crops and, and, and the capacity that yeah. we have here. Yeah, it's, it's just, I love that you mentioned, you know, just like this inertia behind starting mills. Because just even this morning with one of our co manufacturers in Richland, we went out to his property that he owns, and I'm building a large facility to increase our co manufacturing while well, they have multiple projects. But there is additional space there, and he has given some thought into uh, milling and molding in one time as well. But he would need to have it be a collaborative process with some of the he knows the milling process because that's not his expertise. But that, it, it's interesting how many people are interested in this. I know other farmers and stakeholders that even have investors that are ready to jump in and get involved. It's just a matter of getting everybody in the same place and talking about how to solve these problems and, and doing it right. So I'm glad we're talking about this. It's great. I know, I'm really excited for the next three years. It looks like we may have answered Dan Packer's question. He had asked about um, whether we have collaborators for cleaning, storage, and processing. And so either we'll be providing that service um, through WSU or, or working with collaborate, um, some stakeholder collaborators. And then uh, David asks, well, first he states, I found the lack of consumer knowledge of millet, as well as of sorghum, teff, et cetera, the biggest hurdle to overcome suggestions for creating demand for these alternative grains, question mark. Does anyone wanna tackle that? Evan, Justin, Moni, Joni? You do know I'm very passionate about that topic, but I don't wanna dominate. So anybody else wanna chime in there, I'd, I'd be happy to chat about it. Well, I can, I can yeah. for Oh, go, here, yeah, I'll just go ahead, go ahead, Julian. <laughs> There's, um, we knew that, I, I, I mean, Evan's got quite a bit of experience too with um, understanding consumer preferences, but we realized that we want to have success and impact at the end of this project, not just data. And so 
we're really focused on these outreach events that Justin and Steven talked about and having there be taste testing and making it fun and having there be a poster and just getting people involved in it. And then this big push to do this proof of concept where we have a grower that grows out, you know, field scale, large amount of one of, or um, one of the varieties of each of these crops and push it towards, you know, into a stakeholders formulation and then get that into either an online marketplace, a marketplace or a school is really where we're trying to like get people familiar with these crops. And then also the fact that we're focusing so much on formulation and easy recognizable recipes is how we're really trying to move these crops through into onto plates and, and make and familiarize people's palates with them. Does anyone else want to join in, chime in? I will chime in on just one level on, on that. Um, you hit all the major points there for sure, but I think so many people are pleasantly surprised when they try a millet containing product or even just plain millet that's been prepared or complete that they realize that it's really nice to eat. It's actually a delicious food. And for us, because we do use so much millet and we're looking at strategic marketing going into this next year, we're really interested specifically in the functional food um, movement that's coming out. It's like a, one of the more nascent trends that we're seeing in consumer psychology. And brains have been demonized largely over the last five years, you know, with keto, paleo, brain free, all of this stuff. But I think what's going to really swing the pendulum towards brains again is as we identify brains that have above and beyond nutrition, um, it's not just about, you know, carbs and fiber anymore. It's a, and it's not just about protein either. It's about a dynamic profile of nutrition and I think that's going to be really interesting to the next generation of consumers that are looking for climate stability and food functionality and nutrition and of course it has to taste good and that hits all four points so for us that's where we're focusing is like how do we change the dialogue you know we're looking at releasing some really innovative packaging that's going to talk about not only nutritional facts but plant facts people facts People's facts and planet facts, and that will change the narrative. So I think that'll be a, a like next gen topic. Awesome. Thank you, Joni. That was really helpful. Good perspective. Um, don't have any other questions rolling in yet. Are there any aspects of the project that any of you all want to talk more about or elaborate on that maybe you couldn't in our in our first videos? Awesome. Uh, well, go ahead, Evan. <laughs> I was just going to say, maybe Moni wants to talk a little bit more about the product formulation process, because that, to me, seems like a great way to figure out what works and what doesn't work. So, I mean, somebody in the chat said, you know, just make something delicious. Like, what does that really mean from your perspective, Moni? Yeah, I can say a bit more on that. So what I'm saying in there, it's just like we're trying first to develop the base formulation and like some uh, audience also mentioned about consumer acceptability. So there's another part that first we need to move on with the base formulation, especially to get a good texture, what, which variety that make better. So then we, you know, we can uh, tell the consumer or the, the food company to use those kind of variety to develop further. And then in the play with the flavor and tasty, uh, there might be some other uh, flavor that you need to put in or play around with other formulation to, to access to the consumer acceptability. And when Julian talked about when we wanna go to the school or to different even outreach events, so it's a good platform to get many feedbacks on how those uh, millet and bark with a variety of flower that can have to, to improve uh, the perspective of the consumer on those uh, product formulation as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's great perspective. Um, I also don't know if we really went in depth on the expert sensory panel. Like we realize as researchers, we're not gonna get everything right. And so that's why stakeholders have been involved in the development of the project and they'll be a part of the project the whole way through. 
um, even with our product formulations, you know, we'll be sending off, you know, bags of, you know, the flour and with the recipes that Moni has perfected with her, her team and then getting feedback, you know, from these stakeholders that are on the advisory panel. And, and then also, you know, working with these um, companies, you know, doing a bit of a market assessment, like, is this some, is this a formulation you would, you know, develop, you would um, take on in your company? Would you adopt that formulation? Is this a variety that you would start sourcing from this region? Just trying to understand, like, what is the potential impact of what, of what we're creating here? Let's see if we have other questions coming through. Um, Let's see, from Lantern Brewing, we've got even unmalted millet buckwheat can be used for brewing. What resources are there for adventurous locally focused breweries to discover and trial different small grains? So I think this will be directed to Evan. <laughs> well, I also saw in the chat that they're located in Seattle. So uh, get in touch with us and uh, we'll come drop some stuff off sometime. I think that's... That's a great place to leave it is let, let's talk some more. Um, I, I guess more broadly, um, you know, a great way would be connect with a farmer that can maybe trial something for you. I think the perspective by Jason is shared by a lot of farmers where they're doing little trials in their garden or with their neighbors trying to figure things out. And, and if it can be taken to the next step where uh, it could be evaluated in a food or in a, in a beer, I think that really strengthens those relationships. And that's really what this whole project is focused on. And really glad that Joni was able to join extension food science. You know, we're trying to come at this from a whole system uh, based research and extension perspective to try to figure some of these things out and develop and or strengthen those relationships. Yeah, like in the slide where I said, you know, would you like to join, join us? I'm being sincere there. We want as many people involved in this project. And this kind of leads into the next question from Dinah. Uh, how important is it to stay regional and how do you define regional food shed? And for us, um, a lot of it has to do with our granting, our, our grant uh, agency where we're focused in a Western region. And so that allows us to work within um, Idaho, Washington, Oregon is what we defined in our project proposal. But at the same time, we do have stake stakeholders outside that region um, because we do see, I mean, you know, farmers aren't just selling within, you know, our regional supply chain. They do have to access outside markets as well. And so the more stakeholders we involve, even outside of our region, um, is important. Um, and we certainly do have them involved and um, look forward to hearing from other people also outside of our three states that we have mentioned where we're doing research in. Um, but it looks like we are kind of running out of time. I'm not seeing any other questions on YouTube directed towards us. Any final comments or should we uh, release ABBA to get started on the next session? <laughs> Thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you all for listening and please, please reach out. Thanks everyone for giving videos and participating in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Been fun, thanks.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am excited to introduce the next session that we have. Um, we have two individuals that have joined us. Um, hello, Sarah. Hello, Richard. Hi. Um, very excited for this uh, session that is entitled Heirloom Grains in a Modern World, Travel Stories from a Wandering Baker. And we have the very lovely, talented, and gracious um, James Beard Award winning author, Sarah Owens, who is going to, um, she's joining us today and she's pre-recorded um, a video of herself talking about her um, global work as a culinary educator of sourdough that has uh, allowed her to have deeper conversations around the histories of colonization and the reintroduction of endemic and indigenous cereal foods and heirloom cooking techniques. Um, it's a really fantastic um, recording that you did for us. Thank you so much. Um, and you've had the opportunity to travel to so many places and it was really fantastic to have you share some of those stories with us here today. Um, and you've invited your friend Richard, which I'm so happy to have, Richard Hansen, who um, along with his wife started the nonprofit called Tijendo uh, Alianzas to partner with groups in rural communities to develop sustainable micro businesses. Um, one of which is um, a community in the Central Valley of Oaxaca that have organized something very exciting, um, a project called Sochil um, that sells flour that's made from mesquite tree, as well as banana flour, amaranth flour, some pretty exotic ingredients for some of us here. Um, I have not heard of most of these, so I'm really excited about that. Um, and this is these projects sound really interesting and we'll, we'll come back together and talk a little bit more about that as they really have, it sounds like they've done a lot to really um, empower the, the local communities in, and this one in particular is in Mexico um, that have created sources of income and more diversification and a lot of economic uh, opportunities for individuals in that area. So i um, really excited to have Richard here with us as well. Um, so I just wanted to welcome both of you. We're gonna watch a video that Sarah has pre-recorded um, people are watching on YouTube right now. You guys chat, they're watching on YouTube, chat your questions, um, and we'll come back here after the video and I'll ask all those questions that come up and we'll, we'll just discover uh, lots of things together. Hello, my name is Sarah Owens. I am a baker and a cookbook author of three books, um, James Beard award-winning Sourdough published in 2015, Toast and Jam in 2017, and Heirloom published in 2019. The success of these three books has uh, built for me a platform to not only publish recipes uh, about ferment techni fermentation techniques that are inspired by traditional cultures, but to work and travel as an educator uh, in locations all over the world. And each invitation has uh, mostly been centered around the curiosity to learn bread baking with natural leavening, um, which is you know, a technique as old as bread itself. And although most people would associate sourdough with um, European style hearth breads, I, I've really strived within each workshop opportunity um, to incorporate more local ingredients, uh, which would include regional whole grains, um, flowers, vegetables, and fruits, so that the breads that we create together in the workshops really become an expression of place um, and, and are unique to the people who create and of course eat them. Uh, so with this approach, I not only act as a facilitator of knowledge, but I become a student as well. 
And so with, it, with this unique privilege, I strive to uh, learn about the climate, the food systems, the uh, religious ceremonies, the traditional foods, and also the histories of uh, occupation or colonization um, of wherever I happen to be presenting. And although I, I never intended for sourdough to be a gateway uh, to cultural understanding, it is worth pointing out that uh, wheat bread has often displaced other more traditional foods. Um, so in creating this very intentional exchange through the opportunity of, of teaching, it's allowed um, some important conversations to surface around um, ancient customs that may still be in practice and sometimes uh, heirloom ingredients that are still being cultivated, harvested, and used. Um, or, as is more often the case, um, conversations around uh, local grain varieties that have been replaced by higher yielding uh, grains that can be leavened quicker uh, and processed on a larger and more industrial scale. So as someone who has um, spent a lifetime traveling all over the world, but in the last five years worked as a culinary instructor abroad, um, I've seen the same pattern emerge in many different parts of the world of um, indigenous or endemic ingredients and foods being replaced by more industrialized versions. And then um, also uh, sometimes a return to an interest in bringing back and reinstating or, um, or supporting the growth of um, those same endemic or indigenous uh, ingredients. And um, so I'm gonna share with you a couple of stories today about that. Um, but, uh, you know, over time, what I've learned and what I've tried to do is is really uh, use the opportunity such as the one today um, in sharing these stories with you uh, to, to try and help conserve the collective memory and uh, sometimes the indigenous knowledge through um, documentation, uh, written or otherwise, um, that preserves and hopefully, hopefully revives um, many of the traditional foods and their cultural heritage. Uh, and what this looks like most often is just sharing stories or creating opportunities to share stories. Um, but as someone who is almost always from outside the culture, um, I don't necessarily try and, and replicate a, a recipe as being authentic. Um, because even if I do research beyond the very limited experience that I've had um, living in or visiting any one place, um, I will likely never have the full picture um, to be able to share, to, to be a, re a representative. Um, so instead of trying to, um, to do that, I, um, I use the opportunity to, to travel and um, to sometimes teach as uh, the chance to create memories. And um, these are memories of hopefully pleasure and uh, satiation, memories that um, are of connection to the food that we consume and the food that we share um, at the table or in that in that workshop um, and what what happens is um, in those moments those shared moments um, of, of positive association uh, it drives interest and and directs um, a collective attention um, toward people in places that are sometimes uh, underrepresented and I think it's really ironic that, um, you know, something like a European style uh, bread 
that on an industrial scale has really colonized diets everywhere. Um, in this way, it's become a gateway into to reestablishing um, trust and um, building a framework for utilizing um, heirloom or indigenous ingredients that um, have a long history of value within a community. And once that trust has been rebuilt um, and an interest has been reestablished, um, there's an enormous opportunity there, um, particularly for uh, younger generations to um, see traditional foods in a really different and a much more positive light. So um, today I'm going to share with you a, a couple of story, travel stories um, where ancient land race varieties of um, maize and wheat are having a slow um, but steady renaissance in both agriculture and in baking. And there are various reasons why um, there has been a, an interest to reemerge um, for these older types. And I'd like to hopefully address um, the notion of reintroducing culturally appropriate selections um, for using in historic recipes, but also um, modern applications that uh, in turn also enhance the potential for food security um, as well as honor um, environmental considerations and resources of our rapidly changing climate <laughs> um, and also honor preferences that have changed over time in response to um, industrialized food ways. This latter point um, is sometimes overlooked by people such as myself who are very enthusiastic about supporting the reemergence of um, heirloom and sometimes indigenous foods. And uh, as I tell these stories today, I hope that you keep in mind the, um, the value systems and how they may or may have not changed over time um, in response to the rapid industrialization of our foodways. So in my very limited experience, uh, I have learned that in many traditional cultures, the industrialization and or the colonization of um, traditional foodways has meant that many historic recipes have also changed over time to reflect the loss of biodiversity that was once cultivated on a small and more localized scale with endemic foods. For example, in Central and South America, uh, endemic grains such as a whole rainbow of maize, uh, quinoa, amaranth, um, that are all highly nutritious uh, and represent a very rich cultural heritage of the indigenous people of the Americas. Um, these foods have either been um, habitually exported as a higher value commodity elsewhere, or um, they've been bullied out by imported U.S. corn and or wheat. When NAFTA, the trade agreement was signed, it created an opportunity, for example, in, for Mexico's manufacturing industry, but it was a huge loss for Mexican farmers. Within the first decade after it went into effect, uh, uh, Tufts University reports that 900,000 uh, Mexican farming jobs were lost and the price of Mexican corn fell by 66% as cheaper corn grown in the U.S. and subsidized by the U.S. government um, replaced many of these in indigenous um, varieties of corn. So I want to share with you a, a 
travel story, a trip that I took in 2019 to Mexico. Um, I had began teaching in Mexico in 2017 upon an invitation by uh, two women, Raquel Guajardo and uh, Galia Kleiman, who are both uh, traditional foods uh, enthusiasts, and they had invite, invited me to come and teach about sourdough baking and um, in Mexico City and also in Monterrey. And in the following year, they organized the first uh, Congreso de Fermentación in Oaxaca, where I also taught a workshop and met a PhD candidate of cultural anthropology who was living at the time in Cholula, uh, which is a very historic town in the state of Puebla. And uh, in the following year, in 2019, he very generously uh, offered to connect me to a chef named Armando Cajero, who has a restaurant called Non Cocina. And Armando has been working very hard uh, to support farmers who cultivate indigenous ingredients and to help bring these foods back in, uh, into a more positive and mainstream light. Uh, within Mexican culture. The same week that I did the workshop at Armando's restaurant, um, I was able to tag along with uh, the PhD candidate whose name is Kyle and his visiting professor um, to, to meet with and interview and, and listen to the stories of several farmers uh, within Puebla and also one collective who was working with these farmers to create greater economic opportunities for them. Um, so this was in Azolco, which is uh, a community located on the slopes and at the base of a rather active volcano uh, called Popocatapetl, which is affectionately um, called by the locals Popo. Uh, which is, I appreciate because it's much easier <laughs> for me <laughs> to pronounce. Um, but on the day that we arrived, Popo was very active and it was a beautiful, clear blue sky and um, there were just clouds of billowing <laughs> um, from the, the top of Popo. And I remember very um, studiously paying attention to the evacuation route. <laughs> Nobody else seemed to be uh, concerned, but um, anyway, what I found most inter interesting um, were the stories that these farmers had to tell um, of uh, the seeds that they have been cultivating for hundreds of years at least, um, despite the effects of the NAFTA trade agreement. Um, and you know these effects not only affected um, had to do with the seeds that they were growing, but it also um, meant you know the industrialization of the tortilla. Uh, but these farmers have continued cultivating these seeds um, as many left to find jobs elsewhere in the United States. Some of them returned and also returned to, to farming in this traditional milpa system. Um, and so we were able to see some of these, um, these beautiful varieties of corn, and I'll try to share with you some photographs. Um, and, uh, you know, they're continu continuing to nurture these seeds in the milpa system. So to grow the, the three sisters, the squash, the beans, the corn, and sometimes also um, sesame seeds, which help with maintaining the soil health of their land without the chemical inputs that are necessary to grow many of the um, more modern varieties of corn. Um, and, you know, what's interesting is that these families that are continuing to grow uh, these heirloom varieties of, of corn, bean, and squash, um, they're continuing to also feed themselves and make traditional foods like tortillas using this heirloom variety of corn, varieties of corn, but the local townspeople um, really no longer have interest in purchasing uh, or uh, using this type of heirloom corn um, because they can much uh, more cheaply and easily make tortillas using 
um, maseka, which is a, a prepared sort of masa um, that can be used to make tortillas. And so the, the local preference for, um, for corn used to make tortillas has completely changed um, because of the landscape of um, U.S. corn being imported in such a dramatic way. Uh, so what we see as the beauty of these different colors of heirloom mice uh, can sometimes be seen by people within that region as, um, as, as an indication of unrefinement um, or, or coarse um, foods. And so, uh, you know, of course, that would, it would be wonderful if more people within the area would um, want to make tortillas using those heirloom varieties of corn. Um, but what the Colectivos have done instead um, is to try and take a new approach to using these heirloom ingredients uh, grown in the milpas. And so with grant funding, grant funding, uh, one collective has purchased equipment for making uh, tortilla chips which uh, I think a lot of people don't realize um, tost tostadas are a, a very traditional food of Mexico, but tortilla chips were actually um, in invented by a Mexican family in Los An Angeles in 1940s. Um, they had a tortilla making company and they would use the uh, misshapen tortillas to fry and create uh, chips as a snack food. And so um, I think it's, it's so interesting that these colectivos have um, taken this tortilla chip and um, created something um, kind of novel for the local people, excuse me, using um, blue corn, sesame seeds, and ayacote beans, which are um, an endemic type of legume from that area. And I was able to try them. They're absolutely delicious. Uh, I snacked on them. I ate them with my meals. I wish I had bought cases of them <laughs> because they were so, um, so delicious. And uh, these chips are beginning to garner a, a market, uh, a larger market within Mexico. And um, so I think it's interesting that instead of stubbornly trying to adhere to tradition uh, of using these heirloom varieties of corn to make tortillas, um, you know, the Colectivos have kind of uh, rebranded heirloom ingredients um, to, to use them in a fresh, new, novel way. Um, and what happens is, you know, the, the um, tendency to cast judgment upon people whose preferences have ultimately been changed and shaped by industrialization, um, that, that has been taken away. And so there's the, a really amazing opportunity for a new relationship um, to be established um, that is, is very positive around these, these foods. And um, they can still tell the story and the history of the seeds and the, and the people that have been cultivating them for hundreds of years, um, but without the class divide that sometimes happens when um, when heirloom or endemic foods are, are um, reintroduced. Very quickly, uh, another travel story that was uh, somewhat truncated by the pandemic, but I was supposed to return to Oaxaca in 2020 for another workshop um, at the Congreso de Fermentación um, that was to be uh, led between myself and also another colectivo that is uh, located in Oaxaca. Um, that is working to bring back mesquite. Now, uh, mesquite is a large shrub or small tree that produces 
a leguminous seed pod. So it's not a, a grain by its strictest definition, but an incredible food source that um, for thousands of years was uh, enjoyed by and used by the indigenous people of the Americas um, to produce lots of different foods, including flatbreads like tortillas, uh, different types of beverages. But over time, it was displaced by um, more industrialized foods, um, more colonized foods, and um, so now a lot of the information about how to uh, mostly process and then use uh, mesquite flour as a food source has, has been forgotten, um, particularly in, uh, in Oaxaca and central uh, Mexico. And so these colectivos, um, the one in Oaxaca, and there's also another one located in a different region of Mexico, um, they have been working with uh, rural populations of people to um, not only reintroduce the growing and harvesting of, um, of mesquite, but to work on bringing back the indigenous knowledge of how to prepare it in historic recipes, but also in new and different types of foods. Um, because the economic reality of, of trying to do something like this is there there needs to be a scale that is able to support not only the sustainability of the communities that are growing and processing mesquite but um, the purchase of you know equipment that helps them to do so um, and so uh, what I was hoping to do was to be able to work with the collectives to um, to learn about and, and work with other chefs that are bringing back this indigenous knowledge. And then also use um, mesquite flour in um, things that I find really delicious as well, um, such as cookies and different types of breads. Um, mesquite has a, um, a really delicious and very unique flavor. It's uh, very malty. It is incredibly high in protein, but it also um, has a concentrated amount of sugars. And so it, it comes across on the palate as being very sweet. And when used in breads, it has a similar effect on the crust as like a, a malted flour would. So it, it creates a very caramelized, very um, beautiful amber colored crust. And so um, uh, a little goes a long way in baked goods, but, um, but I was hoping that we would be able to address some of that a little bit more. And I've written about it and, um, and hopefully there will be more opportunities, um, if not virtually, because you know, it is very difficult um, to connect to, um, to these rural communities. Um, digitally, but uh, hopefully we will be able to return to more opportunities where we can explore, continue to explore the potential of, um, of some of these foods. It's important to also note that um, the people that are living within the communities where these collectives, uh, mesquite collectives are located, are the ones who are leading the economic development and growth um, as a result of, of uh, harvesting and processing mesquite. So uh, a very important detail to take note of. I also want to share one last uh, story, I will keep it kind of short, um, of visiting Lebanon in 2017 as well. And this was to help develop a bakery located now in Beirut called Mawiya that was founded by a friend of mine, Brant Stewart, who um, was working within his foundation, Settle Sued to create uh, economic opportunities for women uh, within Lebanon, both uh, Lebanese women and, and uh, Syrian refugees. And so um, my intention of, of 
going to Lebanon was to help him establish the social enterprise. And um, one of the first things we had to do when we got there was to identify sources of wheat that we could um, mill into flour. And most of the wheat that is um, available in Lebanon is imported from other countries um, such as uh, the Ukraine and Russia. Um, but we wanted to um, establish relationships with uh, local sources because um, historically uh, the food security of Lebanon has been very shaky due to political instability. And, um, and so it was also important uh, to not only identify those, those resources, but to um, really learn about the vast cultural diversity and landscape of Le Lebanon. There are so many different types of people that um, both live within this small country and have um, taken refuge in Lebanon uh, as well. And so one of the first um, experiences that I had when I got there was um, uh, as an invitation to a region called Marjayoun. And this is an area in the south of Lebanon, which is on the border with Israel. It, um, I had to apply for a, a visa to be able to visit because of the historic instability um, of the region. And um, I was sponsored by a family who uh, was very good friends with another family of um, people within the religious sect um, called Druze. And um, so most people know that within Lebanon, there are um, mainly three different religions represented, um, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Um, but there is also uh, the Druze people, and it's a very, um, very old religious sect that over time, um, because of um, religious persecu persecution and re retribution for their belief system, um, have become somewhat secretive. And although they're very tolerant of um, other cultures and religions, um, their secrecy has allowed them to maintain their identity over time. And so it's not often that um, people are welcomed into um, the communities or even into the homes of, of Drew's people. Um, but uh, because of a friend of a friend, I was invited into the home of a, a woman and her husband who is a shepherd. And so um, the day that the the day before we went, I spent the night with um, my friend's family, and I was of course greeted with a huge meal and was so stuffed. But the following morning, I woke up to a dish that is created um, from a local type of wheat um, that is fermented with a, a salted goat milk yogurt, um, otherwise known as lebne. And this dish is called kishik. It's something that I had read about and dreamed about tasting for years. Um, and finally here it was. And it's, it's a dish that's often, um, it's made and preserved for the winter months. It's very hearty. Um, and it's, it's served often with another preserve of uh, something called awarma, which is, um, the meat of a, a type of sheep that has a very round and fatty behind. <laughs> and in this round and fatty behind is um, lots of delicious um, fat. And so the fat is used um, almost in a similar way as a confit would, would be made to preserve the, the meat. And um, so this is, you know, a really delicious, very hearty meal um, to be enjoyed at, uh, around breakfast time. And we enjoyed it together um, before visiting the Drew's uh, family and um, sat around um, a, a nice little warm oil drip uh, furnace 
uh, while drinking um, Arabic coffee, which is very similar to um, Turkish coffee, um, but, but made in a different way. And then we visited uh, Yusuf, who is the, um, the husband of Tagrid, who uh, showed us how to make um, these flatbreads and um, pocket style pastries that um, are very typical of the region. So we had this wonderful meal and we visited um, Tigreed and her husband Yusuf. Uh, Yusuf is the shepherd of the uh, herd of goats that uh, produced the milk, that made the lebna, that made the kishik. And so we uh, visited in January. There were lots of little baby goats and they were very cute. And um, we were able to, to see the land um, where they graze. And then we returned to, uh, to Greed's kitchen and we uh, learned how to make the dough uh, from the wheat that they also grow on their property. And she described uh, as we sat around drinking mate, which you would not think would be enjoyed in a place like a Lebanon, but um, was brought back um, by Drew's families who had taken refuge in South America. Anyway, we enjoyed mate as we sat around and listened to um, stories told by Tagreed and Yusuf about how they grow their wheat and um, harvest it, uh, they wash it, and then they dry it for six days before um, taking it to a, a mill uh, that is shared. It's sort of like a community mill um, that makes it into flour that she uses to make these flatbreads. And um, the flatbreads were not leavened with sourdough. They were leavened with commercial yeast. Um, but I thought it was really fascinating that in this area, it's very mountainous and it's very protected. And then there's also the, um, the other sort of degree of uh, insularity from the Druze community that these traditions have been maintained over time. Um, and so they described this to us as we were sitting around drinking um, mate and um, watching the dough rise next to the wood fire. And uh, Yusuf also described um, how the lifestyle of being a shepherd um, and of having herds of goats in that region has led to um, the, the sense of peace within the community um, that they live in and how uh, when goats are, uh, often goats can kind of wander and join other herds. <laughs> and uh, when that happens, um, you know, the, the shepherds know because everyone brands their animals with their own um, identification mark. But uh, when that happens, the, the shepherd does not um, kill or eat that animal. Um, uh, he'll simply raise the animal and then once it's time, return it to its original owner. And this kind of um, unspoken agreement um, has led to a lot of cooperation and respect um, that has been honored over time. And so, um, so anyway, we shared lots of stories as the dough was rising and then Chagreed, um took us outside and showed us how to make these flatbreads on something called a sage. So they're not, um, they're not baked in an oven. They're, um, they're cooked over a, a circular, sort of looks like an upside down wok that is positioned over a heat source, usually um, a propane flame. And um, the metal sage is heated and then the flatbreads are rolled out and they are positioned on what looks like a pillow. 
and then that pillow is used to slap the bread onto the hot surface and then it bubbles and puffs um, and cooks and then you flip it and um, it's it's very easy to make lots of flat bread, flatbreads very quickly in this way. You do it typically kneeling um, on, on the ground and as she continued to show us how to do this and then moved on to these other sort of pocket style pastries filled with um, different types of meats and vegetables, uh, greens and um, uh, feta, there was a wonderful aroma that filled the whole neighborhood and um, people from within the, the Druze community started coming by to see what was what was going on, what was happening, and um, they were following their noses. <laughs> and so we had the opportunity also to meet other people within the community. Uh, one very tr traditionally dressed uh, Druze woman pulled up a chair and um, joined along. And even though we didn't share, uh, you know, the common language. Um, there was a, a really warm sense of camaraderie uh, within the whole day that um, was really special. So I hope by um, sharing some of these stories with you today that uh, we're able to recognize that despite the globalization, the homogenization, the industrialization of many traditional foodways, that there still are a, a number of um, individuals who are very dedicated to um, maintaining the identity of seeds, of foods, of, of recipes, but are also interested in expanding that conversation to explore other ways of collaboration and um, uh, of innovation um, in order to support uh, farmers and processors and food producers in a way that has a long-term sustainable value. Thank you, Sarah. That was really beautiful. Oh, good. Thank, thank you for allowing the opportunity to share all those stories with you. It, yeah. was, it was hard to choose which stories to tell, but. <laughs> it was really special. Thank you. And other people are commenting that they really enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to tell you one thing that someone uh, who didn't chat on here, but sent me a text message, a friend who's a plant breeder in, um, uh, in Hawaii said that they grow uh, mesquite there and um, okay. it's called kiave. And there's, um, okay. there's a, there was a, there's a company that has bars. So like energy bars that they make with the flower. Mm. Um, and there was a nice. online that had the flour, butter, honey, and salt to make kind of like these power energy bars. Um, mm, yummy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, awesome. Yes. With that said, I wanted to hear, ask Richard, if you wanted to share with us um, some of the programs that you're working with, some of the unique um, you know, uh, collaborations that you've started in different communities? Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, Sarah, that I really enjoyed <laughs> that. Uh, yeah. Your, your presentation in general was pretty awesome. So thank you for that because it kind of, it definitely kind of creates the entire context that has informed a lot of our work. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, so I'm Richard Hansen. Uh, this is Sarai Garcia. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we created a nonprofit in, in 2017 
2017 called Tejiendo Alianzas, and that means weaving partnerships. And uh, it's fruit of many years of work here in Oaxaca. Uh, I actually am from Texas, I, but I've been here for about 13, now 14 years. And uh, my experience with Mesquite actually started in my childhood in a complete, what seemed like a completely different world. So it's, um, I grew to know Mesquite more through my father because he would uh, cut the wood and make this incredible barbecue with the flavors of mesquite. And so that's, that's how I originally appreciated it. And I, I, like so many other people, just had no idea that this tree is so incredible, uh, so noble and uh, mm -hmm. so important and historical on, on many different levels, culturally and mm -hmm. economically and in terms of nutrition. So it was, it's been a very exciting journey uh, the last 13 years uh, in creating this project, which uh, it, it came out of work that we began in 2014 uh, when we were running a series of workshops that uh, focused on uh, local resource mapping. And uh, through those workshops, uh, we were working in a community called Santiago Suchiquitongo. And uh, there was a lot of reflection about what does the community have in terms of natural resources that could translate into a potential uh, small business uh, in a way that could create employment and at the same time finance, uh, partially sponsor uh, social and cultural projects in the same community. Uh, so Mesquite is, um, we're in the Central Valley of Oaxaca. Um, there's a fair amount of mesquite here. It's not like uh, the north part of Mexico where it's just a sea of mesquite everywhere. Well, not everywhere, but in a large parts of the north. In the south, it used to be that way, but unfortunately a lot of people just over many, many years cut it down. And uh, there are communities that are named after mesquite here in, in Oaxaca. So it's, it's not something that is unfamiliar. However, like Sarah was describing, it, that knowledge and those traditions were lost uh, many, many years ago within position of a foreign diet. Um, originally, mesquite here, based on the people we know and uh, based on the research that we've done in our contacts here, uh, mesquite has been consumed for millennia. So it, it, was, it was something that was harvested. When we say mesquite, we're not talking about the wood itself. So no one's making any tortillas out of wood. We're talking about like the, the pods that you harvest from the tree itself. Um, and so many people, many indigenous groups would harvest those pods and they would mill them with a mortar and that would create a paste that could then form the base of a tortilla. And this was more common in times when there was a drought and there was less corn available. So they could mix that with corn and they could also, I mean, through adding water, they learned that you could ferment it and create kind of a fizzy drink. Um, different, since there's so much mesquite through Mesoamerica and a lot in Mexico, there's a different kinds of ways that people have worked with it. Uh, in Oaxaca, it was known more for uh, just being something that's sweet. So a lot of people in the Isthmus, for example, there's, there's still, you can find like pickled mesquite and you can find like uh, mesquite and kind of a syrupy sauce that people kind of snack on. But generally, like when we began this project, um, it was fascinating because, because the idea, you know, came locally and our job was to kind of uh, look for resources, look for resources to support that idea. No? And so they would start investigating like what, so we have this tree, we know that there are these pods on it, but what, what can we do with it? And so they started researching locally and they talked to their neighbors and there's always, you know, there was some abuelo in the community, some grandpa, you know, there's, they're always walking around and they would talk to them and they would say, you know, like, what do you, are you familiar with this tree? And they'd be like, oh yes, of course it's mesquite. What do you do with it? Well, we tie our chivos, we, die, we tie our goats and our donkeys below it and they eat the pods. And we don't, I mean, it, it has a lot of protein, it's naturally sweet and they love it. So it became like something 
over time more as uh, like feed, like fodder, uh, a resource for animals. And, and so when we began talking about maybe using this resource in a way that was kind of historically relevant and would allow people to kind of re-identify with their history and culture, there a lot of eyes just went like this. <laughs> they, they remembered, they started talking more and more about it and they got excited about it. And I did too, because I was obviously going through uh, similar, but a very distinct experience, right? Um, so it was kind of, re I, my experience, I was also re-looking at this tree as a completely different thing that connected my life in Oaxaca to my childhood in Texas, which seem like worlds that are so different, uh, but they're connected through this incredible tree. And so the more we learn about it here, the more people get excited about it because they go through that same experience of kind of reconnecting to their past. And so it's, people are also really excited about it because it's really healthy. You know, I mean, there's diabetes, it's just like in the States, it's a really big issue here. Um, there's a lot of obesity and mesquite uh, flour has a really low glycemic index. Um, and it's a, it's a product that people with diabetes can consume. So our job is Tejion Alianzas. I mean, the nature of our work is about connecting people. It is about incubating and accelerating uh, community projects that generate uh, social and cultural impact. And it is about really looking for ways to kind of catalyze and launch small projects that maybe wouldn't exist or wouldn't survive otherwise uh, without proper sales channels and without some capacity building, uh, contacts, and a better knowledge of the market and who their potential customers are. Um, because the mesquite flower market is not, it is, it's local, but it's not local because it, it is kind of, it, it's expensive flower. So we, if people want to produce it locally, like obviously we, we capacity build in that area. But in terms of the actual market where mesquite flour is consumed as uh, people that look for kind of gourmet uh, pastries and bread and there, well, there's just an infinite number of products that can be created out of it. Those markets are, are more outside of rural communities. Uh, the group, since we began working with them, they now sell and take into account this was a project that began just as an idea. They now sell in five natural food stores in Oaxaca City, uh, three restaurants in Oaxaca City, the best bakery in Oaxaca City, uh, Bolenk. And they, they also sell in an excellent bakery in Mexico City and two different restaurants. I mean, and they sell in Mercado Libre, which is like uh, kind of like Amazon. It's just another e-commerce platform. So the, the, it's grown a lot. Um, we have, we're very excited about this project because we see it as something that has allowed us to uh, just see like significant change over time. Um, it's not 100% sustainable. So we have a, a lot more work to do. But since I'm from Texas, I've taken advantage of like my network there. I studied at UT, I did all my grad work there. And so I've maintained my contacts there. And so we now work with engineers from UT and Austin to uh, improve our drying system here and um, we work with local universities as well to do a lot of research regarding the proper ways of drying the, the pods. But we're constantly looking for this expertise that can make this project really grow and, uh, and create a lot more employment and finance small projects. Um, that's kind of an overview. I mean, it, I think um, we, our student model has grown a whole lot as a result because we, did, we do see a lot of amazing opportunities for students of all backgrounds to, to learn a lot with us and the local communities and the projects they work with. And uh, at the same time, there's a very clear local impact and benefit from those partnerships when they're managed appropriately. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, yeah. um, I wanted that, thank you so much for that. Um, it's fascinating the the uh, what you guys are working on. Um, 
I wanted to mention that the next speaker, we're going to have to wrap up already and move on to the next session, but I did want to invite all three of you to join and stay on if you would like. The next talk is going to be um, tortilla makers that are from Mexico that live here in Oregon. They're called Three Sisters Next Metal and a Mexican chef that are going to be talking about corn. Um, so if you, you guys, this is a natural segue into that, but we'd love to have you if you have time to stay for that. Um, but Pedro, who is the one of the tortilla makers said he loves mixing mesquite into their tortillas, uh, that it is um, not recognized by most consumers here and that people expect a barbecue flavor. <laughs> which you were talking about, te te you know, Texas tortillas, I guess we call it that, Texas tortillas, and, and they complement the texture and add light sweetness, um, and he would like to be connected to you, I'll email you guys to connect you, um, but please stay on, I'm sorry to say that we, we, you know, it's fantastic stories, and we went on for a while, but I'm so glad that you guys got to share at least your stories with people here and can find out more and can reach out to you um, and, fo and follow up with learning more about your wonderful work. But um, thank you for joining us and sharing with us. And please stay on if you're able to for the next uh, round, because this would be fantastic to bring you guys together. Thank you very much. Gracias. Thank you both. <laughs> Gracias. Hello and welcome back everyone. Thank you so much to um, Sarah and Richard um, and Sahari for staying on. Um, I'm really excited to introduce this next session um, and kick it off uh, with uh, Pedro for Bell Ascarate and Adriana uh, for uh, Ascarate for Bell of Three Sisters Nixtamal um, out of Portland, Oregon, and um, chef and activist Naftali Duran, who's also on the line here um, joining us on Zoom. We're broadcasting live onto YouTube. Feel free to be posting your questions in the chat as we go. Um, but first, I just wanted to, um, you know, introduce you all to each other in this in the Zoom room right here. Um, we have uh, the previous guests, and I just wanted to make sure everybody was acquainted with each other before we launched into um, a video that uh, uh, Neftali and Adriana and Pedro and I recorded 
uh, a few weeks back. So I just welcome everyone and maybe just a quick hello from each of you and just to share a little bit about what you do and um, why you're here as part of the conversation today. So um, yeah, maybe Naftali, we could start with you. Hi everyone, good to see you, good to meet you, good to see you. Um, I, I, I guess I'm an educator, I'm a farmer, I'm a cook. I live in Holyoke, Massachusetts, but originally from Oaxaca, from the Mixteco people. Awesome, thanks. Let's move to Adriana and Pedro. Hi everyone, my name is Adriana. I'm in Portland, Oregon, I'm from Mexico. Um, and uh, part of my family is from San Luis Potosí, the other side is from Mexico City. And we have a tortilleria here in Portland, Oregon, uh, using corn, making the uh, process of nixtamalization. Excellent. And Richard and Sahari, am I saying that right, Sahari? Uh, Thank you. My name is Sarai Garcia. I am an indigenous woman Zapotec. Uh, my English is no good. Thank you. <laughs> Let's have the rest of the session in Spanish. So it's fine. Uh, well, I'm Richard Hansen. Uh, Sarai and I co-founded Tejien Alianzas, which is a nonprofit here in Oaxaca. Uh, we focus on community development through incubating and accelerating small community businesses that create a social impact. Great, thank you. And Sarah, do you wanna go next? Oh, you're muted still. Sorry. <laughs> My name is uh, Sarah Owens. Uh, hola, hello. I am a cookbook author and writer and baker who is very interested in uh, using and learning about and uh, connecting to people through uh, ind indigenous and endemic foods and ancestral food ways. Wonderful. Thanks, Sarah. And thank you all for joining and for being flexible. Um, I'm really hoping that we can stay on after the video and have a discussion about some of the concepts that are introduced in this video. Um, what we're about to watch together is a conversation that was recorded over Zoom. And I really wish I had gotten the first part of it because we just launched right into it and talking about how different form, uh, different varieties of corn have traveled around the world. And so we're, we're going to be dropped into the video introduced to a concept um, that Neftali um, was uh, speaking about uh, toward, toward that end. And uh, we'll, it's just a short 20 minute segment and then we'll come back and continue the discussion after that. But if everybody can turn off their videos and their audios, we'll watch it and then come back for the Q&A. Feel free to be watching in the chat on YouTube and um, answering questions as we go. And we'll see you in about 20 minutes. Here we go. Corn is a very, very interesting thing. Uh, but talking about a African corn or corn that has been in Africa for a few hundred years, I develop a theory that is called a, I call a, I call what I, I, I develop this ter this term called called a cultural synergy, as opposed to cultural appropriation. So cultural syner synergy for me means the means the uh, communities of color, and in this case, we specifically, we're talking about African communities in Africa, at some point, they didn't have the choice of, a, of a either being abducted and enslaved to come to the Americas and or some of the foods that went back to them, right? So, uh, so, in, so it's a very specific instance in which it is their core. Like they literally played, paid with their blood and their labor to like survive with this corn. And it's been a few hundred years. So for me, uh, that's called cultural synergy as opposed to cultural appropriation. Um, you know, with, if we're talking about like a colonizing power or, a, or a now, you know, in more recent history, uh, 
nowadays in this uh, culinary scene in the US, if we're talking about a, a white chef, you know, a, co-opting food from uh, from specific places. I speak only as a Oaxacan, but as a person from Oaxaca, as an indigenous person from Oaxaca, but uh, you know, it's that, that's that's uh, that's cultural appropriation as opposed to cultural cultural synergy. Um, and some some other really good examples right now. You know, we see brothers and sisters from different different parts of the world making tortillas and making tacos. They they come from cultures that have been oppressed and colonized, and and in, in a lot of instances, like uh, driven out of their own territories. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, out in you know in the California area in the recent history. You know, uh, uh, what's the name of that taqueria called? Uh, but North African, North African tacos, you know, it was a taco revolutionario or something like that, but a North African tacos. And then, a, and then there, there is nowadays a lot of like people from Oaxaca opening restaurants with partners, with lovers, with, with business partners, partners with, with, from other places. And they are mixing their own, you know, their own flavors. That is, a, for, for me, that is synergy. That is like what's gonna happen naturally when we're talking about culinary uh, food, when we're talking about food history, when, it, when we're talking about uh, food ways that are gonna mix naturally because we, uh, you know, because we like each other, we love each other and, uh, and people just, just visit each other houses. Uh, the Korean taco is also another, another, another story like that, you know, mm -hmm. obviously uh, Roy, Choi is, Roy Choi, you know, has make, has make really good money at it and that's great. But at the end of the day, if you look at like his history, he not only worked with a lot of Mexican people really, when he was really young, but they used to take him to Tijuana or to the La Frontera, the border, and like cook with him and invite him to like the quinceañeras and the parties. And like, that's a completely different relationship that grows over time. The, uh, in a lot of ways is based on trust. And mm -hmm. I hope that it's based on respect and respect for the ingredients. And one of the most ingredients, the most beautiful ingredients that we have is corn. Yeah. Totally. I, I totally share that reality that you just say. It's like, oh, it, it, you can feel even the difference in the heart when you say cultural synergy, when the cultures are, when we're meeting in the same place of love and respect and acknowledge of each other's differences and loving those differences and playing with those differences together than being taken it away and without respect, no, with a difference of, um, does that make sense? Yeah. That's yeah. beautiful what you said, so thank you. Yeah, I, I totally appreciate, I'm, I'm first generation U.S. American and we're, we're refugees, like my ancestry is one of appreciating being able to go somewhere in a time of war. And um, I think like I, I've always appreciated other cuisines that existed with the ingredients that are available here in the Americas. And I, I think certainly with the corn, when I think about like how there is appropriation and I'm not like I'm first generation, so I don't have like the, I hear the stories of like people who plant corn and their ancestors are buried in the milpa and like they are, they become corn, like the, they're eating corn, the corn nourishes. And I'm, I am so like honored, like when I hear those stories and it, it brings me sadness too, to know that I've been, I've, I'm not, I don't have a connection to that homeland from where my ancestors come. But with that, with that reality, I feel grateful that like the corn spirit enables me to like listen closely to the corn as it's, I'm not a farmer, we're more food processing processors, and but I do plant corn and I'm, I interact with the corn and then we gather the corn and when we nixtamalize the corn and the corn tells us when it's ready and then it's time for the milling and then the making of tortillas. And like I learn, I learn both culturally and, I, and from the corn too. And it, it's um, it's uh, it's an honoring, it's a humbling experience to be able to serve the people who created this 
this this the relationship with the corn and I'm, I'm really lucky i married adriana and i i get to i get to have like a a much deeper experience with uh not only culinary experience but also cultural and human experience by my my closeness to my partner mm -hmm. So thank you, and thank you also, Naftali, for the you know the knowledge that you're also bringing. I I think it's it's like the first step is to really acknowledge the indigenous land that has created opportunities for us to find ways to nourish us, ourselves in good mm -hmm. ways. And it's also you know um, I uh, it's a it's a relationship, right? Um, it's a really it's an ongoing relationship when you care for a seed when you care for when you care for a plan you're developing a relationship uh and it's an ongoing in it and it's an ongoing relationship and in this case you know 2021 i came to i came to the us in 97 three years after nafta and and uh, you know in the 90s the whole uh, corn industry coffee industry in mexico was devastated by opening uh, by nafta being in introduced um 20 something years later we're still we, we are seeing now the impact of that you know even even greater impact of uh, of policies like that in which uh, indigenous corn traditional corn traditional seed traditional seed has been a there's a trend of extinction because of multinational u.s a subsidized subsidized corn yeah. so uh, the more and more uh, the more and more strange seeds that we lose the more people that migrate to the u.s the less corn species there, there is going to be and uh, this may seem something uh, for some people this may, this may not seem as as a critical issue because you know there's a lot of things to worry about but it's a super important issue for for mexican people for indigenous mm -hmm. peoples if we lose our corn if we lose uh, if people if, if if there is no future generation is growing corn traditionally we we don't need you know uh, Corn is corn has been part of our, our diet for thousands of years, and uh, probably hundred percent of Mexican people eat, eat a tortilla at least you know if not every day at least every other day. But it's uh, it's yeah. is that important not not only uh, not only uh, not only when we're talking about diet, uh, food traditional food ways, but also relationship building. Yeah, our identity also. It's part of who we are, you know. It's um, it's kind of lose, losing the seed of the variety. To me, it's, we're losing the diversity of the corn, and the impact of losing diversity it's it's a uh, it's dangerous. That's how I see it. It's a dangerous uh, place to be. So, um, like you say, if we lose a different type of seed of the corn. Um, we have more problems in in um, in our lands, you know, because then I begin thinking, okay, then it's going to become always a monoculture, and and that really brings a lot of problems, health wise for the environment, health wise for the communities, health wise for the economy, health wise for for like you say the the relationships. It's it's, it's a huge huge issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the repercussions are ongoing, right? The repercussions are are, are are ongoing. It's like, it's a really, really important issue. Yeah, yeah. And then there is more control of the food by the people that can control that, and we all depend on that on that control. So when we lose our our traditions, we lose, you know, we look. There is more power over us to become so um dependent you know dependency and also the 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 so you're a producer right you you, you make tortillas you mix them alive how mm -hmm. easy is is how easy it is for is it for you to find the 
core and that works for what you need to do. Yeah, that it's challenging. Right now we're sourcing from Chihuahua. Um, we're, we're not happy with the food miles, like this, the paying trucks to transport it, but we appreciate getting corns that are grown in areas where corn has grown and we can make some really good tortillas out of that corn, but we're also excited to find corns that have never grown in the Pacific Northwest that can grow in the Pacific Northwest and have farmers partner with farmers to grow culinary corn instead of subsidized corn for high fructose corn syrup and biofuels. And there, there's some beautiful corns. This, this is like, I just brought a few little show and tell of some of our tortillas. This is a red corn and the red corn has, that's great. it has like this, this smell and flavor that that's red corn. And people look for like, oh, it tastes, it's earthy or nutty, but it's, it tastes like red corn. So if we can encourage the growing of some of these corns, then um, I think it's like a, it just, a, it's an environmental investment. It's a social, cultural investment. And uh, that's, that's something that we're very, very happy about. And um, we do 100% nixtamal, so we're not participating at all with the masarina industry. And I know like maybe either you can talk about like Erlinda and some of these women, mostly women who come to the tortilleria uh, because they, they need the masa, they need the nixtamalized masa because everything else doesn't taste right to them. Well, there's, first I want to speak like about the corn bringing it. Uh, it's corn, it just breaks my heart that everyone wants corn to be super cheap. And so that's when you're talking about the bringing of the corn. Um, our, you know, we buy organic corn from Chihuahua, so it's more expensive than the subsidized corn. So therefore we're paying more, but still, I still think that we're not paying enough. Does that make sense? Because we need to pay a price of like a big, like a medium-sized farmers, because we can't be buying corn that costs three dollars a pound. Because one pound of corn will give you, you know, pound and a half maybe of masa, which gives you maybe around sixteen tortillas, you know. And so who's gonna pay for this whole thing that end up costing ten dollars for ten tortillas? And so that is an issue that. I, I see as a food producer. And then about the cooking of the corn, nixtamalizing it, it's, it's just like, it brightens my day. You come in, the smell of the nixtamal, the corn being cooked in the limestone, it's just the smell of it, it already like brightens my heart. Because it's like, it's, it's kind of like, it's so familiar. And then making the tortillas and then having people like Pedro says, like Erlinda and Mina, they, these uh, women from the neighborhood that come in and they get their tortillas or their masa every day or every couple of days to make tortillas at home for breakfast. And that is so satisfying because they're like, oh, finally I can eat this, you know? Like there's a relief of the relationship when they come and they smell and they see the masa. There's this whole connection that we build with people because it's, it's, they come like, oh, smells like in my town, smells like home. It's just a deep connection that, that you build with people through food. And I really love that. And when, if we really think about uh, food memories or, uh, you know, it's like probably the smell of a comal is was one of the first ones we remember. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and the you know, the texture of a tortilla, the smell of a tortilla, the taste of it is mm -hmm. it's uh, it's really you know it's uh, it's really one of the one of our earliest food memories, and that uh, in a indigenous food sovereignty, there's there's uh, we say we say that that's uh, all of those traditions become part of of our DNA, you know. Uh, and in basic terms, that literally means that, it, you know, it's our stories that we carry with us. And, uh, 
and you can uh, same you know the stories that you're you're sharing with me of uh, of these ladies coming and picking up masa is uh, is you know it's really beautiful and i also really i also strongly believe that if you grow, if you come from a from a community where corn with the with the strong traditional corn diet um even if you never made tortillas or you never made a specific dish it's just a matter of like letting your ancestors speak through like the process speak mm -hmm. to you through the process of uh, of making it and it comes it comes back um as you know at the beginning of this conversation we were talking about the 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 need of a lot of people to uh, to uh, to uh, to get things explained or or to like uh, include academic uh, academic uh, thought into what you know what is going on but at the at the end of the day a lot of us come from communities from from moms and grandmas that never read a recipe right <laughs> yeah it was, are some of the most amazing cooks we know um so yeah I love, I love that. I, I love when you say the sensory memory, like when we're making the nixtamal, like people like, so how do you know, people ask us, how do you know when the corn is done? Well, we have to use our senses. We touch it and see if the skin is still enough. We see the smell that is coming out of the cooking of the nixtamal, the biting the, the, the piece of corn and tasting it, like it takes all the senses to really get that, like, the sensory like that's how we know how the corn is cooked like it's not like oh you cook it for 25 minutes and then you let it you know it just doesn't is it every corn is different and um and that's what excites me like when we're trying different corns it's like watching it constantly watching it you know like you have to learn what that corn is telling you when it's ready and that's really exciting you want to say something. yeah yeah it's that we have um like people want us to write a recipe or um, to explain how to make nixtamal and or even how to make a tortilla and it's like well it really there's so many factors and it's not it's an art more than a science and it's something that you have to feel and and practice in order to appreciate it helps to have i think like you know like your mom and your grandma like having some guidance is i think very useful but it's there's not like a, a simple recipe because the food is so different. This, there's seeds. We're cooking seeds, which in, in itself, like we could take the seeds and they sprout and grow into plants. And instead we're choosing to put the nixtamal, uh, the kal and make nixtamal with it. And it's just, it's like the nutrition that's involved with that whole process is, um, it's not like a Betty Crocker cookbook, you know, this is, this is something beyond that. And I think we're like in a, our colonized mindset expects uniformity, like a McDonald's hamburger that's always going to taste the same, or, you know, a, a, a Betty Crocker cake where you follow the box and there's what you want that's on the picture of the package. And that's not, that's a, that's very different from what I think we're we're trying to do with with our masa and tortillas. It did remind me of what you said about the cultural synergy. We teach sometimes how to make tortillas of Nisaborita, and people love it. They're, but they're, I'm telling them, you have to smell it. You have to look at it. You have to see, like, and then they, they get out loving it. Now they call and they're like, my children are the happiest ever by they can even make tortillas now, you know? So they're, they're bringing it into their family as a respect to our culture and our food traditions, instead of just like grabbing a tortilla from the supermarket that they don't really appreciate. It's like this really having that connection of people like really learning more about the corn, the smell, how you make a tortilla, that really, it changes the whole, it changes also like our whole relationship with other person like it really connects you and i that's something that i about this why the, the making of the next amount is so important in my life and, and making sure that people understand 
as the traditional tortilla. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks everyone. If you wanna just join back with your video, that would be great. Welcome back. And I see uh, a few comments in the chat on YouTube, but before we get into that, I just wanna see if there's any you know, other comments or questions or things that you wanna share right off the bat um, as a panel. Anybody can kind of jump in and start here if you have any thoughts. I have one thought or just one response unless uh, anyone else wants to lead. Go for it, Sarah. Um, it was interesting for me to hear, uh, particularly that last part about, um, you know, the expectations that people have from different types of ingredients that sometimes we forget our seeds. And um, I thought it was really interesting when Naftali said, um, the part about building a relationship with with the, the plant, with the seed, and how as someone who is often tasked with writing recipes, how, you know, what I hope to do is, is to encourage this almost like a paradigm shift from where we have been kind of... Um, conditioned into having very particular expectations to really listening to these stories and, and listening to the importance of um, what, what I'm hearing from these three speakers, from these three panelists, that it, how important it is to, to cultivate that relationship um, to the seed, to the plant, to the culture, to the history. And that builds respect um, it builds trust, it builds confidence in what you're doing, um, and, and all of that, I think, begins a very different conversation um, than, than sort of where we have been approaching a lot of these foods over time. So I, I appreciated that um, very much. Thanks, Sarah. Any response there? All right, we can um, we can go to some questions here in the chat. Um, Matthew Lawrence is a baker from Ontario, Canada, who's been experimenting with locally grown corn and nixtamal in his breads. Um, question from Matthew, do you feel it is useful or even okay for those of us bakers who are also white settlers to incorporate corn and nixtamal into our work or would you consider it appropriative? No small question here. Anybody want to take that one? I can get us going. Um, I think the uh, well, just a small annex, uh, a small part of my history. I owned a wood fire break and bakery until two thousand and fifteen, uh, so I'm very, also very familiar with the baking world. Uh, for those bakers, if there's there's probably bakers in, in the audience or bakers that are, that are gonna watch this, uh, uh, probably they probably remember uh, Alan Scott and the Alan Scott ovens. They were popular in the late 90s, early 2000s. I was very fortunate to uh, not only like uh, meet him and talk to him uh, but over the, on the phone, but also uh, I built a couple of his ovens and at that point, it was for me. It was it was um, in my life? I was trying to learn a new skill, and I thought the baking. Uh, my grandfather was was a baker in our little town in Oaxaca, and I thought that I wanted to like learn how to bake, and I did that for uh, for about twelve years, probably maybe a little bit more, and that was uh, a super interesting part also of my uh, my growing as 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 a human. Um, 
most bakers or a lot of bakers will con will consider using a, a, a mother, you know, uh, a or using fermenta fermentation as, as part of their as part as part of their repertoire, as part of how they bake bread, especially bread bakers. And I think that that is just uh, that is similar, not exactly the same as nixtamalization, but the but the story of wheat and corn have parallels, right? We we are told we you know we can we can prove this, and uh, and oftentimes scholars tend to be a little bit off, uh, but the but the story that is told is the. Um, beer and, and bread was discovered in Mesopotamia about 10,000 years ago and corn and nixtamalization is this is worked out of discovered in, in 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 the Americas about 10,000 years ago so there's very uh, there's is very similar sim, similar stories happening happening here and uh, and I, uh, I'm not gonna I think they nixtamalization can be part of anyone's repertoire when it comes to cooking or baking I think the uh, I think the, there's a very there's a very fine line uh, between having techniques in your in your repertoire and and uh, versus making money or uh, or saying that you're making the authentic, which people love to say, the authentic you know tortilla or bread or whatever it is, right? I think that is a is a very fine line, but when it comes to technique, I think that everyone should learn should learn and know how to nixtamalize and and have a relationship with corn because corn, at the end of the day, is in a lot of things that we eat. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll I'll add add to that because um, I appreciate the question because the corn and the nixtamal process allows someone your the person who asked the question to think about broader issues of historic colonization and appropriation of resources and uh, culinary, you know, food ways. Um, I think like we've got to respect indigenous sovereignty where we find it, whatever bioregion we're in. We have to respect the indigenous land rights, water rights. And I think that's like the, that's like, you know, it's a, I think food informs those larger political issues, and that's got to be taken seriously. And um, I think uh, when it comes to using other people's foodways, give them credit for where that foodway came from. And I think that's the tendency with colonized mentality is to to want to claim discovery rights and then capitalize it. So as much awareness is brought to that, I think is great. Even asking that question is, is great. Um, I've actually, we've been working with some corns that, that are local and we've nixtamalized them and then tried to make tortillas with them. And they're not all the kinds of corns that make good tortillas. A lot of them are very starchy. They're even flint corns and not not really good for tortillas. And then I'm like, well, what am I gonna do with all of this masa that really I, I can't use to make tortillas with? And I've mixed it with wheat flour in order to see what happens. And there may be some practical applications for using nixtamalized corn masa. I, I was using like 50-50 combinations and it was making like a really good, you know, it's not like a cornbread cornbread and it's not a wheat bread. It had some of the qualities of each of them. And I, I think that's, it's beautiful to see like, like what happens when grains speak to each other and making a, a loaf like that is, um, it's a, I think it's a very grounding process. The food was delicious that we created and it allows us to have these deeper conversations about colonization and land rights. Um, I just think thinking simple things about nixtamalizing the corn is healthier for us to eat it. So I'm happy for that. Uh, with what we were trying different corns, you could make tortillas by hand, but in our machine, it would get too sticky for the machine. So we like, okay, we have a lot and, you know, we will experiment making tortillas by hand and then as well as bread so that was exciting and we have this uh, young man that makes a lot of his bread 
And sometimes we share some of the masa, the nixtamalized corn for him to make bread. So it's just, to me, it's exciting to try different ways to utilize the nixtamalized corn because it's such beautiful uh, process and really healthy, you know, adds, adds a lot of nutrients. So I'm excited as, as long as we respect the culture. Yeah, it ties back to what the cultural synergy concept, I think, as well. Um, and yeah, developing that relationship, not only with the seed, but where it comes from and how that food affects your lives. Um, Richard and Sarah, any, any thoughts you want to add? Yeah, so I, I don't know if you noticed enough, but we we're having a little <laughs> debate here. <laughs> um, I think... Um, so she's going to talk and I'll, little by little, I'll translate parts of it. Uh, no sé si el tema de apropiación en comida eh, funcione lo mismo que en artesanía, ¿no? So she doesn't know if, like, the idea of appropriation is the same in food as it is with uh, artisan craft. Porque en, en cuestión de comida es, eh, cada quien tiene su receta. Entonces, si vas a hacer una nixtamalización, Puede ser que, eh, por ejemplo, nosotros en nuestra comunidad, ¿no? Si se te pasa la cal, si lo cocinas demasiado, si haces algo, si el, si el agua no era la indicada. O sea, cambia muchísimo, muy rápido el, 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 el producto final, ¿no? Como la masa al final. So she's not, I mean, she's not really sure. It, she's talking about it specifically because her parents and she is also, they're artisans, right? So they, they have this background. Um, but in the process of, of producing any kind of craft, whether it's like they work a lot with footwear and indigenous textiles and um, the process of, of treating, uh, creating leather, curing leather, um, there's so many different kinds of ingredients in that. And sometimes it doesn't always come out the same. So there's that question of variability that maybe um, makes it difficult to, de to define what is exactly that tradition or that product. Pero también está el tema de que el, quién, a, a quién se le ocurrió la nixtamalización, ¿no? O sea, eh, el, el reconocer el, 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 no sé, como la obra de la nixtamalización, el, el haber hecho la nixtamalización eh, debe, debe de ser como muy clara, porque justo a en Oaxaca o en México, en todas estas zonas eh, indígenas, nos están robando cosas. Entonces, hay que ser muy, muy claros en lo que hacemos o cómo lo hacemos o las colaboraciones o las sinergias que, que creamos para no caer en, en, pues, en contradicciones, ¿no? Y sobre todo afectar a las comunidades que por cientos de años y miles de años lo hemos cuidado y guardado, ¿no? <laughs> sí, lo siento. Thanks. That's going to be fun to translate. But, um, so she was talking about like the nix, it's, it's nixtamalization is the verb. <laughs> so, so saying that there are certain processes, including, pero nixtamalización es indígena. Es mexicano. Es sí, mexicano. Sí. Okay. So I, I don't know much about the history behind that. So it's kind of, it's definitely an area I have no knowledge really, but, but just talking about processes in general that are established over time, um, it's like if there's any kind of, whether it's synergy or whether it's appropriation or some kind of collaboration or mixture, I, 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 what I'm gathering that she was trying to communicate is that it's important to understand those roots and, and how the different players come into that. So in a way that's very respectful, which echoes, I, I think a lot of what you all were saying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's beautiful. And it, it kind of touches on something that came up in our longer conversation that we're going to post on the Cascadia Greens YouTube channel so that you can watch all of it because I could only post 20 minutes of what we had, but um, the conversation stayed with me for many, many days afterwards. And, um, you know, talking about how the diversity that's present even within a single ear of corn is so um, important for the um, for the life of the plant and for the life of the crop and um, 
the there's a question in the chat as well about um, from Sarah asking if you ever work with multiple varieties in one nixtamalization process for a blended variety they can cook so differently so maybe just talking a little bit about the biodiversity within you know corn and why that's so important and and how that um, comes out in the traditional food ways of, of making tortillas and masa Well, it's hard to, when you mix, it's easier to mix the masas that you make than because each corn cooks differently. So that's not something that we have, we have done. Yeah, because like, like what they were saying before is that each corn might need different, different amount of cal, cal or limestone, cal, like uh, water, how long you cook it, if it's harder corn, it's more flowery, like all the depends of that is how long you're gonna cook it, how much cal. So all that influences. So if you have different type of corn, it might not be different colors that are from the same, it's okay. So yes. sometimes we'll mix um, yeah. uh, like a, a, a batch of corn that is from the same type of corn, like uh, like they were like yeah, butcher. They, yeah, like, so we get, when, when we get, or even like similar lots of corn, it doesn't mean that that corn is grown in the same field. So there are differences for altitude, for temperature, like the, the soil itself, like there's, there's some depth to that, but it's, um, if it's in from the same region, I think it, it equalizes for the most part, if you're making a few hundred pounds or even just tens of pounds of corn, but, um, mixing corns that are very different, I think we'd miss out on the, on those special characteristics of the corn. Um, I'm not sure what is the, what is the question? Like why, why would, why would you want to do that? As like you can mix masas and you could do that, you know, in a decorative way. A lot of chefs take some of our different colored corn masas and then we'll make like a, you know, a quesadilla tortilla that has, you know, like stripes on it or you know just a swirl of color and i think it's more like a culinary flourish you know it's it's fun it's nice it's appealing um but like we we have a we're working with a green corn which is a it's a interesting corn um but we're running out of it and we could tell the chef like you could mix yellow corn and blue corn masa to get green corn masa you could do that um but it for something that doesn't it doesn't seem to respect the like the efforts or the energetics of that particular corn i'm just gonna answer that a little bit uh, i told i want to second what pedro just mentioned but a uh, corn as part as part of our our a uh, our uh, as part of you know our a uh, our relatives, our story is so important. As I, as, I, as I said before, corn is in is part of a lot of people's diets nowadays, not only in a North America, Central America, South America, but also Africa. And a, I, strong, a, I strongly believe that having diversity of corn is super important and be able to adapt to how it behaves is gonna be essential to climate change. Uh, I, I probably mentioned this in, in our talk last time, but uh, the fact that people are uh, younger people are growing corn in the Toono Autumn Reservation in, in Arizona, where the temperature goes to up to 115, 120 degrees, and people are growing corn north of me in Massachusetts, you know, Mohawk territory and further north, tell us the 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 uh, the need and the and the beauty of, of diversity, but also the uh, in my opinion, the importance of the importance of diversity of seed diversity going forward. If we don't have seed, the uh, if we don't have seed uh, that adapts naturally in relationship with people to climate change, I think that we at some point in our lifetime we're going to be facing a major hunger and major crop failure. It is super important that we have diversity. And I know the science and industry pushes back and said like, oh, but we can generically modify a rice or, or corn and do, and you know, and that's how we're gonna solve hunger or solve this issue of, of, a, 
of um, of um, of uh, climate change. And my answer is so it's always gonna, gonna be the same. Seeds are not are not meant to be owned, especially corn. Nobody should own seeds, and especially when it, when it's being done for profit. Um, scientists, at the end of the day, scientists and institutions and big ag are in it for the profit, right? Because we live under capitalism. So we have to be very careful how we think about this. And in my opinion, diversity is super important to make sure that we evolve along with climate change because we're not going to reverse it at this point. So how can we do, do our best to make sure that we don't have massive um, crop failures in the future? Yeah, really fabulous points. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, uh, and you know, that the, the, the modern concept even of plant breeding and purity that exists around different strains that could be owned is such a westernized concept um, that doesn't really um, fit when we're looking at, um, you know, these other ways and these other ways of being. Um, which is something that also came up in our, our the, the, the video, which I'm really excited to share. And we, we have a few more minutes here and I wanted to kind of dovetail off of what you just said, Naftali, to kind of ask, um, you know, this question, which is not, I don't know if it's an answerable question, but it's something that is really on my mind as uh, an actor in this local grains economy space. Um, for whatever it's worth. Um, and I would love to hear from each of you. Um, and I'll ask the question and then I'll kind of explain, I guess, maybe who I'm wanting you to, to, to answer it towards. Um, and this is something that, you know, Pedro and I have talked about in the past at other Cascadia Grains conferences, but, um, you know, thinking about grains as a whole, as a powerful monocultural tool of colonization, land theft, soil depletion, large scale, chemically dependent export markets. Um, and, you know, thinking about it as potentially a doorway into a redemptive future that's more um, in sync with the laws of nature and soil restoration and preserving and celebrating the cultural identity and culinary histories within indigenous communities and communities of color, um, you know, that's I, I guess that's my question. I don't know if it's um, if it's possible to you know the the other quote that comes to mind is is um, one that I heard from June Russell, which is culture eats strategy for breakfast. So it's a it's a big culture within the grain world, within academia, within agriculture, within research to turn around if we're really going to uh, embody these concepts. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on how, um, you know, how, how researchers, how bakers, how folks who are interested in regional grains can also be a part of this other abolitionist movement, this movement to really celebrate and preserve and uplift indigenous histories and ways of being. Um, so no, no small question there. Um, <laughs> But I, uh, you know, that's what's on my heart and my mind as an organizer within this space. And I just wondered if you all had any thoughts there. And whoever wants to go first can just jump in. Or maybe we'll just end there. You know what, let's just end. No, I'm just joking if anybody has any thoughts. I can, I can, I'll, I can try to start us up, but it is a very broad question. And um, sometimes I think like when you ask those big broad questions, then it's like, how many generations are you talking? Like, is this a, is this something we want to solve in like five, 10 years? Or is this like our children, grandchildren? Because I think a lot of work is consciousness shifting first, because we're so lost we're so our colonized mentality has us thinking that things that are normal are 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 natural and they're not we are on an abnormal trajectory towards the destruction of our planet and agriculture is participating in that in a major way okay so that so i think education and how do you do that well maybe start subsidizing the right thing so if we can identify 
ways of doing agriculture that are respecting communities that are respecting the environment, then let's subsidize those instead of subsidizing the big ag. And um, I think that's, that's like a beginning strategy. We need to have land access. So the history of the United States in the very least, but most of the Americas is a, you know, it's, this is a Eurocentric land grab that has taken land from indigenous people and has uh, enslaved people from Africa and not allowed them to participate in uh, access to Homestead Act and Organic Act, all these acts that gave free land to Euro European people. So that's kind of like reparations. We gotta, first we gotta get our committee on reparations in Congress formed. Um, so the, I see some of these as like big strategies for the future. And um, so I, I, I'm very much focused on education and, um, and as much as we can do, like, like there's also emergencies that we have to attend to around things like water. So like the Klamath River Basin, like who are we going to be giving water to? Is it the indigenous people or is it farmers who are growing, you know, grass and grass seed? You know, it, these should be obvious and we need policy to, to shift that, our thinking. So I, I complex question with, I think a lot of, different answers, but I really like the idea that we reward or subsidize people who are doing the right thing. And there's some initiatives like locally um, that are happening. They're all small farmers, um, African-American farmers who are reclaiming land and farming for their communities, as well as indigenous people who've been, you know, salmon people and Wapato people, like their lands, their wetlands need to be restored, their water rights need to be honored. So those are some of the, I think the emergency issues that have to be dealt with. And then in the meantime, it's like, really, we gotta, we gotta set a, a very strong vision and reparations. Like, I don't know what you say to these Euro descent people who think that they have the right to all this acreage because they've been farming for four generations I don't know, I really don't know what to say to them because they imagine themselves as these stewards of the land and they don't, they, they have not gotten to a point where they want to own what has enabled them to have access to that land. So I'll just, that's my start. Thank you. Anybody else want to chime in here? Specifically, I guess I'm thinking about bakers and researchers um, and, um, you know, farmers are kind of already are so close to the ground in terms of what needs to happen, but um, at some on some level, but um, yeah, just wondering if you have any thoughts on, 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 on ways in like grains as a way into this conversation of preserving cultural heritage and um, celebrating. I think that uh, so I'll I'll jump in. I totally agree with uh, I totally agree with uh, Pedro. I think that rethinking big systems thinking. If we if whoever is watching the lives in the U.S., the fact that the uh, farm bill, uh, ninety five percent goes to big ag and to subsidizing uh, four four crops tell us everything we need to we need to to know about priorities. So. That's a start. We need we need to be able to change that, and for and for that to change, we actually need to be able need to be involved. There there is a uh, there is a lot of you know all of us can be involved. It took me it took me a few years. It took me about it took me about a decade, but uh, but but I learned how to go to Washington D.C. I learned how to how to be in contact with my my senator my my senator my congressman. And actually ask for for a, what I what I a, what I think is needs to be done needs to be done. Do they listen? No, but uh, that's a, that's a completely different story. But the fact that but coalition building and making sure that we have a voice and that we are uh, outspoken in the in the public forum is super important. And I think the technology has changed that in a way that is uh, that has that has made made that has made a little bit more uh, available for everyone. 
the fact that we can do the we can uh, the we can use hashtags that we can uh, that we can follow people that, that we can organize protests or organizing whatever way we want to organize online has definitely changed the the landscape so that's big systems thinking we need to we need to change that um now when it comes to the localized the local food movement uh i think it it has been it has been a, it has been a few years or a few decades of people trying to get back to local, which in reality, sh people should just look at an indigenous communities because most indigenous communities will eat local as, as a given. Uh, but uh, if we, let's talk about grain specifically. I live in New England. So grain uh, back in the early 2000s, as I said, when I was a, when I was a baker, there was no local grain. The, clo the closest grain we could, we could find was from uh, Quebec um, from upstate New York, and one of the main reasons is because we were we are talking about large, uh, we are talking about farmers trying to make a profit by growing something, right? It is a, it is, it is not very profitable to grow an acre of corn or an acre of, of wheat. It's just not in this in this in this capitalistic system. It's not. So how do we change that? And that is, that that's something else that the Pedro mentioned is incentivize those more uh, local localized focused grain or food movements if there is something that we learn from this pandemic is that the the local food movements are is are really what's going to feed communities when when in times of distress uh, big agriculture will break down but if this the stronger we make the local the local movement the, the local movement the better and grains have have a great a, a great a, a great part of that and uh, and in a lot of part in a lot of places in the United States, like in New England, there was grain being grown here up until up until uh, 1934 that we could find in Amherst, Massachusetts, you know, 20 miles from, from where I am. But the 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 uh, our eating, uh, our consumption change, right? We are used to, uh, well, let's go back to, you know, where you, we are used to a perfect loaf of bread that looks the same every time we buy it. I assure you, people in the early 1900s were not used to that. You, it probably it probably tasted and looked different. You eat what you had because it, it was what what you grew and what you could afford. Uh, so we're not we so used to close this stat. We need, we have to do big systems changing. We have to uh, we have to invest in local food movements at all levels, and but we also have to start thinking about a. Uh, decolonizing the way we think about food in general. The fact that we don't need uh, gizzards and livers and everything else from all the animals that we slaughter, it's insane to me. Thank you. And any uh, any final thoughts from Sarah, Richard, or Sahari before we, or Sarahi before we wrap up, excuse me. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of different thoughts. But um, in terms, of, I obviously like I'm, I express myself within kind of the, the optic and angle of our work, right? So um, we also, if you all were, if all, I don't recall if all of you were part of the last conversation we had regarding uh, Mesquite, but obviously like our, one of our greatest challenges uh, in terms of kind of celebrating and focusing on ancestral grains and ancestral uh, legumes, as, as is the case of mesquite, is that, um, I mean, Neftali touched on this, it's difficult to change people's habits for eating their diets. I mean, it's something that obviously is uh, created over time and over many different forces, uh, uh, obviously, like how accessible certain things are and what they learn in their families. Um, we've seen that with amaranth, and it's obviously the same with mesquite in, in our case, because like people might get excited about the fact that it, it is a gateway and kind of a door into their past and their identity and revitalizing that. Um, but at the end of the day, it doesn't, they don't necessarily want to consume it themselves. Um, a lot of the people, I've seen organizations that have focused a lot on uh, training people to cultivate, grow and uh, ancestral grains because they're very healthy and then teaching them 
how to cook with them and eventually create a commercial product uh, that can increase their income and reduce the pressures for migrating. So we, we kind of have seen the, the struggles that those organizations have dealt with in terms of trying to change the way people eat. <clears throat> and as a result, we've kind of flipped that model on its head. In time, in, instead of necessarily uh, thinking about how can I change and how can I maybe show this historical uh, use of mesquite or corn or whatever, uh, amaranth, and say like, this is this amazing ancestral grain that, I mean, obviously I don't do this because I'm not the person to do it, but say if I was Mexican <laughs> and saying like, this is something we used to consume and this is part of our history. Um, it's, that gets people excited, but it just doesn't advance things. What, what we've seen in our work that kind of juggles a little bit these issues is first saying like, there's this amazing natural resource that uh, you might be able to create income by working with it. And it just so happens to be incredibly healthy. This, if you want to cook with it and eat it, this is how you can do that. But first of all, let's show you the importance of it as uh, a source of income. So you don't have to migrate if you don't want to. And that leads them to like this journey and reflection about whether they are open or not to consuming that in maybe a traditional way a historical or ancestral way, or even in a new kind of gourmet way, right? So it's, I don't know, the, the question of, of getting people to think about ancestral grains and legumes is, is it should definitely merge with a different strategy that uh, sees it as how can we create income that's sustainable so that people don't have to leave if they don't want to. <laughs> and uh, then, little by little uh, saying it, like capacity building around how to use it personally. Mesquite obviously like can be used to revitalize soil. There's so many different uses and knowledge around it that's been forgotten. So I mean, mm -hmm. it, there's different ways of using it as a way of uh, increasing crop yields and uh, increasing income. And then as like a second step being like, Chain, eventually integrating it into diets, maybe through uh, tortillas first, and then um, different kinds of things, right? I mean, cookies, whatever. I mean, yeah. there's not a whole, I mean, there's different ways of looking at it, but we, we certainly approach it from like thinking about what, how can we reduce some of the pressures that um, allow that, that, how can we reduce pressures that reduce autonomy, right? So, and what can we do to um, enable uh, more uh, independent decision-making mm -hmm. uh, that leads to sustainable lifestyles that people want to have, right? Because I, I'm reluctant to say, uh, or, you know, Sarai says the same thing. We're reluctant to, to like, say this is like a diet you should have because it's an ancestral diet and it was incredible. And that was a time when people, you know, diabetes is, was not the same kind of thing that it is now, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we don't approach it with that angle. We approach it kind of more holistically. Thank you. Yeah, and we're going a little over time, but I wanna give Sarah the chance to respond if she wants to, and then maybe hear from Adriana before we wrap up here. Yeah, I'll just very quickly um, close close all of those points out by saying, you know, if you're in a position, um, you know, of privilege uh, or resources to just always identify what those are and then, um, you know, use those to empower and, uh, you know, communities of color and indigenous communities, um, black farmers, and uh, just to re reiterate what Richard was saying, um, to, to allow those communities to make decisions um, about how they want their future to be, to be led. Um, and I think when we do that, it um, 
often um, people who want to support these communities become very overwhelmed by how we do it. Um, and if we can just simply start by identifying, you know, what, where we are, who we are, and what our privileges are, and then how we can relate to and support and uplift um, the, the voices and the choice and um, the communities that we want to create that synergy with, um, you know, often that's, that's really the, the first step is just recognizing and um, yeah, and then going forward from there. Thanks for those thoughts. Adriana, do you want to add anything? No, I didn't get the chance um, to hear you. Yeah, no, I think I agree with all the points and I guess we have to listen, learn to listen because um, the colonized mind is, I'm going to go and help you undo it. And I'm going to, but to listen what really is needed from the people that really know, you know? So I think for me, I, I just want to emphasize that we need to listen and not try to like, we have the answer or I have the answer and, you know, so yeah, I want to emphasize that listening is important and be there and figure out, ask, how can I help to change this? How can I change to change? We have to change our mind. We have to decolonize ourselves. So then, um, yeah, so it, the change begins with ourselves too. Mm. And, you know, with everything, like the politics of Pedro and Neftali were talking, like Richard talking about more holistic and Sarah like being in power. And so, yeah, thank you. This is, gives me hope that we're in the, in the path. Thank you, Adriana. Sarah, do you want to add anything? Pues, uh... Eh, primero agradecer a todos. Creo que el granito de arena para que nuestras comunidades indígenas puedan seguir, permanecer y seguir dando todo su conocimiento ancestral hasta ahorita. Uh, she wants to thank everyone. And, um, dilo otra vez. <laughs> Eh, solo como agradecer, pero uh, creo que cada movimiento o cada cosa que hacen cada uno de ustedes aporta un granito de arena y también hace un reconocimiento a, las, a nuestras comunidades indígenas. Okay. <laughs> que, that, uh, like, everyone's work in this group, um, everything there, each one of you is offering, and each one, uh, things that you all have accomplished and things that you want to accomplish in the current work you're doing, like it all uh, does, it does make a difference for communities of origin um, and indigenous communities in terms of linking it back to where things started, right? Entonces, uh, como, como dicen todos, ¿no? Uh, realmente las comunidades, si el cambio viene desde adentro, viene, o oh, Más bien como lo que ellos quieren, lo que queramos compartir como indígenas, lo que tenemos como, como indígenas o la solución que queremos generar, tiene que salir de nosotros. En realidad no funciona al revés, eh, nunca ha funcionado. Eh, algunos creen que sí, pero en realidad nunca ha sido así. Eh, y creo que por eso hemos sido comunidades indígenas. <risa> yeah, in, like to reduce that. Um, <laughs> uh, solutions typically don't come from outside. That, that kind of an overview of everything she said. They, they, they're, they're, lo they're created locally with local knowledge and experience and history. And uh, frequently when there are solutions or recommendations that come from outside, they don't work. Perdí el hilo, pero el punto es más como que creo que El hecho de que hemos sobrevivido y vivido y estado y seguiremos estando eh, es por las formas eh, tradicionales en las que hemos, eh, en las que vivimos, ¿no? Nuestros sistemas normativos internos, las formas en cómo nos comunicamos, como toda esta cosmovisión, para que lo resumas, toda esta cosmovisión indígena, eh, pues creo que es un buen momento para retomar un poco lo que cuidar a la madre naturaleza, eh, estar más eh, conscientes de nuestro propio consumo 
y creo que es un gran ejemplo en nuestras comunidades indígenas y, y pues nada, ya. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so, also, um, giving a summary of this, right? So, uh, the, the knowledge that is created in indigenous communities, like, is obviously very valuable. Uh, the, the governing systems, the way, the, the way decisions are taken, the way to, um, sustainable systems of, of agriculture on a local scale, like all of these processes and knowledge are valuable and um, should obviously should not be forgotten. No sé si estoy diciendo eso correctamente, entonces perdóname. I understand also that she said that they have survived with all their traditional uh, knowledge and so that has that has worked so that's what i understand that has worked so we need to let the indigenous people tell us mm -hmm. let's learn is that correct that's beautiful and we're we're over time but i didn't want to stop the conversation if there's any final thoughts that you have that you want to share before we close out um the third day of grains week um it's been such a pleasure to have all of you here and yeah if there's anything else you want to say now's the time thank you to the 18 people still watching on youtube right now uh and yeah we'll we'll close out the session here any final thoughts thank you for having us thank you so much Gracias. Thank you all. Thanks, Sarah and Richard, Sarahi, and thank you so much, Adriana, Pedro, and Naftali for being flexible. <laughs> so there's two other, three other people in your session that just popped in right before you joined the call. And thank you to Sarah and Richard and Sarahi for being um, flexible and willing to have the conversation as well. It's a, it's a true pleasure to know all of you, and I hope we can all gather one day and um, feed each other. That sounds great. All right, take care everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. Um, tomorrow's focus of Grains Week is agronomic research, um, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Pacific on the Culinary Breeding Network's YouTube. And we will see you there. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>